25 years ago, a brand new company was just started in Southern California. You may have heard of them uh, once or twice. They were called Silicon and Synapse. They tried to do a couple of games based off of doing ports and otherwise reworks of other people's games, but somewhere along the line, they're like, you know what, we'd kind of like to go into development for ourselves. So they approached a group uh, whose name I don't remember right now because I am terrible, um, <clears throat> and said, we would like to go ahead and make a game based off of your setting, uh, something referred to as Warhammer, Warhammer Fantasy more specifically. And they actually did a decent amount of work on the game because they were kind of excited about the concept. And then, for reasons we will not get into, were turned down for actually doing it. Um, but they had done so much work on that game, and they really didn't want to go ahead and just abandon it. So they decided to go ahead and make a game uh, you have probably actually heard of by this point in time called Warcraft. Warcraft uh, was actually... Again, originally designed to be a Warhammer game. I've talked about this before. But after they got it done, they were like, you know, this is kind of this is kind of a cool setting. We've got some cool stuff here. Why don't we go out and expand this a little bit? And Blizzard did a couple of other things, of course. I have I am skipping uh several things in in, in the in-between space there, for example. Uh I am also skipping the fact that they worked on several SNES games. I'm also skipping the fact that they did like three or four different uh games before they even switched to the Blizzard label. I believe uh Warcraft was actually their first Blizzard label game. I'm not hundred percent on that. Hello, Belize. Hope you enjoy. Um <clears throat> But I have a couple of things I kind of wanted to show you. Uh, we're going to go and switch over here. This isn't ready yet. We're still doing a little bit of setup. Just a little bit. Um, but I wanted to show you a couple things uh, before we really get started. Because this game... So, I've been playing this game since the Alpha. I was actually uh, one of the people invited to the Alpha. Uh, for a number of reasons I'm not actually going to get into right now. Uh, I used to actually be able to get into a large number uh, of Alphas back in the day. Actually, before we talk about the Alpha, though, there's one other thing I'd really like to talk about. Just just as like a lead-in, if you will. As soon as I aim myself towards Anixia. There we go. Um, so, the uh, as we were... Uh, by the way, I guess I should say this out loud since not everyone has heard this. We have the security for this lore run cranked up to 11. It is as high as it will go. Uh, that means no links, no excessive usage of symbols, and no excess, no excess repetition, no, no, uh, too many caps, and too many, uh, um, not, we're not allowing too, too large of paragraphs. All of those things are going to be insta, insta mutes. We're not banning for those. That's not what we're doing. But uh, we are going to be blocking and muting those because this is a run that is a lore run of probably, I'd say, the most popular to bash game that exists. Uh, I mean that sincerely. It is exceptionally popular to hate on and troll on and otherwise just be a terrible human being with regards to this game. So we're not tolerating anything and my mods have their my permission to be to use their own judgment with regards to individuals so so we have cranked up the security so uh oop, oop, i actually don't want to be here so before we go any further though i do want to talk about one other thing I'm pop out of here a game uh you've probably heard of and yet have no idea that you've heard of we're gonna go all the way back to i believe 1994 to this game how many people remember this game? Anyone? No? <laughs> I suppose I'll have to wait for a moment for chat to catch up because that's how that works. What's our poll at right now? For the Horde, apparently, is the one that's winning. Uh, we should be starting a bit earlier on this, sir. This is a game called Neverwinter Nights. Now, I know what you're thinking. I've played Neverwinter Nights. Well, yeah, you, you probably have. Uh, but no, this is Neverwinter Nights, the original. Again, 94. Well before the one made by Bioware. This is, in my opinion, the first MMO. The first thing that finally crosses the barrier from flat-out mud into MMO territory. This was also before the term MMO existed. Richard Gary had actually coined that term in 1999. Um, 
or 98, I forget which actually, but late 90s. So yes, this is the original Neverwinter Nights. It was a game on AOL, and it was the first game where you could actually uh, interact with... Oh, yeah, sure, I'll do that real quick, Samurai. Uh, uh, shoot, how do you spell his name? Give me a second. Hang on, guys, I gotta I gotta fix Lurker really quick. Lurker, uh, 11825. There, that should do it. Whoops, that didn't... Why didn't that work? Um... Oh, that's why. There we go. Fixed. Lurker, you should be fine. Anyways, um, so yeah, this was the the beginning. This is the granddaddy of all the MMOs. Uh, it's a terrible game. But I actually had AOL back in the day. And so I actually played this game. And it was my first exposure to this genre. But it wasn't exactly that popular. And there's two pretty big reasons for that. Uh, reason number one is, of course, the fact that it was on AOL, and while AOL was kind of the only option at the time, most people tend to forget in the early and mid-90s, most people didn't have internet, period. There were a lot of households which just didn't have internet. So that was the first problem. But the second problem was it was in every, basically every way, still a MUD in terms of gameplay and whatnot. It was just a MUD with a graphical interface and a few other things uh, attached onto it. So I was one of the lucky few uh, who actually, I shouldn't say few, but you know what I mean, who played it. And it got some interesting things. Um, <clears throat> shortly thereafter that, a couple other games came out. Three games came out in very short succession, all of which were inspired by the old MUDs and by Neverwinter Nights. Now, I don't have pictures for these, uh, but they were games. I'll go ahead and uh, leave this up here for just a second. They were games called Asheron's Call, EverQuest, and Ultima Online. These three are effectively the actual granddaddies of... MMOs in general. All three of them are the games that started the MMO boon. I'm not going to talk about those three MMOs in too much detail here. Suffice it to say, those three pretty much chopped up the audience, which by this point, 1999, when all three of the, these games were available in live, it was a lot more commonplace to have more uh, have internet. And this whole new market had basically just exploded as so many people were like, oh my god, I can go and play and interact with other people and it's great. And it was this new era of gaming. Shortly thereafter came the MMO glut. Some of you probably have been through at least a couple times like this in gaming history. I have been through several myself. Uh, my personal favorite is the, uh, the situation where everything was a Doom or a Quake clone, when FPSs were everywhere because Doom and Quake were so popular. Uh, then, of course, there was the RTS uh, glut after Warcraft and Command and & Conquer, as both games just, just had tons and tons and tons of other RTSs. Uh, constantly just spreading everywhere. But the MMO glut happened in the early 2000s, up and up to and including about the year 2006 or so. Lots and lots of MMOs came out during that time, and most of them were bad. And if you name one in, that came out in that period of time, I probably actually played it. I said Command & Conquer. When I was going. Um, or did I interrupt myself? I might have, because I keep glancing at chat. Um, but a lot of those MMOs were just kind of not really good. Uh, Anarchy Online was there. Dark Age of Camelot was there, you know. Uh, RuneScape was one of the ones that came out in that area. Uh, you know, there were quite a few uh, MMOs that came out in that range. Some were okay, some were great, some were terrible. I actually played Asheron's Call pretty consistently throughout most of it. So me and my friends... Oh yeah, Matrix Online. God, that one was terrible. So me and my friends... Uh, who had uh, known each other for years and years at this point, got together and were like, why don't we make our own MMO? And I actually went to school for and was pretty good at marketing. And uh, not, not just marketing, I'm saying that wrong. Market and business design and analysis. In other words, I, they came to me and said, if we were to make an MMO right now, would it be profitable? You know, could we do it? And I did an actual feasibility study on it. I said, yes. We could actually totally make an MMO right now. We will probably not make it big, but we will meet our expenses. And that was basically all all of us wanted to do. We wanted to go ahead and throw together this thing and make uh, th make a game, because because most of my friends had been had gotten into programming and whatnot specifically to get into game development and design. So they wanted to do this. So we spent some time working on this. I don't actually remember how long. It was a decent period of time and getting together. A lot of concept work was done. Uh, we hadn't actually gotten to, uh, too far into the actual hard code. We had an engine set up, that kind of a thing. We uh, had pretty much all of the story written. I had actually uh, done some of the story design myself. 
And uh, I can still tell you a lot of the story of that game. I still have it mem- remembered. Yes, Lineage was another one in the mem- MMO glut period. But as we were designing this, uh, I had been testing every other MMO out there. This is why I played basically every other MMO that was coming out at the time. And uh, like I said, I got invited into a game, which I'm now going to show you, that looked a lot like this. I know it's not properly scaled, and I don't care right now. Um, so this game was about the standards graphically of the day. It was it was kind of nice. They had a few things stylistically speaking that were uh, dis- that were a little bit um, like they weren't. Tr- they actually weren't trying to make the game look particularly better than some of the other MMOs. There were other MMOs out and coming out that actually had better graphics at the time. EverQuest Two and Lord of the Rings Online both come to mind, and I had tested both of those games as well. Uh, here's another shot for you, just to showcase the uh, the interface that we had back then. Um, and so, you know, going through this game, it was kind of nice. I really, really wish that I actually had some of my own screenshots. These are not mine. Um, unfortunately, I have actually lost a hard drive since then, since this was this was quite a while ago. This is over 10 years ago now. But uh, So I actually had my own screenshots that are gone, unfortunately, so I don't actually have any of the original... Uh, alpha stuff I've actually taken. Sorry. So this is something I I grabbed off of uh, off of the internet. But anyway, so yeah, we uh, so I started I started going ahead and pushing through this game and and playing it, and I just kind of tilted my head a little bit, and I went to the rest of the guys and I said, we need to get our game out before this game comes out, and they're like, why? And I'm like, because this game is going to explode. Uh, it does a lot of things that other MMOs basically had not done up until this point in time. And it's going to be much more popular than a standard MMO. And it's because, and, and my, my reasoning, and I, I did another feasibility study on this in my spare time, and basically the idea was this game is going to appeal to not just the MMO market. This is going to appeal to a larger market than just the people who like to play MMOs, which is what the market had been up to in that point in time. <sighs> Never have I been so regretful to have been right, because when the game actually came out, I basically pulled the plug. I was the guy securing us funding uh, from investors and whatnot, and I'm the one who went around and did the handshaking and did the meetings and told them this is over. We have just failed. We will no longer have a profitability margin because this game has come out. So, World of Warcraft then. World of Warcraft came out. How many of you, uh, just out of curiosity, were playing... World of Warcraft back when it came out, just as an idle curiosity. Uh, I, of course, uh, wasn't. <laughs> now, you're probably thinking, what do you mean you weren't? Well, the reason I ask this, uh, I was in the alpha, uh, I was in the beta, all of all of the betas, basically, um, and then the actual game came out, and getting a hold of a copy of this game was insane. Does anyone remember what that was like back in the day? Because this is true for games other than this one. Back in the day, uh, every now and again, you'd just have a hard time getting a hold of a game. You'd have a hard time purchasing it because they simply didn't have enough in stock. Anyone remember those days? Because I remember those days. So yeah, I had hard. I, I wasn't playing day one because I couldn't get a hold of a copy. They were sold out in the entire Kansas City area. I had nothing. And so what I ended up doing was I ended up uh, convincing a friend of mine who uh, who literally drove to another city completely. To, and he was getting copies of the game for himself and his friend. And I'm like, here, here's 80 bucks. Please go get me a copy of this game as well. And yeah, he went off. They were out, Ventures. You don't understand. They were out. And there's no digital distribution at this point in time. I had to have the disc. <laughs> it was required. And uh, yeah, as Callisto points out, they actually started pulling copies off of the shelf. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, I actually didn't play WoW immediately. Now, I, I got in, like, uh, about a week or two after that. But still, for those first few weeks, I'm just like... Um, and so World of Warcraft came out. I just kind of wanted to sort of uh, share that little anecdote of my intro into the games. And then I played in vanilla, and I was terrible in vanilla. I want to take a moment to say, Hello, Questy. Welcome to my stream. Uh, Shoutouts. Don't be a stranger. Uh, I like to chat with my viewers, obviously, since I paused to talk to you. Um, so, yeah, um, now there, here's an, one other little thing I want to comment on. So, I know this is going to sound weird, but I had a period in my life where I was terrible at video games. 
Now, I know you're looking at me like, what do you mean? Yes, Dog Andes. Uh, what do you mean? You know, how? So I was actually really, really good at video games back in the NES and SNES era. And then I started going to school, and then I started doing college, and you know all that horrible stuff. And I basically lost my edge. It's 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 like any other skill. You don't you don't practice it, you lose it, right? So when Asheron's Call came out, and when uh, in which I played the heck out of, I played it and was basically terrible at it. Um, be <laughs> I, I just was like uh, whatever. So when I started WoW, I was actually really bad at it at the start. Now, you might be asking, why am I bringing this up? What's the relevance here? Well, there's two points. First of all, for those of you who don't know, I actually consider myself an excellent WoW player. Yes, literally excellent. I would actually grade myself at, at that high of a level. I am damned good at this game and have been for years because I've kept playing it and I've kept practiced in it. But the second reason is the real reason I wanted to bring this up. Because this game actually caught me. I know this sounds weird, but, you know, there were good games on the N64. There were good games on the PlayStation 1. But none of them caught me quite like this one. None of them made me want to be good at the game. There were good stories and there were good experiences, but I never felt the urge to really push to actually be excellent at the game until this one. World of Warcraft just really grabbed my attention. The design of the quests, the fact that you could move through the engine to accomplish so many different things otherwise, uh, the fact that you can actually watch the animations to see what's happening without UE interface, you know, that kind of a thing. So I got damn good at this game. I actually uh, have rated this game in vanilla. Um... Never actually beat Noxoramus, to my sh to my shame. I have never actually uh, completed 40-man Noxoramus, and obviously never will at this point. But, uh, yeah, I uh, I raided Molten Core. I was actually one of the server firsts for uh, my server. Not the one you see here, but Kargath, uh, our second server, actually. Um, but, yeah, we... Uh, we, uh, we were we were one of the uh, we were actually the excuse me we were not actually the server first we were the side first we were the first alliance kill because I started on alliance of uh, of Ragnaros we went after Ankaraj of course I was there for the opening of the gate it was a great experience I'll be talking about that later um, and then we we you know Blackwing Lair was great and pushing through that and then we hit Noxramus we actually did get a few bosses down in Noxramus not all of them we never we I have actually personally fought the four horsemen back in the forty man. We never brought him down, and holy crap. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I have, I, 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 I'm I saying all this and sharing all my experiences with this, and I'm not trying to bore you with it. I hope you'll forgive my indulgence. I'm sharing this because during the period of time this game has come out, I got hit and run over by a car, lost my job, lost my house, and then had to be basically carried through life for several years. Uh, I was moving frequently. Uh, this was also the period of time when I uh, was living out in Pennsylvania and then moved again back to Kansas City and then a few other moves after that. Um, it was a pretty volatile time in my life, uh, especially those first few years, and I didn't really have what I would consider in my mind a home. I had a place I would sleep at, but that's it. I say this because there was, and I, I know this sounds pathetic, and I know this sounds stupid, and to be completely honest, I don't care because it's the truth. There is one place that has been static for me, one place that has been comforting for me, one place that I have actually been able to consider a home for the last 10 plus years. I admittedly am one of those uh, s saps who gets really, uh, really... Um, emotional, I guess, for lack of a better term, about certain things. Uh, I, I get very attached to things, you know, I am very much the uh, sentimental type. So, World of Warcraft, Azeroth, I really should say more clearly, has been my home for over a decade now. It has been the one place I can always go back to and feel like I can make a difference in it, like I can matter there. And I know what you're saying, oh, well, it's just a fictional universe, and that is true. It is, absolutely. I have argued for years that some, just because something is fictional does not mean it does not matter to us because the emotions it engenders in us are real. We actually genuinely feel, even if it is a fictional thing that causes that feeling, do we not? I have also met a lot of people in this game who I am friends with to this day, um, and I have also really 
uh, had some awesome, awesome times in this game. I will be sharing with you stories as we go throughout this lore run. I hope you will forgive my indulgence on that point. Now, so let's talk a little bit about format now that we've got that lengthy intro out of the way. I have extensive notes on this game. Uh, yes, I actually went and got a printout thing going on here. Uh, I've got a few things here. These, this is just a cheat sheet to help remind me of a few things. Um, and a few other things that are relevant there. But the first thing we're going to do, and this is the relevant thing here, which I started out. So we're going to start off doing this. Basically, we're going to be going through this game in chronological order. Because this isn't really the same type of thing as any other game I've ever done a lore run on. I have spent literally months planning this lore run out. So, uh... Uh, yeah. Um, Samurai or Deutsch, could you do me a fa favor and, uh, exclamation point permit Ventures really quick? Um, Ventures 616. So, we're going to be starting off right before Burning Crusade, which is going to be the Draenei and the Blood Elf starting zone. You can see that on our screen right there. Then we're going to be talking for a little bit as we discuss a few of the things that you're not going to be seeing because there's a few things I'm not actually going to be showing, excuse me, on camera. Uh, it is within the realm of possibility for me to actually play through vanilla. I'd rather gouge out my eyes than do that. I'm going to make this opinion very clear right off the bat. I didn't like... I, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not one of those people who thinks vanilla was where World of Warcraft was at its best. God, no. Absolutely not. I remember vanilla. And while there is, I have some wonderful, amazing, great memories of those times, and I do... Oh, nice, Venters. Uh, those memories basically pale when compared to everything that has happened since then. You know what I mean? Vanilla, I actually have a friend who has a great, great analogy for this. Vanilla was sand before we knew what water was. We drank it because we didn't know what water was. And so it's like, oh, I'm sand. And we lived with it. And it was good for the time, because before that we'd had even worse than sand. But once we actually tasted water in Burning Crusade, and especially in Wrath, where they really cranked up the quality, it was like, oh, this is water and it's so much better. I will say this, though. One thing I have a very fond memory of in Vanilla is the community. Some people... I don't even know what this was like back in the day. I've tried to explain it, but there, there are some of my viewers, and I've talked about this, I've streamed other MMOs in the past. Some of my viewers never actually were gaming in the era of MMO exploration. It's never, it's never been a thing, basically. Uh, because that, that era is gone. It's, it's over. It has not been a thing for years. Nowadays, it's the era of MMOs basically being a co-RPG, which I like. But I do admit I miss every now and again the community of just logging on to see what's going on. And seeing what's people and just hanging around Ironforge and like, hey, what's up, guys? Yeah, going to Moonbrook? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I remember all of that. I remember just hanging out. You knew the names. Yeah, some pe people knew you. And, and you'd be like, hey, you feel like doing something? Ah, I guess. Well, Bob over there wants to go uh, try and hit Dyerball again. It's like, okay, we could go try that. And you'd try to get a group together and go, you know. And But more than that, it was the time when you'd be roaming around the world and you'd see hundreds, literally hundreds of other people in a zone, mind you. And every now and again, and it was the time when nobody knew anything yet. Remember ThoughtBot back in the day? This was before ThoughtBot, actually. This was back when ThoughtBot was still barely even starting. This was back when we didn't even realize this game had full mod support. Which is another thing I'll talk about in the future. So we, we're just running around. And it's like, oh, God, I'm trying to find this one quest. And there's this thing. And the one guy's like, well, actually, I, th I heard it was in this one area. Oh, dude, if you, if you check out, by the way, the Raptors, they have a really good drop for leather. Oh, thanks, man. Slash wave. You know, just randomly. It, it's, it's, the, um, it's hard to explain it. Uh, a friend, another friend of mine who is, again, not me, has actually tried to explain this as the ships passing in the night mentality. Uh, in other words, that, y you know, you're just, like, you're just going, you're just a ship on the ocean, and all of a sudden there's another ship, hey, what's up? I don't think that's the most accurate uh, description, because that, that, that's more of a thing for, say, Guild Wars 2, which I, I don't want to get too much into right here. Um, but instead, the idea of, like, nobody knew anything. Nobody knew, no little Billy, I will not, nobody knew anything. Nobody had any idea what they were doing or what they were going for or how they were going for it or anything. And where's my, 
Oh, there she is. Um, and so, yeah, there was this there was this strong sense of, oh gosh, I'll help you this out, and oh, I know what this is, and and people, the information became a currency. You remember that when it was like, oh, where do I find such and such, or how do I do such and such, or I don't remember where this boss is, or what to do to beat this one boss, and other, and someone would know, and so they would trade that information to you in exchange for the information you had about some other quest that you just found. That it's like, oh god, I found a quest down in the blasted lands. What? There's quests in the blasted lands? Yeah, I know, right? Um, it was a completely different era. It was a completely different mentality. And again, I, see, the thing is, I do ad adamantly think the game has gotten better since then. But I admit a full uh, amount of nostalgia for back when it was the, the community of the frontier. And I liked that. But anyways, so... Uh, before I go too much farther... By the way, we have a vote up right now for Horde or Alliance. You can vote one for Horde or vote two for Alliance. That will actually determine which one we start with first. Also, it's a good way to show your allegiance, by the way, for the Horde, just saying. <laughs> Favorite type of character in WoW? A warrior. I've, I have been a warrior since vanilla, as I've said many, many times. That was not actually my first primary character, though. It wasn't even my first character in the beta. Uh, it was my second character in the beta, or my first. I don't actually remember. It was either a warrior or a warlock. I don't actually recall. Um, but uh, the... Yeah, I, I've actually... Like I said, I was uh, playing this game as a tank. A warrior tank in vanilla. And you're probably like, well, of course you were, because that's all a warrior could do in vanilla. That's not true, actually. An overpower warrior could do some really good stuff in PvP, and I should know. Um, but yeah, I... Uh, I play, I've played a warrior ever since the beginning. Um, okay, so I've taken my Asper and I've taken that. We are about ready to begin. So we're, what we're going to do, like I said, we're going to be doing this in chronological order. Uh, forgive me, I got a little off track there. I do have the ability to play this game in vanilla. Uh, I do actually have that capacity, thanks to private, uh, private servers. I can set one up on my own tower right now. Uh, I don't want to. <laughs> there will stuff I will be discussing in vanilla, and there will be stuff I will be discussing in vanilla in Cata, if that makes any sense. Because a lot of Cataclysm quests, the new quests in the new world, uh, reference the old world, so I'll actually be referring to them then. However, uh, actually playing through that would be basically like playing Tor again. And I don't really feel like playing Tor again. So, <laughs> you, those of you who are there at that lore run know just how bad that got with regards to uh, feasibility as a lore run. I, like I said, I will be discussing a few things, then I'm going to be showcasing a few raids as we go through. Uh, again, discussing the story elements of those once again. Uh, actually, Bjorn, I have done that. Um, I have another story about that too, which is even more horrifying, but we'll get there when we get to Shalomance. Anyways, um, they're, al they're awesome, Nikolaus. Um, and so, once we're done with that, then we will be starting up our Worgen Death Knight, who is one of our two mains. And he will be going through the Death Knight Starter Zone, which is an amazing Starter Zone, of course, because they all are. Um, after uh, after the uh, Death Knight Starter Zone, we will be doing we will be hopping on a uh, going straight into Burning Crusade. Basically, we're going straight through uh, straight through Burning Crusade, and then we're going from Burning Crusade straight into Wrath of the Lich King. Once we finish Wrath of the Lich King, once we have taken down Halion, we will actually be shifting back to characters like. These ones, this guy, this guy, this guy. And we will be doing, actually, not him possibly, but anyways, we will be doing the starter zones for every race because basically every starter zone got over, uh, revamped in Cataclysm. Once we are done going through all of the starter zones, the last two starter zones, four, excuse me, starters we'll be doing will be Deutsch, Despire, Leaf Song, and Ironment, as voted by you guys. These four characters will be the ones that will be leveling to 60. We will be doing all of the Eastern Kingdoms and all of Kalimdor on these four characters. Um, I actually uh, just feel like showing up. I actually have a map printed out and, and notated on exactly the order we're going to be uh, doing that in. Anyways, so... Uh, We'll be going ahead and going through all of the the New World 1 through 60 stuff for the Cataclysm. Once we have gone through all of that, we will go back to our mains, the Death Knight and the Paladin. 
And we will then continue through the rest of the game basically from that point onward. No more odd oddities. Uh, again, because of the nature of MMO time, which is a concept I'll describe at some point or another, uh, we, we, we can't just play the game through like any other normal game. It has to actually be done in a particular manner. Um, so, could someone please close the poll so we can decide who we're starting with? I need to actually do one thing uh, real quick. And let's get the sound going. I would also like to give public thanks... Oh, right, I don't have any add-ons on this. Uh, public thanks to several individuals. Those individuals include Third, someone some of you might recognize. Pax, who I hope some of you recognize. Janine, a very long friend. I've known her since uh, Vanilla. Uh, Bregwin, she, I believe, is in chat right now. Uh, Chris, I don't, I don't think he's in uh, chat, but... Uh, Chris is still an awesome friend of mine and has been for years. And uh, a gentleman called Nobel the Noble, um, who is actually a European server and arguably the best YouTuber about WoW lore that I am aware of personally. All of these people have helped me and in a, in, ah, God, in being shocked by that. All of these people have helped uh, assist me in the prep work for this lore run. Uh, I am going to be actually showcasing several of Nobel's videos uh, that I otherwise have no ability to showcase to you. Most notably, the um, uh, the Pandaria Legendary Quest Chain is is the big one there. So, so I want to give uh, again gratitude to all of these people for their assistance and their aid. And now I need to see what Samurai just donated towards. Now, we're not actually going to be doing that transmog until we get to Burning Crusade, just as a heads up on that. Uh, because of the nature of how transmog works, because of the fact that we don't have the transmog tab yet, uh, any transmog we get has to be on an individual person that we're using the transmog on. So that's going to take a little bit of extra time and work to do. It's okay, I don't mind doing it. I've already done some of the prep work for it. And I've already managed to uh, get some gold supply going for this character, so we're good on that. But, uh... So that's the bidding war. Uh, I guess I actually really haven't talked about the bidding war. Let's go ahead and talk about that really quick here. Uh, that was a normal, wasn't it? Yes, it was. So that is now at five. So... Over here on the right, uh, so third came up with an idea. I was really debating. Those of you who know I like to do donation incentives as kind of a thank you during my lore runs. Lord knows my lore runs take a ridiculous amount of time and effort to do. Um, and several of my viewers like to donate, you know, $2 or $5 or whatever during the lore run. And so I, want, I usually want to have something just fun uh, for people to donate towards. Well, these are the three things you can donate towards. Which outfit we'll be wearing on our worgen and our Blood Elf Paladin. So... Uh, what do you mean, Corwin? I don't, I don't understand the question. Um, so on the far left there, you could see the, uh, the first transmog outfit, uh, which uh, we don't have, like, I guess it's like the, the, Pax calls it the slutty outfit, but it's, it's gonna be, the Blood Elf is gonna be in very skimpy armor, and the Worgen is going to be in the full Death Knight gear. Um, the middle number is going to be the Crayola suit. I've actually gone out of my way to get a very mismatched, terrible-looking suit so that we can transmog it so we look like that as we're wandering around. And the far right one, which of course isn't over here, but it's actually right here, but you get my point, is going to be the normal suit, a.k.a. what you're literally seeing her wear right now, which is basically the actual armor she's actually using, and he will be using. Um... So these are the three things you can donate for, transmog-wise. Uh, it is a continuous bidding war. Whoever is actually on top is the one winning. Right now, normal is winning. Thank you for saving me that, Samurai. Hopefully it'll stay that way, because I got at least a few hours to go before we even get to those characters. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is this right here. Uh, anybody who's been, you know, watching me do lore runs since the Final Fantasy Marathon about two years ago now, by the way. It's been two years, guys. Um... The uh, Final Fantasy Marathon, during that, we actually had, uh, we actually had the, 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 the encounter counter. You remember that? And it was, uh, 
Oh, yes, Corwin, I know what you're talking about. You're fine. Um, the Encounter Counter. Now, that was just, it was just a fun thing, but basically every lore run since, we've wanted to have, like, one counter. Just to keep, just, just for fun, basically. It's kind of the equivalent of the drinking game. You know, every time you hear blah, take a drink. You know, oh my god, you know, to use an example from KOTOR. So, in this game, what we're using is... Mortals. This is the mortal counter. For how many times NPCs say mortals? Usually in a derogatory tone. Whoa. Ah, there we go. So yeah, um, anytime you hear us go oh, mortals or any or any NPC or especially bosses are like puny mortals or you reckless mortals. Anytime you hear that, we're going to be adding to the uh, mortal counter. In fact, I actually need to move this up so I am ready to update that at a moment's notice because I have a feeling that number is going to get pretty high um, by the end. Uh, if you guys would like to take a drink per the ignorant child method, that's up to you. Um, I will maybe do that. I might not have enough drink to do that. Trust me, there's going to be a lot of Mortal Counter. Um, okay. So with all of that set up, our audio is now on. Oh, I have someone here. Bow. I have no idea who you are, but hi. Um, I actually have, I don't know if you can tell this, I am actually in a guild I set up called the WoW Lore Run for this. Uh, it's only going to be this character, unfortunately, because Alliance Horde, etc. But still. We are a recruit of the WoW Lore Run. We will soon be a champion of the WoW Lore Run, if we do it properly enough. So, let's close that poll out. No, Rory, that won't count. There's not an open... What? Did we lose the poll? Oh, come on, Nightbot. You've been so good to me. Sometimes. Okay, the last... counter is off my screen. I don't know what we were at. Who is winning? Like, I, I have people voting for Horde as, as recently as, like, eight minutes ago. Oh, okay, you already closed it. Thank you. Okay, so, <clears throat> for the Hordes! For the Hordes! So we will be starting with the Horde! Now, if I could explain one thing really quick. Some people are like, why are you so pro-Horde, Arsh? As a, as a rule of note, I am not anti-Alliance. I want to make that clear. Some people are anti-Alliance. Some people are anti-Horde. I am neither of those. I'm actually pro-both. But if you had to get, make me choose between the two sides, I will pick Horde ten times out of ten. Um, Horde means family. Horde is the alliance of people who are completely disparate, who have who are hated and, and feared and in an alien place and constantly beset by uh, by enemies and hatred and pre prejudice and bigot bigotry and all that terrible horrible stuff. And while there are certainly bad apples in the horde, the horde is family. Just like any family, there's there's your bad things. Now the alliance I mean, what does the Alliance stand for? Politics? <laughs> the Alliance is also not that allied. It is actually extremely recently that the Alliance has finally started to actually unify in the storyline. Again, I'm not anti-Alliance. I am simply pro-Horde. So, for the record, uh, for those of you curious, we will actually be showcasing all of the cinematics. I have a lot of stuff set up for that. Uh, so I hope you are ready. Let me make sure I've got everything in the exact order. By the way, thanks to several uh, YouTubers, uh, again, Nobel being the big one, uh, I will actually be showcasing things that I otherwise couldn't show you, like the Battle for the Undercity, the Dark Spear Rebellion, Operation Nomragon, uh, Terragos's Rest, I'll be able to show off uh, the Raytheon quest chain, as I mentioned earlier, etc, etc. So, lots of thanks to everyone who has helped me with that. So, without further ado, Four years have passed since the mortal races banded together and stood united against the might of the Burning Legion. Though Azeroth was saved, 
the tenuous pact between the Horde and the Alliance has all but evaporated. The drums of war thunder once again. I'd just like to say, Blizzard has always been the top-notch cinematic people, in my opinion. I know some people argue with that, and that's fine. I mean, everyone can have different opinions, or opinions and per perspectives. But for me, Blizzard has always been top-notch, going all the way back to Warcraft 1. They have always been top of the line. I talked about that during the StarCraft lore run as well. As an aside... That video says a lot about how WoW Vanilla really was. It was all about, here's the classes, here's the world. No dialogue, you notice. Not a single line of dialogue in that whole cinematic. It was just, here we go. Yeah, I hear that a lot, Samurai. I actually disagree personally, but that's because Blizzard has um, continued to be good, whereas Square has done this in quality lately. Um, and yeah, that's the idea, Lim uh, Lexmix. We're going to see both sides. Anyways, so, um, yeah, the, uh, the the whole showcasing there is the setup for the two big elements that were that were the focus of WoW Vanilla. Here's the world, and here's the war. And it worked surprisingly well. Uh, I will say this, it is worth noting, that the original reason behind the segregation of the sides and the fact that the Night Elves are on the Alliance uh, is due to a little bit of executive meddling. Now, before you correct me, I want to I want to make my statement clear. When they made that decision, the only reason for that to happen was because of executive meddling and the fact that they wanted to have the two even sides. Uh, after the fact, they have gone back and written more into the backstory to try and explain why the Night Elves ended up with the Alliance and, and why things li lined up the way they did. But at the time, several people were kind of upset about that. So without further ado, let's start with the Horde. The past few years have seen unprecedented changes within the eternal land of Quel'Thalas. The Blood Elves, following the will of their crazed leader, Kael'thas Sunstrider, channeled dangerous, chaotic magics to transform their sacred Sunwell into a gateway of unspeakable evil. While Kael'thas and his demonic masters were eventually defeated, a different kind of transformation occurred within the Sunwell itself, 
as a dying Naru sacrificed its life essence to reignite the Sunwell into a fount of holy energy. Now, the Blood Elf Regent Lorthamar Theron sees a new hope on the horizon for his people. Over time, the Sunwell's light could cure the Blood Elves of their cursed state. But many still cling to the arcane powers they procured and are hesitant to relinquish them. As one of the remaining Blood Elves, you must fight to protect Quel'Thalas and help redeem the soul of your ancient people. So I know exactly why that's doing that. That is my fault. I know exactly what's going on here. There we go. That is my fault. I'm on the wrong server. The other server is fully set up for uh, for this lore run. I actually haven't touched any characters on this server because if you log on a character, then you you don't get to see that, that intro that you just saw. So uh, I have to go fix that really quick. That will not take long. It's my own fault. I'm just stupid. No, we're on the right server. I just need to do this, this, and bam, we are now fixed. So, <laughs> my own fault, like I said. Um, this is what should happen. There we go. Welcome to the Blood Elf storyline. Now, let's get one thing clear. Uh, I wish I was a better lore runner than I am, but I'm not. So, what we're going to do is we're going to try and discuss things in sort of a uh, flow of mindset kind of a thing. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to discuss background lore in the history in a zone where it's relevant to discuss it in, is what I'm trying to say. But I have not actually organized all of that. I have not decided, okay, in the Badlands I'm specifically going to be discussing the Elemental War and in, you know, that kind of thing. I haven't done that. I'm just going to be kind of flowing through it. So let's give you a little bit of backstory about the Blood Elves, just a little bit. We're not going to go into the whole details here. I also have a couple of notes here to help me with time. See, I'm bad at memorizing dates, so I wrote them down. Approximately 6,800 years prior to now is when the founding of Quel'Thalas actually happened. Uh, the founding of Quel'Thalas has a lot of backstory just to it, but I, like I said, I don't want to go into that right now. So, it's actually uh, relatively simple. The idea here is that after the destruction of the Well of Eternity, I'll cover that later, save your questions, after the destruction of the Well of Eternity and the Sundering of the World, what happened was there were a large number of blood elves, excuse me, I'm using the wrong term, of night elves who absolutely wanted to use magic carefully and controlledly because it was widespread excess that actually led to the problems of before. Now, I mention that because these were actually fairly reasonable people. In fact, the big guy, uh, I gotta find his name here. Uh, yes, Dathramar was the big one. He was around uh, during during the actual events of the War of the Ancients, he was one of the Night Elves who were actually part of the upper hierarchy, the Highborn, and disagreed with, with Queen Ashara. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Queen Ashara later. Like I said, I don't want to get too much into that. I'm just giving you a little bit of a baseline here. But these Elves said, okay, magic's a tool. Just like fire, just like nuclear war, or <laughs> nuclear power. So we can use this. We just have to use it very carefully and very specifically. We need control. We need we need to have things uh, properly monitored. We want to make sure nobody else is misusing it. We want to do this by the book. We want to do it correctly. And that way we won't have the excess glut of greed and stupidity and nightmare, which led to the War of the Ancients and called the Burning Legion to this planet. Okay? Really quick, for those of you who do not know, the Burning Legion is basically a trans-dimensional we want to wipe the galaxy clean of all life organization. That is quite a bit of an, uh, a generalization, but again, we're not getting into them just yet, right? So, these uh, Blood Elves, excuse me, I keep calling them Blood Elves, they're not, they're not even going to be close to being Blood Elves. These Night Elves uh, were like, okay, we can do this right, we're going to demonstrate it. And they argued, and they worked, and they fought, and, and there was a lot of uh, conflict, and it came down to a problem where in Ashenvale, uh, they actually released a Mana Storm. Now, that was a huge mistake, uh, and they really, really should not have done it. Fortunately, they were not actually uh, killed or wiped out as a result of that. However, they were banished. They were completely banished from the area. Just, nope, go away. So they got in a ship and sailed across the sea. I want to showcase something for you here. As soon as we get rid of the... Uh... 
things. So th they started over there on Kalimdor. Uh, this whole region right here is where the Night Elves lived at the time. They got on a ship and sailed across the Maelstrom all the way over here. They actually landed in Tirsifal Glades. There was something in the Tirsifal Glades that was an issue. Uh, believe it or not, we actually still don't know what that is to this day. But there was something wrong in Tirsifal Glades, so they moved on. Now, at this point in time, humanity was still basically in a tribal state, primarily centered around this area, the Arathi Highlands. Right around here. So, uh, and the dwarves were, were fairly self-contained and haven't, hadn't really started into the kingdom point. Yes, Rory. Because they wanted to use magic at all, the other night elves wanted them gone. The other night elves practiced the idea that any use magic music, music, any magic usage whatsoever was unacceptable. The elves, the highborn elves, as they would eventually be called, the high elves, uh, were the ones who said, no, we can, we can use it under controlled circumstances. I keep putting this because they were actually being quite reasonable other than the magic storm thing. That was, the, that was their one big mistake. Uh, actually, Ashara is an octopus lady, fun fact. Anyway, so... Uh, so they sailed over here, got to Tirsifal. Things didn't work out, so they pushed eastward. Now, I will be talking a lot about the trolls throughout the entirety of this lore run, because the trolls are a huge element of the lore of this setting. I don't want to go too much into the trolls of this. This is specifically the Amani troll, uh, who were the big area, who are the big guys in this area. So I mentioned how like the humans are kind of contained here, and the dwarves are kind of contained here. You might wonder, well, what's with the rest of the area? The Amani basically ran the entire continent. Uh, or I should say that's actually a lie. The trolls ran the entire continent. The Amani controlled basically all of this. And the Gura... Can you see the mouse cursor? Do I have the mouse cursor on right now? I can't tell. Hang on. I need to make sure I have the mouse cursor on so you can see what I'm pointing at. Give me a second. Uh... Okay, I have the mouse cursor on. Okay, good. Just making sure. Because I can't tell if I have the mouse cursor So anyways, Amani basically controlled this entire region up here. And the Gurabashi controlled pretty much this entire region down here. Okay. So they, they, were, they were pretty much the dominant power on the continent. Um, I'm not even talking about the elves used to be trolls things. However, that is true, yes. So uh, they pushed eastward and came into direct conflict with the Imani and basically ended up in a protracted moving war, pushing through troll territory until they ended up up here and here. These two zones right here. The combined area which is referred to as Quel'Thalas. Now, uh, they actually found that one of the ley lines of the world actually, yes, correct, Ventures, one of the ley lines of the world uh, coincided with this area. In fact, that coincided right up here on the Isle of Keldanus. Um, yes, liberated, I will. All the ones that, that actually had a cinematic. So they built this massive thing there, and they actually had a vial with them. That vial is actually really important. There are a few of those vials uh, we've actually tracked where all of them are across history. I just want you to remember in the back of your mind, they had one of the vials of the, of the original Well of Eternity with them. They used that in order to uh, interact with that ley line to create a brand new pseudo-font, a pseudo-Well of Eternity called the Sun Well. Now, the Sun Well was a different type of energy source, but the way it worked was it any elf... The only way elves maintain their immortality is because they basically have energy, magical energy specifically, that is constantly flowing through them. They are connected to it, which is effectively regenerating their, uh, their age, their cells, their light, and maintaining their life essence permanently. That's how they are immortal. They can still be killed, of course. You know, they are not invincible, but they do not age, and they have much less issues with disease and that white night as a result of that. So the Sunwell was 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 like their first priority when setting up here because they were cut off from the uh, Teldris or excuse me Nordrasil, uh, which obviously I'm not going to get up to that. Um, so the so the Sunwell was created and that goes ahead and allows them to have their immortal life and have have the elven life that they wanted. And they did they used the massive amount of leyline power in this area to create a lot of things, including uh, creating anti-demonic fields, making the rune stones, and basically terraforming the area. Now you think I'm joking about that. I can actually showcase you see this area right around here? They kind of crafted this eternal good weather. 
I know that sounds weird, but it's true. They made this sort of uh, constant autumn look. The trees will always stay amber. Uh, the the grass will always be this nice lush of green, you know, that kind of thing. All of this was stuff that they deliberately did. This is actually terraforming on a magical level that they did to make this place look like this. It didn't originally look like this at all. Um, and they did this for the rest of the zone, which we'll be seeing in a little bit once we get there, for the, re the duration of Eversong Woods. Originally, the Ghostlands was terraformed as well. We'll get there, though. We'll get there. So, after all this work was done, see, they were doing this because they, again, they wanted to use magic. They wanted to use magic regularly and normally, but they did, they really, really wanted to make sure that they didn't have any demons showing up on their doorstep. They did not want to repeat, repeat, excuse me, of the War of the Ancients. Yes, this is my pet. We should vote to name the pet. <laughs> um, like, after a viewer, I should, I should answer, uh, I, sh I, I should name it after a viewer. But I, I don't, don't vote for that thing yet. I'll, I'll do it in a minute. So with the terraforming done, with the, you know, the sun, uh, the way they did things with, with the terrain, all of that stuff was done. They set up the rune stones, which was actually a significant point in both Warcraft 2 and Warcraft 3. Those rune stones were designed to, to basically make a magical warding around the entire area to prevent people from even seeing this section of, of the terrain, to prevent demons from being able to access within it, that kind of a thing. And so as a result, demonic uh, magic was basically forbidden within this region for a long time. Now... Some time passed, the Troll Wars happened, the Tirsifal Council was established, Dalaran was made, you know, a bunch of other stuff happens. I don't want to cover all that here because that's not directly relevant to where we are right now. Suffice it to say, Deathramar actually did eventually die. Uh, he was succeeded by Anastarian, someone who some of you might recognize. Anastarian was actually killed... Well, okay, the lore is actually in inconclusive on exactly when Anastarian died. The most common theory, and this is the one I adhere to, is that Anastarian died during Warcraft 3 in the invasion by the Scourge into this land. And you may be like, what invasion? Trust me, I'll show it off when we get there. It'll be really obvious. Um... But the you know the, the scourge invaded, killed Anastarian, and a gentleman named Kaelthos took over. Now Kaelthos is actually a descendant of Dathramar, um, which is funny because Lorthramar is also a descendant. I don't remember their exact relation to each other, but anyways. Uh, Prince Kaelthos took over the the elves, and after some horrible incidents, renamed them the Blood Elves. This is where we finally answer Rory's question. Uh, yes, by the way, this will be going up to YouTube. Um, so, the elves up until this point in time actually had really, really idyllic lives. Practically a paradise life. We had situation going right up until the Scourge invasion. They were able to withstand the trolls. They were, with some help, they were able to withstand the humans. They had good relations with all the other races. You know, everything was basically going good for them right up until the Scourge showed up and crushed them like a bug, because that's what the Scourge do. The Scourge are basically the equivalent of the Borg of this setting. Under the right circumstances, they don't lose. So, but I don't want to get too much into the Scourge right now. So the Scourge came in, and they deliberately uh, used the energies of the Sunwell in order to bring back a very powerful individual into a basically a new form of undeath, which, again, I don't want to talk about too much right now called a Lich. Now, this Lich was called Kel'Thuzad, one of the best characters in the entire game, in my opinion. Um, so, Kel'Thuzad was birthed through the Sunwell, and a couple of other things happened along the way. I really don't care that much about the Betrayer and the things he did, and the comic, and what's-her-face. I don't even remember her damn name right now. It's not that relevant. The point being, long story short, they, uh, they were like, okay, let's do this. Let's go ahead and... Destroy the hell out of the Sunwell. So the Sunwell was so horribly corrupted that the idea was the energy... Remember, all these elves are tied into the Sunwell. All of them, 100%. So all of these elves who are connected, the undead energies that were flowing through it, we're now going to go through all of those elves and turn them into uh, similarly... Uh, undead, uh, we're not actually sure what the actual results of that be. The, the idea was to turn all of them into undead servants of the Scourge. Like every elf, basically genociding uh, the high elves from existence. So Kael'thas did an extremely radical and dangerous thing. He detonated the Sunwell. Now I can actually kind of showcase this really quick if you give me one moment here. Oh, uh, where is that thing? How do you spell it? Chauffeur, I think. I'm trying to remember how to spell it. There it is. 
Yes, I have the level one mount. Of course I do. So, you see that island over there? That's where the Sunwell is, was as well. And that's where it was detonated. We'll actually see the full extent of the damage that that did when we finally go over there. We will be going over there. But pfft, it caused some really bad backlash when Kael'thas made that decision. Uh, that is actually basically when they were renamed from the Keldurai to the Sindurai, a.k.a. the Blood Elves. Um, the idea behind the concept was that they were not, it wasn't like blood magic in a Dragon Age sense. It was more like, you know, the blood mages, the blood elves were being named that in honor of the thousands and thousands and thousands of their own who were decimated when the, when the scourge came through. To give you a little bit of an idea, yeah, let me look at the timeline real quick to give you an exact number. Uh, that happened in the year 20, Okay. As of about the year 28, so a full eight years later, the Blood Elves are still reeling and recovering from that. They are still trying to get back to normal functional uh, functionality as a species, as a power. They have been very, 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 uh, very screwed up as a result of that. It, it was it was pretty bad. So Kael'thas detonated that. Now that had two uh, immediate horrible after effects. Number one. Elves kind of suddenly stop having the ability to be immortal. So, you know, all those things that they didn't have to deal with kind of suddenly go away. Um, the second uh, thing here, the second significant moment thing here is... So, elves had become addicted to magic. Now, this is funny... Because the Night Elves are also addicted to magic. They just used something else as a stopgate to prevent their addiction. But the point is, uh, when I say they were addicted, I mean what is effectively a chemical addiction in, in real life terms. In other words, the idea that you have been... Uh, it would be like you, it's saying that you're addicted to water. It's true, uh, by the technical definition of the term, but it is something that you need in order to continue to function. Uh, we'll be seeing several quests dealing with this addiction and their requirement of magic, and that addiction is what ended up uh, pushing Kael'thas to making a deal with Illidan back during Warcraft Three: The Frozen Throne in order to try and sate that addiction. In fact, Illidan, funny fact, did actually have a uh, solution for the Blood Elf addiction, but he ended up not sharing it because Kael'thas had turned traitor. But again, that's more BC stuff, don't want to get too much into that right now. So yes, you literally require, you literally require uh, magic in order to continue to function as a blood elf. It, and, and that's just that, there's nothing else for that. Now as a result of that and the, the kind of horribleness that it caused in people, several blood elves kind of became evil. Um, and now I, I want to stress the way I say this because it's kind of understandable if you think about this. This is the curse that was referenced, by the way, Rory. I'm finally answering your question. Um, the curse is that addiction to magic. Um, I say becoming evil. That, that really isn't quite getting across the point, I don't think, quite as well as I would like to. Because the overall idea here is imagine you suddenly have no access to water. I know that's a weird thing, but just pretend for a moment. Like water goes away. Let's say you can rip water out of someone else, or something else. How many days of dehydrating to death do you think you could endure before you start trying to do that to other people? And that's basically the situation the Blood Elves found themselves in. So yes, quite a few Blood Elves became very desperate and very violent and were willing to do some pretty bad things to survive. Now, the Blood Elves did figure out other methods of, basically, band-aid methods of, of ripping magic out, as Dakota actually points out. Uh, but those were only band-aids. It wasn't an actual sustaining source. Again, to use the water parallel, imagine if, you know, you were able to get a little... You know, you know those, like, the NyQuil cups that's on the top? You know, you open the thing and there's this tiny little NyQuil dosage cup? Imagine if you got one of those with water. A day. That's pretty much the equivalent. You got this tiny little thing of... And that's all you get. That's what those stop gates, that, that's what those band-aids were able to help them to do. Surviving barely. Just barely. And that situation existed for some time as, as they were constantly trying to find new methods and new sources and trying desperately to, to fix this situation. 
Now, uh, as of now, this problem has been resolved. We will actually be watching this problem be resolved live on stream. So for now, the point at which we're at in this exact moment in time, uh, that is the situation we have found ourselves in, and we can finally, finally start the quests. Ah. Ah. Yeah, Demon Hunters aren't out yet, man. Come on, Corwin. Okay, so one other thing. I have played this game many, many, many times. Uh, I have played through this game many, many, many times. <sighs> uh, yes, Psychotic. I'll, I'll get to that, too, trust me, because there's I, I'm pretty sure there's at least two quests that showcase that. Anyways. Um, so, uh, when I used to play this game with my sister, uh, to our knowledge, there is no actual... Uh, cure for the addiction god mode, that is correct. There's never been a successful attempt to cure it. There have only been things to help sustain the water addiction. Uh, yeah. Anyways, um, so, okay. When I used to play this with my sister, and she's not the only one like this, I used to do this packs as well, uh, I would be voice acting the quests for her because we were on Skype, or we were sitting next to each other, or whatever, so that she didn't have to read. Uh, originally, she said that she wanted that because she didn't want to read, but after a while, she was like, no, I want you to say the quests, because she was actually interested in the story, and apparently she liked my voice acting. So, I'm going to be voicing the quests for you guys. As long as my throat doesn't give out, um, I will be uh, voice acting all of the quests for you. I actually have an additional thing of liquid right here, just in case of that. As per usual, whenever I start up a lore run, I got sick right before it. That happens every time, I swear. So I'm still actually recovering from a sore throat right now. But we'll see how this works out. Okay, so... <clears throat> the sooner you begin your education, Lakma, the better for us all. There is little room for error, so listen closely. The burning crystals, those green floating objects to the west of the Sunspire here, have long been used to power the Isle's experimentations. The monoworms were their guardians, but the invasion of Kalthalos has driven them from errant from our magical control over them, and there is little choice but to thin their numbers for reclamation. Do this, and then return to me. Death to all who oppose us. Okay, I guess I'll go kill some vitals. So, in case you're missing the significance of that, the point here is that these monoworms used to be... Um, Droids, I think, is probably the best explanation. No, that's not good, because there's no sentience involved, no sapiens. Basically, these used to be completely under the control of the Blood Elves in this area. They're not anymore. These creatures are basically just wild, regular creatures now, and they have been for the past eight years or so. Um, actually, I guess at this point, it wouldn't be eight years. It would be six years. Excuse me. Wait, no, that's wrong, too. Hang on, hang on. My bad. That would actually be... Four years. So for four years, these things have actually been uh, roaming free as if they were just animals, uh, affecting the local wildlife and terrain, and of course, no longer being under the control of the Blood Elves. So what we've been doing for the past four years is, rather than, for example, just taking several of these drones and, and attaching to them things to help charge them and recharge them, and basically mobile batteries, uh, we have a slightly more pragmatic method of obtaining the energy we need from them. So, <laughs> this quest has actually changed a little bit. Uh, originally, the, there were a couple of different uh, class abilities. There was a mana tap, which basically took mana from an enemy and stored it. And then there was a mana burst, which, which restored your mana. That has since been removed from the game, so that's not a thing anymore. Um, <laughs> let's see. So... Uh, yeah, this is this is the this it actually serves an excellent purpose story-wise because again it emphasizes exactly the direction the blood elves have gone ever since the they became the blood elves ever since they stopped being the high elves. The high elves were not exactly the saints; they were not exactly the best of people, but they would you know still act within a peaceful and overall you know an an, an eye towards cooperation. Um, Instead, what we have is the Blood Elves, who are now, again, desperate and more than willing to kill their own creations in order to survive. What business have you? Uh, you have successfully completed your first task, and for that you're to be congratulated. Such success gives me faith you will turn out better than those young Blood Elves who failed to heed the lesson of their masters. Continued success will be rewarded, and not only with knowledge, but with tangible rewards as well. 
Your work here, however, is not finished. There's much more to learn, my young friend. We will have justice. Your effort has made something clear that, honestly, I wish were not true. The unchecked power of the burning crystals has maligned a much larger swath of the Isle's natural balance than we thought. We must now take more effort to reclaim control. Unfortunate measures, excuse me, much more unfortunate measures to reclaim control. The nearby Lynxes have succumbed to the influence of the crystals and they must be put down. Bring me their collars, Lakmar, as I may yet to be able to fashion a magical restraint to be able to turn some of them from being uncontrolled. If you're missing that, the point here is once again the local wild beasts, who again used to be totally under the control of the Blood Elves, or excuse me, the High Elves, are no longer, and so now they are also causing issues because there's basically wild tigers, lynxes actually, wandering around the area. This is by memory, Salty. Hunter training! As you advance within your... I'm not going to read this. That, that's Keep not really your relevant. Wits about you. And no, I will not be using heirlooms except on the six characters we're actually leveling. It's not relevant or necessary. We will persevere. <sighs> Shirel are on. Uh, right, right. This direction. So... Once again, we see the pragmatism of the Blood Elves. We haven't seen the reason why they're so pragmatic yet, though. We will. It, it will be a thing in the future. Don't worry. For now, we're going ahead and retrieving some of the, the broken collars on the, on the lynxes. These things used to keep these things under our control, damn it. Ah... And hello, Labkims. What's up? Now, the good news is, other than a few exceptions, WoW has drastically increased the uh, quality of its quests. Now, you may be asked, what do you mean? How many of you remember, just to use my personal favorite example, Zivra Hooves in the, uh, in the Barrens. For those of you not aware, you had to get... Uh, you had to get uh, Zivra Hooves from Zevras. So you'd think, and you need to get four of them. So you'd think you would only have to get four, right? You know, you'd have to kill one Zevra, and then you'd get four. Well, the drop rate was a little less than 100%, or 400%, actually, as it should have been. Uh, the drop rate was closer to, like, 5%. Or Basilisk Brains. Oh, fall. I hated that quest. So yeah, back in Vanilla, and to an extent in Burning Crusade, Drop rates were terrible. Worse, drop rates didn't share back in the day. If you don't know what I mean by that, let's say I'm grouping with, oh, I don't know, my sister or my friend Pax, and we go and we kill, and we have to get 10 insert item here drops. So we have to get 20 between us, and they don't share. So <laughs> at a 5% drop rate, assuming standard, like assuming it's just every 20 kills we get one, uh, we would have to kill... Uh, 160 Zevras in order to finish that quest for me and Pax. Now, of course, that's not how statistics works, but just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm one of those people who's really glad that WoW has improved its quest design since then. <clears throat> Every now and again, though, there is another quest. Now, Pax and I actually have a specific term for it. It's not actually Zevra Hooves. It's uh, Troll Ears. And remember that quest? Stranglethorn Vale. Go get Troll Ears. 13 of them or something like that, and oh my god, it took forever. Anyways, but the really important point was Troll Ears did not share. So Pax and I have a phrase, as we're going through, we actually literally, as we're, you know, doing an expansion for the first time, we just did this for Warlords a little a little over a year ago. Um, as we're going through quests, we'll say, you know, we'll we'll kill something, and then we'll both try to loot something. And then if it, sh if it doesn't share, one of us will be like Troll Ears, and the other one knows exactly what we're talking about. It, it's the troll ear situation. Anyways. Um, to my knowledge, childbirth is not a thing that the Blood Elves were uh, considering themselves with. Uh, concerning themselves with, excuse me. However, uh, it is funny and worthy of note that even children who were recently born still had the same magical addiction because it was born in birth of their parents. 
Uh, so, at the very least, the the next generation, who at this point, I'm a time owner, mind you, would only be like three years old at most, uh, would still be magically addicted. Hmm. Anyways, it gives me no pleasure to ask you to destroy these beasts. While in times past we've lived in relative harmony with the woodland creatures, I want to stress again that what they mean by harmony is we're in control of everything. Uh, these, are, these are different times. The first order of business for the Sindorai is survival. Make sure you remember that. The tower and surrounding areas should now be relatively secure, though only for the time being. You've done well in providing us with the buffer of security, but we need to reassert control over the entire isle if we were to survive here in the long run. This will involve tackling much greater threats than errant monoworms and lynxes. Take this. You'll no doubt make good use of it for the tasks to come. Be ready for anything. You are to report to my assistant, Lanthan Perellian. He will instruct you on what needs to be done next. While we here at the Sunspire will continue to rein in the burning crystals, you'll be focused on a more pressing matter concerning Falthrian Academy. Lanthan will explain fully when you speak to him, and here's directions to him. The reckoning is at hand. By the way, some of you might be like, what the heck is a burning crystal? I'll show it off, don't worry, don't worry. First we're going to get the next quest. Yes, that's right, guys. Oh, I should go do this real quick. Anyone remember back when you uh, didn't automatically learn skills as you leveled up? Just raise my hand on that one. So, yeah, back in the day, uh, you had to used to go back to town to train. Now, that's not a big deal. It's kind of indicative of the direction WoW has gone in general, a.k.a. convenience. Um, they've gotten rid of a lot of aggravation elements. Of, of World of Warcraft, a lot of irritation elements. Uh, some people call this dumbing it down, some people call it streamlining. That's opinion. I'm not going to lay judgment one way or the other. But I personally do like one thing they've done, and that's they got rid of skill ranks. Now all skills scale directly to your stats and levels. Um, and I actually kind of prefer that for reasons I'm not going to go into design-wise right now, because I don't think it's really necessary. Also, I have to share something real quick. So when Burning Crusade first came out, uh, my friend Lisa was playing through this game. She was my neighbor. She literally lived like 100 feet from me. And she uh, re she had tried to get into WoW before, but BC really sold her, and she loved it. She loved playing a Blood Elf. Um, so she and I once started a character together, and she's here running through, and she's a cat person. Uh, I, I guess you could call her a crazy cat lady, but I don't mean that it's derogatory. I mean, she literally had about 13 cats in her house. So she's here, she's like, <gasps> and because she, she sees little cats walking around, aww. So I swear to God, this was accidental, but if you right-click something that's targetable and attackable in this game, um, that happens. Oops. Or that. I swear it was an accident, because again, you, you just right-click. You, you don't have to deliberately be like, oh, I'm going to kill you. So I just right-clicked the mouse, because that's how I move the camera, with right-click. Um, and the cat died horribly, and she actually, <laughs> she actually got up, walked over, and was like, what are you doing? Killing that cat, you bastard. And I'm like, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to, I'm sorry. Uh, it's okay, they respawn quick, because they're cats. The dark times will pass. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, <clears throat> so, the day after I stand, day after day I stand here watching, waiting. I've been accused of dwelling too much on our past, while our eyes must look to the horizon. But it is my firm belief that each visitor to this island should honor those who have sacrificed all, so they may continue to do so. Dathramar Sunstrider was our first king. He led us here from Kalimdor through the Maelstrom. Seek out his shrine to the west and do not return to me until you've read the plaque in his honor. That depends on the viewers, Rory. Because there's something in Noxoramus where that'll come up. With all the chaos happening here at the Sunspire, I haven't had a chance to collect my belongings I've left at various places on the Isle. I must maintain my visual over the Sunwell, so I ask you to collect them in my stead. I need my scrying orb, my scroll of scourge magic, oh, and my journal. Use my satchel from some extra space, as my things are rather bulky. Uh, return them to me, and I'll give you something. You know, for the effort. Oh, you can keep the satchel as well. Farewell. Yeah, I have a bag. Hey, don't worry, no more cat killings, except maybe in Noxramas. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you do. Anaria Shola. <sighs> it's a shame we've lost control of so many of the creatures here on the island. 
This was once a tranquil place of study and research. Now it's all we can do to keep from being attacked by our own creations. I'm going to offer you a chance to receive a magical boon in exchange for some collecting work on your part. Bring me a stack of arcane slivers that are found on the mana-using creatures of Sunstrider Isle, and I'll cast a spell on you that should aid your adventures on the Isle. Death to all who oppose us! I want to point out one thing really quick. A again, a little bit of a perspective thing. So, back in vanilla, this game wasn't balanced. Now, I know what you're saying. Oh, whoop de crap It's never been balanced. That's not what I mean. I'm not talking about PvP. Um, I've actually talked about this problem many times in games. So, a lot of MMOs, and this is true to this day, aren't balanced class to, class to progress, basically. In other words, and I'll use my favorite example of this, in Lotro, if I'm leveling as a runekeeper, going through the exact same quests... Uh, that a Guardian is going through, the Guardian is going to be like, crunch, 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 just wiping the floor with all the quests, whereas the Runekeeper will be barely keeping up. Um, it is, in my opinion, design-wise, that that is bad design. The reason it is that way is twofold. Number one, it encourages questing, or grouping for questing, excuse me. So rather than, you know, it being a solo questing experience, you have to group up to quest, which I do not like. Um, and number two... The idea is completely segregating the classes to make sure that they are very different from each other. So the fact that the Guardian can do that is because the Guardian is just all about living. So they've got tons of armor, tons of health, tons of block, tons of evasion. So they can crush through a content because they're in no danger. The Runekeeper is all about healing and damage, glass cannon. So they get killed even by regular normal mobs, right? Now, wow, as of now... That, that they're not perfectly balanced, but instead of being like this disparity between the Runekeeper and the Guardian, is closer to like this. But that's how it is now. Uh, I'd argue basically since Cataclysm is, is, is uh, when that really became a thing. Because back in the day, uh, that wasn't true at all either in WoW. Now the real reason I bring this up too, though, was there was another way this wasn't balanced, and that was between the actual zones on the sides. Anyone remember the dearth of trying to level through the 40s, by the way, in vanilla? Oh, I hated the 40s so much. Anyways, I had to do it several times, too. Anyways, anyways. Um, mm. So, while, uh, while back in vanilla, Alliance zones were heavy on quests and heavy on exp, basically. Horde was not. Horde was a lot more uh, spread out. The actual quest density was different. And it, it, not, uh, not the whole way, but especially for the earlier levels. It was like... Uh, uh, uh. That was basically fixed as of BC. But one of the comments, and I believe uh, several uh, people made fun of this when BC first came out, including PvP Online, I know for a fact, um, several, of the, several of the people when, when BC came out were like, Oh my god! You know, as, as you're playing on a horde, and, and act, it was actually, you're leveling decently. You're, you're actually leveling well and, and smoothly because of the quest density. And so people, the big joke was, oh my god, they finally made the horde like the Alliance. Or maybe this is what it was like playing Alliance, you know, something like that. Um, but I mention that because this zone really emphasized that. How many quests have we had in a space of area that's about 100 yards across? We haven't even budged from basically these three buildings, excuse me, two buildings. This one building right here, and this building over here. And yet we have done several, several quests in this one area. And that was not really how that worked back in the day on several other zones, especially the starter zones. Um, I mention this as well, though, because this is something that I know is a little bit of a controversial opinion. I think Blizzard's quest designers have been getting better each expansion. I think that each expansion, the design of the quests, has been improving. More diversity, more fun things to do, uh, better density, better evening out of things, better flowing. You know, they introduced this concept called flowing in Cataclysm. Uh, in the old ways, it was like, here's all the quests. And that's basically it. In the new way, basically as of Cataclysm, there's like five quests all over the place. And they're all, they all have the same flag, which means if you get one quest, you don't get any of the others. They're all, they're all tracked as if they were the same quest, right? And that quest says, go here. It's a go-to quest. So you have the go-to quest, and you're, that go-to leads you to the actual questing hub. When you get to the questing hub, there's usually an introduction quest. Here's this area. 
da 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 you know so you you do the area uh go to you do the go to quest you do the intro quest the intro quest leads you into like three or four other quests which start off the story of that particular zone and wherever that particular plot arc is going those four quests usually merge into like two quests which merges into one which merges into four and that's the flow of the quests now um and that's something I feel works a lot better, uh, especially since back in vanilla, and again, as a lot of people, see around Corwin, uh, a lot of people who back in vanilla played this can, can attest to this, a lot of the times you're just running around looking for quests because there wasn't really any indicator of where they were other than other people. It's that information trading thing I mentioned earlier. Uh, you either knew where the quests were or you roamed uh, randomly. Now, I want to answer a question that was asked a while ago before I started off on this. Um... What do I value more? Character balance or character diversity? That's actually a really tough one. Uh, I've often said that there is no good answer between those two things. Um, because on the one, extremes of both are bad, in my opinion. If every class is the same, then, there, then you have the extreme version of there's no, you know, bring the player, not the class. There's no reason to roll any one class over any other class, right? It's just a matter of aesthetics at that point. By contrast, if you have too much diversity, we have WoW Vanilla all over again, where if you want a tank, you play a warrior. If you want to heal, you play a priest. You know, that kind of a thing. Um, and, and it also meant, and this is the real downside of that, if you have an MMO, which you just asked about, if you have excessive player diversity in terms of classes, sometimes classes are just flat out required. How many of you remember how you couldn't do certain bosses in vanilla and in BC because you didn't have a shadow priest? By the way, I was a shadow priest in BC. I was when I I got my raid slot because I was a shadow priest in BC. Uh, that was one of the raid things. I also raided as a hunter in BC. But you get my point. You had to be or bring a certain class in order to do, and it varied from boss to boss too, which also kind of sucks because to give you an idea of what that means, let's say you're going through a, a dungeon that has, I don't know, 10 bosses. Let's say two of them require priests and two of them require shamans. So your shamans in your raid group will probably never fight those bosses that, that require priests because your slots have just been given to them. And those priests will never get to fight your two bosses. So like I said, there's not there's I, there's problems both ways with diversity and with homogenization. And so even from a design perspective, I look at them and kind of like uh, you know, I I don't think there's really uh, trying to meet a balance between the two is 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 really the goal, I think, and it's it's not the easiest thing in the world to do and I admit that. Um, and yes, Vanilla Four Horsemen required eight well-geared, extremely coordinated tanks. I should know. I was one of them. Sucked. Yeah, and the, yeah, the frost. So there's a boss who I actually will not. Uh, oh no, I will be killing. That's right. I specifically sent my mage out there for that. So there's a boss who you can only kill with with a frost. Or rather, back in vanilla, you can only kill with a frost mage. Uh, now, now there's a couple other methods to do it. I may still not be able to kill the boss uh, if I don't. Oh well, it's not a big deal. Yeah, uh, and yeah, a paladin was required for everything because you needed buffs and you needed uh, reses. A druid was required for a couple of buffs, you know, etc., etc. So yeah. Anyways, back to lore. No, I'm surprised how many people are uh, on in this zone. It's kind of neat. What uh, if there's only one lesson you deign to remember from your time on Sunstrider Isle, let it be this. Control your thirst for magic. It is a thirst unending, Lakma. What you absorb must be controlled and released by an arcane torrent. Failure is to become one of the wretched, hopelessly addicted and insane. Hey, Zachariah. Seek out a mono worm and unleash your arcane torrent upon it. Learn to master your power. When you have sufficiently released, return to me. Keep your wits about you. So again, this this quest has changed a little bit. Uh, no, no role-playing. We're just going to be reading quests as we go. As in characters I can manage. And once again, control y'all first. Just getting across the idea once more of uh, the problem that faces all Blood Elves. Oh, you're welcome, Delphin. 
I do welcome questions, by the way, at all times, except in, when I'm either in the middle of a big speech, because I want to finish my thoughts before I move on, uh, and I'm in the middle of a cinematic. Those are the only two times I won't, like, pause to answer you. So if I'm, like, not doing either of those things and I don't answer you, it's not because I'm ignoring you. Uh, it's because I missed your question. I'm trying really hard to play while talk, while reading chat. I'm not perfect. I just apologize. I will try to be more perfect in the future. Uh, actually, hunters used to have mana back in the day. Uh, it kind of sucked. I was one of the first people in my server to champion the idea of having the mana oil on two one-handed weapons. Um, that was that was. I, I'm not. I'm not going to claim like I was the first guy to do that, but uh, I was the first guy amongst the people I know. It was independently uh, invented by me, and I was actually pretty happy with that. Favorite add-ons in order. All of them in that order. Uh, the add-ons I would consider absolutely mandatory would be Bartender, X Pearl, and Arcud. Those three I, I, I personally consider to be mandatory. So here's the shrine to Dathramar. Now I mentioned him earlier. Dathramar was the is the king of the the High Elves, the gentleman who led them away from uh, from Kalimdor. Uh, 6,800 years ago. They, he was actually someone who is over, was over 10,000 years old, someone who actually was present during the War of the Ancients, was actually a member of the Highborn, the Upper Council of Queen Ashara, and a good guy, in my opinion. Um... Uh... I, I think those are pretty different, personally, Omni, because in this case, the High Elves turning into the Blood Elves didn't really change. It was more of a cultural thing, and the fact that they suddenly lost access to their life uh, essence and capacity, so, yeah. <clears throat> Upon further, uh, you have discovered the location of the shrine. Upon further examination, you sense a strong pulse of the strange power that has gripped the Isle. You feel a bit uncomfortable and perhaps a little disturbed. The bronze placard on the side reads... Here lies the Shrine of Dathramar, a fitting tribute to a noble elf. Let all who gaze on this monument remember his sacrifice for our people and his dedication to the cause of this continued survival. All who prosper in Quel'Thalas do so thanks to him. That's no joke, too. Ignoring the fact that he was the one who saved lots of lives from the persecution and violence of the Night Elves, he is pretty much the guy who led them through the trolls and through the wilds of the Eastern Kingdoms in order to uh, set them up here and build them a new kingdom. And we're going to wait on that quest. So, I, I use DBM. I will be using DBM when we switch to those other characters. But uh, that is a thing that is, uh, I, I would not consider mandatory. Where is it? Lore Runner or Lore... There it is. Lore Master. We're going to have Lore Master title in all our characters because I think that's appropriate. Oh, right. I have a mount. Uh, and yes, hunters literally cannot equip melee anymore. I still don't have quality options. I have 160 viewers. Ah, uh, whatever. Anaria Shola. Mm, you have done well today, Lakma. Your willingness to learn shows you may very well rise above the unyielding cravings you must endure as a blood elf. Rest not on your laurels, young one, but instead seek to master what you have learned. Only through diligence will we as a race survive. Take this, it may be of some use to know. And go now and bring glory once Hold more your head high. to our people. Yeah, I used to have a lot of stat sticks. Of course, the most common one was the Arena uh, 200 Axe, which I had. But like I said, I was a champion of the two one-handed ideas because of the Mono Oil. And I was right. I'm just going to say it flat out. I was I was freaking right. A new Bellore della Na. <sighs> Many of the creatures here on the Isle were at one point bound into non-aggression and complacency by our magical skills. I already mentioned this. When the Scourge destroyed the Sunwell, again, that's not quite true, our hold over these creatures shattered. Arcane slivers are the remnants of control we once had, and as such, might be usable in fashioning a new device to help us regain control. Better still, perhaps the slivers could be used to see what malaise the Isle is truly suffering under. Oh, splendid. These will do nicely. I've been doing quite a bit of thinking on the current malaise Sunstrider Isle suffers under. One possible course of action I had pondered was to get these arcane slivers from the beast on the isle. In doing so, they could be experimented on. 
A anyways, I will tend to this research. Allow me to place this incantation on you. I believe you'll make good use of it. Farewell. Ding. How many people used to not wear cloaks back in the day? Uh, better question. How many of you used to specifically go out and get that one cloak that was in, uh... Oh, what's the name of that zone? Uh, Duskwood. There's one close to cloak in Duskwood that was a full-length cloak, and it was like the first full-length cloak you could get. And just wear that, because it looked better. <laughs> no, Beanie Mac. Kaelthos is the one who actually destroyed the Sunwell. All the Scourge did was corrupted. State your business. Ah, Lakma, thank you for sharing your experience at the Shrine of Dathramar. First off, you should be commended for your sense of duty and respect. It will serve you not only here, but in all of Azeroth as well. As for the odd sensation, it's no doubt a contributing part of the taint that has befallen Sunstrider Isle. We'll see, we shall keep an eye on it. Thank you for alerting us to it. We will have justice. Alright, onwards. So, heirlooms, right? How many of you are those people? Those weird, terrible, horrible people? I'm kidding. Some people think heirlooms are a bad idea. I have no arguments to give in favor of that. I can't even think of any. Uh, if you guys can, feel free. <clears throat> in the meantime, more lore. Magistrix Elona told me you'd be coming along quickly enough, Logma. Lock, ma. The Falthrian Academy to our west, uh, that huge floating building with the ornate spires, is in bad shape. You're going to be leading the effort to recapture it from one of the wretched, a blood elf who has forever succumbed to the most basest of cravings. I hope you're ready to work. This is not going to be a lesson about danger, but it's also going to be what happens when you forsake the realities of what you are. Shorel Aran. Before sending you to the Academy, I want you to do another task that needs to be dealt with immediately. Once used to aid in the gardening of Sunstrider Isle, the bestial tenders have now grown out of our control. That's sounding like a common trend here. Clear them out with due haste, but be warned. Their lack of control has made them aggressive. It is such aggression that forces us to put down their once these once gentle servants. It doesn't please me to ask you to do this task, but survival is survival. I will mourn later. We will have justice. So now we have to go kill our other servants. This is our third group of servants, if you're paying attention, that we have lost control over and we're now murdering. And no, Takoida. Uh... Yeah, this way. I'm right. Um... <laughs> okay, there you go. I, I suppose that is probably the only reason I could think of for heirlooms being a bad thing. Uh, and that would be PvP. See you around, Terra. For those curious, the main reason there's two big reasons why I'm in favor of heirlooms. Reason number one, because it's an alt you've already leveled, why not speed it up? Now, there are other methods to speed up alt leveling, so I'm not saying heirlooms are the best method of doing so. Yeah, not by any measure. This needs to be four, actually. Um, what are heirlooms? Excellent question. Uh, these are heirlooms. So, heirlooms are items that have two features to them. Feature, I guess technically three features. The first and most important feature is it increases the amount of experience you gain. So that's pretty important. Uh, so it speeds up leveling, in other words. It makes it so that your alts can level faster. Now I stress the way I say that because you cannot get, like... It, basically it is impossible to really heirloom up your first character. It's not actually impossible, it's just functionally impractical. So heirlooms exist for alts. And for those of you who don't know what that means, that means alternates, as in uh, you've, you have a character, you push to high level, and then you want to level another character for whatever reason. You know, you want another try another class, you want to see another side of this thing, you know, whatever. There's plenty of reasons for alts, dozens of reasons for alts. Um, so uh, heirlooms boost the amount of experience you get, okay? First thing. Second thing, they are basically the best gear you're going to get. Uh, in, in other words, if you're not paying attention there... Uh, the, they level with you. So you, if you look at this, for example, though, that, that helmet I'm looking at is actually a level 4 helmet. Um, and that's because I am level 4. The heirloom level will always be my level. And each time it levels, the stats go up 
as if it was an item of that new level. And it's always going to be basically blue equivalent. Uh, for those who don't know what that means, there's basically legendary, purple, blue, green, white, gray in terms of quality. So blue equivalent, basically these are you're having a full suit of dungeon gear. Uh, and so you've got really good gear and you've got improved experience to speed up and smooth the leveling process. We will actually be using heirlooms extensively on six of our characters as we're going through this run. But uh, not not the other <sighs> eight, I want to say. Anyways, um, so yeah, th that's what heirlooms exist. Obviously, like I said, my big uh, argument in favor of heirlooms is it speeds up the alt process. Uh, th like I said, it's there are also other ways to speed up alt process. Other MMOs have tried similar methods, or different methods, I should say. Uh, I like the alt system, or I like the heirloom system. It's just, it's just a thing for me. Um... I have not talked about weapon skills yet, uh, so that would be this tab, actually. So back in the day, uh, instead of having this, which is weapon skills, right here, um, they had, uh, th there was actually individual skills, which I don't think I even have a tab for anymore to actually showcase what I'm talking about. Hang on, is it? Yeah, no, I literally can't even pull it up right now. Um... Yet yeah, no, um, the uh, the other uh, the purpose of weapon skills was basically you you could have an actual skill ranking in a weapon. Now you might be like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. So if I use an axe a lot, it'd be better than axe. Well, yes, but when I say better, I mean average. You can never be good at a weapon. You can only ever be acceptable at a weapon. If you maxed out a skill of a weapon, then that was basically the, the flat line. That was default. Um, so, uh, in order to... Oh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. I, I do have that. Uh, where is it? I have a lot of feats of strength, as you might imagine. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh, where is it? I must have gone right by it. Anyways, so, um, the general idea was that, uh, you would only be able to effectively use weapons you've used regularly, but it really didn't do anything. Where the heck is this achievement? Uh, oh, it's under Legacy, that's right, they, I forgot they stretched this out to Legacy and Feats of Strength. Mob, uh, yep, there it is, there it is. Raise your unarmed skill to 400. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yep. Back in 2009, I got that one. Anyways, so yeah. Um, that So like, for example, let's say you're a warrior and you've had a 200 axe for forever. And so your 200 axe skill is 400 or 300. I think it actually was in vanilla. Um, once you actually... Uh, let's say you got a really nice 200 sword. Great. Your job now is to go somewhere else. Oh, yeah, here's, by the way, four ways, four weapon skills to 400 as well. Let's say you then got a 200 sword, and it's at skill like 15. So you now have to go find something that is really weak because you're hitting them with a 200 sword, or get a really weak 200 sword. Some people had greys they would carry around for this purpose. I did this too. Um, and find an enemy and just wail on it for a ridiculously long time. And oh, don't forget, you always want to get your intelligence buffed because back in vanilla, your int skill actually improved how fast you would raise your weapon skill. The point is, it had no purpose. The actual system really didn't do anything. All it did was give you an extra barrier to being able to use a weapon. That was all it did. And it was a completely unnecessary and full-on padding, and they acknowledged that, and they got rid of that, and I am glad for it. Uh, another one of those smoothing out things. Why is... Why do I not have that? I, I should have that. Oh, no, I shouldn't. Right, different account. Um... Yeah, I have a few things uh, in my legacy here that you can't get anymore. Anyways, um, <clears throat> man, my throat hurts. <laughs> mm. ah. Oh god! One of the things uh, that was pretty common back in vanilla was rogues need int. I don't remember the exact reason anymore. But there was, a, like, an actual reason for rogues needing int back in vanilla. 
and uh, a rogue friend of mine, you know, again, back in vanilla, used to constantly be like, all right, rogues, rogues need int. <laughs> we don't have our int buff on rogues. Come on. Oh, God. Remember when they first added AoE buffs in uh, the Encourage patch? And you had to go and get them from a raid. You know, you get them to drop, and then, aha, and then they require reagents. Why would... Don't be silly on me. What I'm doing right now is gathering a few items. Uh, this will also lead me to another thing that I have actually been waiting to talk about until right now. So you remember earlier we were talking about burning crystals. Um, burning crystals are those things. Now, there's actually a few things that a burning crystal specifically and literally can be. Uh, here, let me give you a little better of a shot. There we go. So yeah, um, the term is not facetious. They are literally a burning crystal. Um, so these things are basically extremely concentrated fonts of magical energy that are used as kind of like a battery, or uh, more like a generator, I think. You know, a power base for a large number of other things that can function in the area. Again, the mono worms used to be used in conjunction with this and alongside this. And all I gotta say, Omni, is... <laughs> Um, yeah, there's actually quite a few burning crystals that they use. There's one massive burning crystal they use here. Uh, I'll show off other examples of them in the future. The other fun thing about burning crystals, though, is you might wonder, what's up with the eyes? Well, some burning crystals actually have a demon inside them. So that's a thing. Hmm. <clears throat> now remember, we're going to be using magic properly and under controlled circumstances. Um. <laughs> Another little uh, fun factoid about WoW Vanilla, just gameplay-wise here. Who here played a paladin while raiding in Vanilla? Yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. Our enemies will fall. Have you had a chance to find my belongings? Once we reassert our dominance over the Sunstrider Isle, I will need them in my work. For now, though, I must maintain my watch over the Sunwell. Or what remains of it. Oh, well done. I knew you'd be perfect for the task. Uh, once it's safe to make use of the outdoor facilities on the aisle, I'll be putting these things to good use. And like I mentioned, please feel free to keep the satchel. Also, take this piece of armor. Uh, consider it ample compensation for such a simple task performed... Keep your wits about you. ...dutifully. So, yeah, I was a paladin in WoW Vanilla. Why do you, you might be like, what's the relevance of that? Well, there's this thing called a buff. Now, I don't think I need to describe what a buff is. What I do need to describe is, imagine a buff that lasts five minutes and only targets a single person, and you're in a raid with 40 people. It is not an exaggeration to say that I spent most of my raiding career in Molten Core, at least early on, just buffing. Just... And just going down the list. And you need to know which buff to do to which people, too, because there's more than one buff. And you just go down the list, buffing all 40 players, including yourself, because you needed that wisdom buff to keep buffing. And then once you finished it, back up to the first guy. If you're doing really efficiently and you've got a nice haste rating, which was not actually called haste back in the day, uh, you could get through and have about 30 seconds or so in order to pause in between. God, I hated that. The other the other big duty I had as a uh, vanilla paladin raider was combat resing. Anyone remember when you... Uh, okay, so nowadays, if you get into aggro with a boss in a raid, he does this pulse to every character in the entire instance. So all of them are now in combat with that boss. And that has some various effects, but the reason they did that was back in the day, it's instead it was actually, uh, it was just a, a small radius around it, you know, a certain number of people were uh, pulled into aggro with a boss when the boss, uh, when the boss uh, was pulled. So all you have to do is be sufficiently far back out of combat, so you're not in combat while they're fighting the boss up there, and you can res because you, you're, you can res out of combat, so just the human, Nicolas. Okay, res that guy. Res that guy. Out of combat resing was actually a huge part of our strategy uh, in pushing down Ragnaros that first time. 
you know, for that for that side first I mentioned earlier. Anyways. Glory to the Sindori. All the deaths of the tenders give me no joy whatsoever. It does show me that you're ready for the most important task you'll do here on Sunstrider Isle. Take this and put it to good use. You'll need good items and sharp wits for the task ahead. Our reassertion of control over the island depends on it. A betrayer of our people resides atop Falthrian Academy to the southwest. Felindrin is his name. And he was banished from the Blood Elf lands for falling to failing to heed the warnings of our teachers and elders. He is the worst of our society, and he lives only to feed his insatiable magical addictions. He refused to learn control. He is a shell of his former self, one of the wretched, and he is a threat to the Sunspire. Destroy him and the wraiths he uses as distance. minions. Okay, I can do that. Also, bye, Kamek. You don't have to leave, but bye anyways. Ah... <sighs> Yeah, I remember that add-on, Callisto. I also remember the uh, uh, Paladin Helper or whatever it was called. Does anyone remember when they uh, made it so that Decursive wouldn't work? Because <laughs> I remember that. And then they fixed it so Decursive would work again. Because Noxramus was out at that point in time. And there were some pretty big complaints about that. So, Pally Power, that was it. So again, we are seeing the big theme. See you around, Celestial. Of the uh, of the Blood Elf starter zone so far is all about control. It's all about trying to maintain control over yourself and control over your s surroundings. Now you might ask, why is death the penalty for magical addiction? Well, um, when you give in to being magically addicted, it's not like giving in to being addicted to. You know, you know, drugs or whatever. It's a little bit more severe. And it has some more long-reaching consequences. Ah, damn it, Twitch. I hope there's no big events going on right now. As another aside, by the way, this is very indicative of Blood Elf, excuse me, High Elf th uh, thought process. We could build completely ordinary, normal buildings. We're not going to because we have magic, and magic is a tool like any other tool, and we should therefore use it as long as we are carefully controlled about doing so. So, I don't know if you can tell, but this place is literally only being kept up by quite literally magic. Now, the good news is I can give you a little bit of a shot of what this guy looks like. So when you become wretched, this is what you look like. Um, you see those chunks of blue? I should aggro him before the other guy. So you see those chunks of blue? Um, those are monocrystals that have been embedded into his skin. In other words, they, are, they have reached the point where they are so desperate and so requiring, needing of magic in their lives that they are literally taking physical chunks that exude magic, you know, magical crystals, and sh jabbing them into their flesh in order to try and get their addiction fix. Possible, Takoda. Unlikely, though. They did this when they first came here. No, he's not a red name. One thing I like that they did is most of the enemies in the starter zones are yellow names. If you don't know what that means, there's only uh, three types of names. Red, yellow, and green. Green means they're an ally. You cannot attack them, and they cannot attack you. Uh, yellow means uh, neutral, basically. You can attack them, but you can walk right up to them, and they'd just be like, eh, whatever. Red means aggro. In other words, you get within a certain range of them and they will attack you. Uh, so yeah, I like the fact that in the starter zones, for people who are just starting this game, that's the intention of these areas after all, uh, people who have never played the game before, pretty much all the mobs are yellow. In fact, I think actually at this point, all of the mobs are yellow in starter zones to get you used to the ideas and concepts of the game. So if you wander up to an enemy, it doesn't just start attacking you without you having an idea of what you're doing first.
Victory lies ahead. Heed well this warning. Philendrin the Banished is only a symptom of a much larger problem. His demise will solve our immediate concerns, but all Blood Elves share the same potential fate as him if we let our addictions get the better of us. Ah, Philendrin's head. You're to be commended, Lachma. You have succeeded where others, like Philendrin, have utterly failed. Perhaps you are truly ready to be a contributing member of Blood Elf society. Your success here means you are capable of surviving the greater threats that lurk in Eversong, and believe me, there are plenty to face. Stay the course. Uh, before we continue, really quick here, let's equip that and do this. Um, so one of the other things here, in, and this is just a tiny cultural point. Someone asked earlier about children. Now, obviously, we are not a child here, but we are uh, intended to be a young or relatively new uh, blood elf. You know, probably in their thirties or forties at the most. I mention that because, um, well. You have to literally earn the right to exist in Blood Elf society at this point in time because of how rare resources are, because of how little forces they have, and because of the fact that they're kind of desperate to survive and exist as a people, at least as of this point in time. Again, over the next several, several years, uh, they will start to recover from that. But right now, you have to prove that you can contribute to the, to the whole. Otherwise, you're not going to be a part of the whole. They never say flat out what they do to the Blood Elves who do not successfully contribute. But it's pretty well implied that you get drained of all your magic and then, well, you're dead. Anyways, <clears throat> so yeah, we're gonna... We found a sliver of tainted arcane power. Is there a way to nullify magic? Uh, temporarily and over small areas, yes. Uh, but in general, the answer is no. But yes, this is effectively a, again, this is, in more ways than one, the Blood Elves, again, at this point in time, are effectively in a post-apocalypse, just a very contained post-apocalypse. They are literally teetering on the brink of extinction all the way up till the end of BC. And that's the first moment at which they finally reignite the Sunwell, spoiler alert, and are no longer facing the constant threat of being wiped out as a people. So, yeah. Yes. Mm, for your demeanor, you seem to be on a matter of some urgency. Is there something I can help you with? Well, that is most interesting. And when I say interesting, I mean more disturbing than anything else. Our efforts to reassert control over the Isle in the time following the destruction of the Sunwell have been quite a challenge. I suspect that whatever foul source is corrupting the Isle may be at the heart of it, and this sliver may be of some aid in uncovering what's really going on. You were wise to bring this to me, Lakma. Take this as compensation for your due diligence. Hold your head high. Which I will then take. And we need to hit a vendor, actually, really quick. Your gold is welcome here. Really? Well, have my gold. And yeah, Hylisk is correct. Uh, this mentality of having to Some prove your worth and prove your existence uh, is a common thing, even into the modern era. Of course, because the Blood Elves have only, as of Pandaria, gotten to the point where they are no longer at a survivalist situation. And are now trying to thrive in the new uh, in the new era. Also, we now have a hat. Check it out. What do you think? Do you like our hat there? No. Okay. Um, onwards then. We are officially done with the, the tutorial zone here. We are going to keep going a little bit because again, we're actually doing all of the stuff uh, pre BC before we actually move on to BC, so we're actually going to be doing this zone and the Ghostlands, and then Azure Mist and Blood Mist. Four zones total. Uh, yes, Starch Monster, to both. Shola. Oh, well, hello there, Hunter. I heard a resourceful young Blood Elf formerly in service of Magistrix Arona might be making their way down here to help us Outrunners out. We could certainly welcome the help, especially from someone who's proven to be competent. I hope you're interested in running an errand or two for us. Shorel Oran. <laughs> it's hard work being an outrunner between Sunstrider Isle and Falconwing Square. Tight deadlines, long hours, and worst of all, the wretched. The road south of here goes through the ruins of Silvermoon. The place is crawling with wretched, ready to kill you for a few mana crystals. Unfortunately, I think that's what happened to the last outrunner we sent. I see you're eager to prove yourself, so venture into the Dawning Lane and see if you can find any traces of our Outrunner. 
The reckoning is at hand. Yeah, you really get the... I, I mean, I know this is a typical Elven thing, but you really get the this is the heights of who these people used to be thing uh, in a lot of the architecture around here. So, um... Mm. <laughs> Every race has two types of quest that are contained to each race. It's always race specific, not zone specific. It's actually race tied. So for example, a dwarf and a, and a gnome who have the same starter zone actually have different quests for this. Uh, one of those quests is to uh, go to the inn and one of those quests is to get some food. Or no, get, get a bag, excuse me. It's get a bag and get the food at the inn. Those two quests are common throughout every race, right? Most of those are like, hey, could you deliver a letter for me? And then that takes you to the inn. Some of those quests are like, hey, we want you to de detail this military communication, which takes you to the inn. This quest beautifully summarizes the situation the Blood Elves find themselves in. Their go to the inn quest is to go and find the previous person who was sent to the inn, who is dead. It's that person right in front of me. Take the the in the take the 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 gear, gear that they were going to travel to the inn, and take it in their stead. And that is the blood elf. Go to the inn quest, and something's set wrong. Hmm. And yet it's not on oh right I promised I'd do that uh, we'll do that on other characters we won't do it on this one so yeah I really like uh, Kel Kelderai architecture like quite a bit oh you're right actually I am <laughs> sorry sorry I was completely thinking in a different direction right there my bad <laughs> good thing I have them out right no, that's what they're going to be doing, Takoida. I will not sully myself by doing such menial work. Oh, by the way, the other thing that's mentioned, uh, I mentioned those band-aids that Blood Elves have in order to maintain some semblance of uh, magical con connection, is those monocrystals. Now, unlike the Wretched, who, again, I want to stress, literally jam them into themselves, we just keep them on us and occasionally drain them with our abilities. Because we're not insane yet. And you might be like, oh, jamming into your skin doesn't sound that bad. I want you to, okay, I don't actually want you to do this. But I want you to consider what it would be like to go grab a knife and just do this. And jab it into your skin and then leave it there forever. And tell me again about how normal and ordinary it is for them to jam these crystals into their skin. And yes, I stream Glory fairly often. To the uh, Jude here. Thank you, by the way. <clears throat> oh, by the Sunwell. That's the third Outrunner we've lost this month. Oh, I appreciate your courage in venturing into Downing Street. The guards need to keep a closer eye on those blasted wretched. We will have justice. The death of another Outrunner is a true tragedy, but it's a risk we all accept when we take the job. Magistrate Zalona at the Sunspire needs to get this package to the inn at Falcon Wing Square, and she needs it there as soon as possible. We're short-handed, and I don't have anyone else available that can cover us. I'm not going to lie to you, the path can be extremely dangerous if you leave the safety of the Dawning Lane. Death to all who oppose Once us. again, we get a little bit of tutorialization in the way the quests are presented. So if you're new to this game, you know, playing this for the very first time, um, the, uh, the game pretty much flat out tells you, stay on the road. And if you'll notice, I actually made it all the way to the inn without a single encounter. That's because it's specifically designed so there's no encounters on the road. This is true for every starter zone, from uh, all the way up to Razor Hill for the orcs, uh, heading to Goldshire for the humans, etc. As long as you stay on the road, there's specifically no spawns and no roams for that area. However, if you roam, eh, not too much, but a little bit in any given direction, you'll actually start seeing enemies. And as you can notice, I don't know if you can tell, but that guy over there, he is a red name. From this point on, that's what we're going to see. 99.9% .9 of everything will be red names. Well, Adamemnon, because death to all who oppose us. Oh, speaking of which, someone asked if I could turn up the sound. Uh, the answer is no, because as you can see, dialogue is already cranked. By the way, by the way, 
I just like to say I am absolutely grateful that uh, they finally did this after years and years and years and years and years and years of complaining about this. Um, it used to be there was no dialogue thing. There was no separate channel for voice acting. There was just sound. So in order to actually keep... Um, in order to actually listen to the sound of the voice acting in Dungeons and Raids, and by the way, Dungeons and Raids are a significant lore element to this story, so you want to hear what they're saying, at least if you care about the story. Um, so, in order to actually listen to that, you had to have the sound on and turned up, which meant crash was constantly going on. It gets really loud. Uh, and so, in several cases, it was basically impossible to hear what the hell uh, they were saying. So now they have it separated, so now I can turn the sound, so the combat sound is super quiet, but then I have the dialogue cranked up so I can hear, uh, I can actually hear what the heck everyone's saying. But I can't actually turn the sound up anymore. All I could do is lower everything else and then turn the overall up. Uh, so you'll have to, you guys will have to let me know if you want me to do that to try and get the voice acting even higher. Uh, I, I can do that, like I said, I'm just going to have to do some tweaking across the board. Uh, whoops, let's do this first real quick. Uh, and yet what Krenzler said is also true. The Blood Elves quite literally owe their existence and survival to Sylvanas and to the Forsaken in general. Uh, there's a lot of politics about that. I think I'm going to save that for until we finish Ghostlands because I think that's where it's most relevant. What do you see? Cleaning the delivery. Welcome to my inn. Am I understand you have something for me? Ah, thank you. I appreciate the prompt delivery. While you're here, please make yourself comfortable. If you haven't done so already, feel free to hearthstone and bind yourself here. Here's how you do here's a tutorial. Oh, I have to yeah, okay, sure. Hold your head high. I'll go ahead and bind here really quick. Farewell. This actually should be in the lower right. Oh no, Rascor, we are that's two zones away from where we are now. So <clears throat> Anubalore Delana. A group of wretched recently raided a supply of unstable mana crystals from one of our arcane sanctums. If not handled properly, the crystals could explode with enough force to blow a hole in the city walls. Now, Lachma, I don't care if they blow themselves up while tapping unstable arcane sources, but the whole incident would make my men look bad. Please bring me back any remaining crystals you find. They might still be in their original crates. The reckoning is at hand. I have all of it? Psychotic? Why do you ask? The city of Silvermoon hereby issues a reward for the head of Thales the Hungerer, notorious wretched ringleader. Uh, he is wanted for repeated crimes against the general populace of Silvermoon City, including the murder of two city guards. Oh, well, okay. I guess we can go ahead and do that. Uh, at the moment, Darch Monster... It's actually kind of complicated. Basically, everything from uh, that you're seeing around here is from before. Y trust me when I say it'll be a little more obvious in a minute. Just we will bear with me, okay? The arcane patrollers crafted by our forefathers to protect the city have fallen into a dangerous state of disrepair. They fail to recognize us as their masters and attack us on sight. Even though they were created many years ago, the arcane cores that power them are still quite useful and valuable. I want you to go gather these cores and bring them to me so I can put them to good use again. You'll find the patrollers northwest of here. Keep your wits about you. Okay. So now we have to go hunt these down. I want to point out another interesting little lore tidbit. First of all, once again, we see that theme of uh, something we built falling out of our control. Because, you know, duh, right? But in this case, it's kind of funny, the reason why. It's literally just the fact that they have fallen into disrepair. Now, why have they fallen into disrepair? Because of the fact that most of these people have been so busy with such basic mundane tasks as survival, they have been able, unable to keep up the extensive maintenance required of their extensive empire. Now, if you don't understand what I mean by that, again, before the Scourge invaded, this, the Blood Elves, excuse me, the High Elves had a idyllic, near-paradise lifestyle, okay? Like, almost perfectly set up situation. So they had tons of luxuries, tons of, of convenience, tons of everything. So these things are literally just basic uh, laborers and, and the kind of things that you would use... 
I, I, it's hard to come up with a good example of this. You know, you know how in uh, Dragon Age Origins, there's uh, Shale mentions how at one point in time her uh, master actually ordered her to carry him around every now and again. Yes, Omni. Um, that's the level of decadence that these people had prior to the Scourge invasion. Once the Scourge invaded, survival became the name of the game. Now, credit where credit is due. The newly formed Blood Elves did survive. They made the switch, but they were no longer, they no longer, as Omni just pointed out, had the infrastructure. They no longer were taking care of all the mundane day-to-day -day things that had prior to then been, you know, normal for them. So all of their uh, struct, all of their construction, constructs, all of their fancy magical devices are malfunctioning and having issues, like the burning crystals I mentioned earlier, which I want to stress again, contain a freaking demon inside of them. And if you'll notice, there's this undercurrent plot thread that was going through the entirety of the uh, of the actual starter zone of up here on Sunstrider Isle about there being some kind of corruptive influence that's affecting the entire island. Yeah, no kidding, Hadril. There's a very there's a very strong parallel there, I think. Golem, stop crushing me. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, this is another way to help emphasize that point story-wise. These golems are nothing. They're everyday normal things, and yet, because of the fact that they, they just didn't have time to take care of them and upkeep them for so long, they have now turned hostile to everything. And unfortunately, I have now run out of things to talk about. Lore run's over, guys! No, I kid. I, I have set up most of this law run in a way so that I will have very little uh, periods of time where I have nothing to talk about. Uh, that's the idea. That's the ideal, I should say. So, uh, hopefully, um, I will succeed at that in the future. Uh, part of the problem right now, in fact, I should say all of the problem, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I actually have competition right now. Uh, there are other players wandering around also killing the stuff I want, so they're the ones actually uh, preventing me from having already been done with this quest. It's their fault, not mine! Um, actually, fun little thing, I do have one thing to talk about. So they have a mechanic in this game. Nice, Hylas. Grats, Hylas, by the way. Uh, they have a mechanic in this game. Oh, there's a couple up there. Now, this mechanic is awesome and terrible at the same time. So every enemy in the game has a respawn rate. Now, this basically determines how long a period of time passes before a given no node respawns. Now, when I say a node, the way WoW does respawns, uh, with few exceptions... Okay, basically nothing... There's no individual enemy that has its own respawn thing, per se. Rather, there's a respawn point. Now, a respawn point may have only a single enemy attached to it. In the case of, like, a boss or a named or something like that. But any given respawn point is just the, is, is the actual point that has enemies attached to it individually, manually. You with me so far? Just a little insight on how they programmed this. Um, so... Whenever, so to determine when a uh, when a thing respawns, there's a timer. Now there's a default value for that timer. That value actually changes because it's set manually per entry per node. But the average is anywhere from two to ten minutes. Uh, the general average, of course, being about five minutes. So they have a new mechanic in game where, depending on how many enemy, or excuse me, players, enemies, wow, depending on how many players are in a given zone, that can be changed. Now it will never go de uh, up. It will never respawn slower. So if one person is in the, in the entire zone, everything will respawn at the base level of respawn rate, like I already mentioned. Um, if two people are in the zone, then it'll be decreased by like a second. And if three people are in, then like two seconds, and so forth and so on. The absolute minimum respawn time is exactly one second. And I'm not kidding about that. If a zone is completely crammed with players, stuff will respawn like that. Literally one second, it'll fall over, and a new one will spawn on its own corpse. In some cases, because of the length of the, anima the death animation, you'll see something falling over about halfway down, and then a new one will pop up in its place. But that, but in that case, I do want to stress that I do think that's a good thing. That's that's great design. It means that the more competition there is, the more supply there is. It's a unique way of dealing with supply and demand when it comes to uh, quests and quest drops and whatnot. And yeah, I think WoW is a good game. Uh, there's a free trial you can try out, so it's a good way to see if you like it. Ah. <sighs> 
Okay. Anaria Shola. Excellent work. Besides the constant threat the wretched represent, I also have to deal with all kinds of fictitious reports of night elf sightings. <laughs> Though most reports are unfounded, one recent incident demands further investigation. The West Sanctum, uh, one of our primary energy sources, has suffered a terrible malfunction and rumors of Darnassian sabotage are rampant. Travel there and deal with anyone that looks suspicious. And report to Laykeeper Velania. She'll be the one watching over the Sanctum. Remember the sun well. Quick note, I forgot to mention. I did actually have one other thing to talk about. So, unstable mana crystals. You might be like, what are those? Mana crystals are a crafted item. Uh, I don't mean in game, I mean in lore. So they basically concentrate magic into either an existing gem or literally just make magic into a physical thing. Fairly similar to Materia from Final Fantasy VII. Um, if you, when you do that, you have to do it very carefully and very precisely. If you do it imprecisely, well, it can just blow up in your face, quite literally, or it can make an unstable crystal which can also blow up if it's uh, improperly dealt with. So, uh, I mention this because this is just a tiny little extra additive of why the wretched are insane. And I stress the way I say that. They are legitimately out of their mind. These people are so desperate for water, I mean magic, that they are willing to take things that they know are unstable monocrystals, things that can explode, literally explode and kill them if, if misused in just a little bit, and still use those and, again, jam them into themselves. That is how incredibly desperate they are. <laughs> Victory lies ahead. You have something? Yes. And they hold out the head. Ah, and we kill the them. The reckoning is at hand. Anaria Shola. Now we'll go ahead and take that. I am pleased to discover you're at least somewhat competent. I'll give you another task since you seem so eager to prove yourself. Uh, this is a letter to Laykeeper Kaldanas, the arcanist in charge of the upkeep of the Northern Sanctum. Go to the southwest and here's a da-da-da. He is a very important person, so I hope you won't bother him too much with trivial chatter. See you around, Salty. Hope you like the movie. So, I'm going to derail really quick. There's a quest over here, but there's something way more important than this quest to show off. We're going to zoom the camera all the way out for this one to show off what this is. So, okay. You see this? You see this? This beautiful, lush, autumn thing. I've talked about this. They terraformed it, right? All of this is terraformed by them and by their magic millennia ago to look like this eternal autumn. Well, um, so this is the scar... The dead scar, specifically. You can literally see the path and the bones. Those are bones, if you can't tell, down here. Uh, and the woods on either side. This is literally where the Scourge trod. This is the path they took when they invaded Quelth the Loss. If you knew nothing about this setting, had never played Warcraft 3, I feel like this would just perfectly get across what the Scourge really are. They were just this unstoppable force that marched straight in a line, straight up to and through the front gates. As you can see, the front gates are complete. Oh, whoop, out of the way, out of the way. Ah, crap. I accurate him. Um, completely broken open. The dark times will pass. Grab that quest really quick. There we go. And yeah. And so that's the entrance to the city, or rather the old entrance to the city. You actually can't go in there. If you were to follow this, you would follow it all the way to the Sunwell, which we'll be showing off much, much later. Yeah, that's uh, fun. And, and again, as you can see, the land itself is dead. Completely and utterly uh, unrecovered from the incident. And we'll be going back and forth across the Dead Scar quite a bit. You can literally see the Dead Scar on the map, too. The quest we just got... <clears throat> This black swath of soil that cuts through Eversong is a permanent reminder of the day Arthas led the Scourge into our beloved city. This blemish is more than just an eyesore, as even today it brings Scourge from the Ghostlands to De Silvermoon. So, yeah, there's actually still dead left over here. That's another way to help emphasize the Scourge. There were so many of them. There were so many dead 
so many uh, corpses that they were leading uh, in this in this march that there are still corpses left here four years later who are still attacking and fighting in this area, bereft of command and leadership. Think about that for a moment. Now, there is actually another reason for that, by the way, but I'll get into that much later. Yes, this is effectively a, a miniaturized plague lands. Now, it is within the realm of possibility that this land would eventually be reclaimable. We don't 100% know. The Undead Scourge, the actual, excuse me, the Undead Plague, THE Undead Plague, is incredibly influential and, and uh, pervasive. It is ridiculously difficult to resist or even uh, prevent the actual Undead pl Plague of Undeath itself. Um, so it's, it's pretty bad. Um, so it is possible that they will eventually be able to reclaim this land, but it is also possible they will never succeed at it that it will always be that this dead scar and they're just gonna have to live with it for the remainder of their days our enemies will fall uh right that one the reckoning is at hand i mentioned the other possibility in addition to these being leftover stragglers or i should say in addition to these being leftover stragglers so some people think that the scourge are eventually defeatable those people tend to forget that the scourge can get up infinitely as long as there are certain circumstances that exist and those circumstances do have to exist but if they exist any given undead who is being you know is being willed to get back will always get back up forever. I mention this because that is going to be something I'll be bringing up in Wrath that is very, very, very important when we get to Wrath of the Lich King storyline. It is mandatory for you to understand as we're going through Wrath that we are not defeating the Scourge. The Scourge are testing us. Anyways. Oh, these sanctums of yours are quite interesting, Mr. Kaldanus. I appreciate the information you've given me today. So that's a dwarf. That's a dwarf from the Alliance. Now, you might be like, what? You're playing a horde, Arsh. Well, actually, no, I'm not. Not in lore. Not yet. Right now, as of this moment in time, the, the Blood Elves are not actually a part of the horde. We are not actually a part of anything. We're the Blood Elves. <sighs> okay. I want to stress... That I love Italy and I love Italians, okay? There's no, like, stupid racism or prejudice or anything like this in this, okay? But at this point in time, the Blood Elves are like Italy in World War I, okay? With the big, massive powers of Germany and France and Britain and America and even the, the collapsing tiger of the East and the Ottoman Turks and what's going on with Russia, Italy was a little guy. Just... These guys. This was what Italy was as far as the actual fighting of World War I. That's who the Blood Elves are. Now, I mention that because they have not joined the uh, e either side yet. They have not joined the Horde or the Alliance. Obviously, spoiler alert, they will join the Horde. It'll actually take a bit for them to join the Horde. But they are so insignificant at this point in time that the reason they haven't joined the Horde already is because the Horde's response has been, what do you bring to the table? I'm serious, by the way. The Horde has... Act now, at this point in time, I want to remind you, Thrall is still Warchief, lore-wise, at this point in time. Yes, they were a Krenzler. Oh, God, they were. They'll be dumb again in Pandaria. In the same way, too. Just worse. Anyways, so the Horde uh, said... Now, you might, now might, that might sound callous, but remember, at this point in time, the Horde was not exactly at a point of strength. The Horde was still in their own sort of just barely making it and just barely surviving kind of a situation. They were still struggling. So the Blood Elves joining the Horde was like adding another mouth to feed without another pair of working hands. Now the Blood Elves found that horrible and terrible and they're like, oh god, what are we going to do? And so they were reaching out to the Alliance as well, like, oh god, please join us, Alliance. You know, please let us join you, Alliance. We, we really need the Allies. We really need the help. And yes, at this exact moment in history, there is a Cold War between the Horde and the Alliance. I just want you all to keep all of that in mind. It'll come up uh, more. We're, we're going to cut off right there. 
Um, Glory to the Sindori. So we give him the letter. Shoreloran. Since you're here, I have a favor to ask you. Lakekeeper Velania's apprentice stopped by earlier to ask for his assistance. Apparently, there's some malfunction happening at the West Sanctum. I've been entertaining our most pleasant dwarven guest. See if you can give her a hand. The reckoning is at hand. The Horde wasn't letting them join, Leander. That's not quite true, Kranzler. I'll, I'll get there, I'll get there. But yeah, exactly, Tekoita, this is just an ugly reality. And again, as was pointed out, Tekoita points out an interesting factoid. So at this point in history, the Horde is like right around here, over on Kalimdor, and a little bit right around here. That's it. They have very little territory, very few resources, and they have not actually started expanding or getting all imperial yet, okay? That doesn't happen until uh, Cataclysm. So, at this point in time, with the prim primary horde power over here, and basically a province over here, they had very little capacity to do anything for the Blood Elves, even if they let them join them. Even if they said, sure, go ahead and join us, there wasn't much that either of them could do for either of, of, of each other. It was a very unfortunate situation. I, I keep restressing all this, by the way. I want you to understand the plight of the Blood Elves. The Blood Elves at this point in history were facing very real threat of extinction. That's how bad things were at this point in time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, I'll, I'll talk Glory about Sylvanas Sindori. and her reasonings once we get there. We're not there yet. Oh, look around you. Things aren't exactly in order. We have had a severe malfunction at the West Sanctum. Let's do our best to prevent matters from getting worse. Time is of the essence. It's about time that dimwit Caldanus sent someone this way. I warned of the dangers of increasing the load on the Western Sanctum. Now one of our energy converters is destroyed and arcane wraiths are pouring out of the Sanctum. I'm going to need you to take care of these creatures before we send anyone to make repairs. Remember the sun well. Yeah, I'm thinking about when the best point to talk about that is, Rascor. I have an idea of when I'm going to talk about that. So, this is a sanctum. A really brief lore tidbit. So, these sanctums are... Uh, these are uh, drills. Oil, oil drills, basically. Except they don't drill oil, they drill mana. They are literally extracting mana from the ley lines. They use this in order to try and, and power their buildings, provide in resources for mana crystals, etc. Um, even though the Sunwell has been detonated, so their connection to, the, to magic has been severed, they still have this, this kind of technology. So they can still power their city. They can still keep all their buildings functioning. They can still keep their technology going. And they're just having trouble getting it into themselves because of the nature of how that works. So, again, remember everything I just told you about the Alliance and the Horde and how the Blood Elves reached out to the Alliance. I want to stress how I phrased that, okay? This is a Night Elf who is attacking me. Thank you, Salted Polk. I hope that's a reference to Lord of the Rings because I love that scene. <laughs> Uh, so we just got a piece of paper off of a night elf. These documents contain detailed maps of different strategic buildings in Eversong Woods. A diagram of an arcane sanctum is also sketched in good detail. There appears to be numerous notes in a language you don't recognize. As they were carried by a Darnassian spy, it might be a good idea to bring them to Captain of the Guard. Okay. Now, you're probably thinking, what the hell? Why are the Night Elves doing this? Well, this is actually funny. This is one of the reasons why I look at the Night Elves and I go, or excuse me, I look at the Alliance and I go, oh, at least at this point in history. As of the modern age, the Alliance has smoothed out considerably, so, you know, don't take me for just plain bad mouthing. But back during this era, the Alliance were idiots. And I'm just going to say that flat out. Trust me, you'll be seeing more of that too. So, some of the Alliance that were reached out to actually legitimately were okay with with a sort of a, a trade agreement, you know, non-aggression agreement thing with the Blood Elves. That was a thing they were okay with. And then there were the Night Elves. And the Night Elves, if you remember, are the ones who banished these people, uh, look up my exact notes, 6,824 years ago. 
because I bothered to write down all the dates. That's why I have those notes there. So the Night Elves, who after 6,800 years, have literally not let go of their, of their grudge. So they look at this situation and they think, oh, these people are dangerous, these people are horrible. How, yeah, exactly, how dare those dirty High Elves come crawling back to us. So they send their own people separate from the official Alliance delegate. And they send the, their people to sabotage and spy on the Blood Elves. Now, it is worth noting that this was basically all Taronda. Taronda, no, not Taronda Leela. That's a G, actually, Taronga. But no, Taronda uh, does not know how to diplomatize if her life counted on it, and it has several times. Taronda's an idiot. I'm sorry. She is. She's a good warrior, but she is very stupid when it comes to dealing with other people. Oh, there's one. So, uh, whoops, ah, someone else tagged it. We're having that competition problem again here. Oh my god, Taronda. So yeah, she uh, she's pretty much the one in control right now. Uh, remember, at this point in time, Malfurion's still in the dream. So Malfurion is not an influence on events and the Night Elf Society. So the only people in charge of the Night Elf people at this exact point in time are... Uh, Taronda, and someone whose name I can't remember. It's okay. I specifically left Wowpedia up just so I could look this up. <laughs> I'm serious. Fandral. Uh, I literally just have it over there to remind me of names. So Taronda and Fandral are the two people in charge of the Night Elf Society right now. I don't want to spoil too much, but let's just say that Taronda's an idiot and Fandral's evil. Moving on. <laughs> yes, that's the one, Meadfist. Fandral Staghelm. We'll be talking about him a lot later. The Eternal Sun guides us. Ah, thank you, Lachma. Now that we have the race under our control, we can send someone to assess the damage. Hopefully it wasn't anything permanent. Oh, yes, that would be terrible if it was, wouldn't it? Stay the course. Wait, Night Elves? Here? Those rats. Do you suppose they had anything to do with the malfunction in my sanctum? If you have any information, you better take it to Captain Sunbrand at once. Salama Ashalanore. Now, okay. <laughs> so, uh, the nightmare, Takoida. We'll talk about the nightmare later, uh, because the nightmare is a very, very important aspect of the lore of this setting. We'll be talking about it several times. But basically, Malfurion is combating the nightmare right now. Um... So again, this is a lay drill, okay? This is what is literally keeping the society functioning. While they use other resources, wood, gold, you know, minerals, that kind of a thing, their primary resource that this society functions on is magic. Now the Night Elves are like, magic's evil, because they're stupid. And so the Night Elves uh, decide to sabotage one of the primary resource production facilities upon which this entire society, which I stress is literally facing extinction, rests upon. To really help emphasize it, they only have three of these things left functioning at this point in history. Three lay drills left functioning at this point in time. Um, kind of, yes, Meadfist. I've actually deliberately not spoiled a lot of Legion for myself, so I'd rather you not uh, spoil things for me. Yeah, exactly, Deacon. This is literally a declaration of war, what the Night Elves just did. This would be the equivalent. I, 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 it's actually kind of hard to come up with a real-life equivalent. I mean, this is like Russia bombing the entire breadbasket of the Midwest here in the United States, or at least like a huge chunk of it. There is no misunderstanding that act. That is a declaration of war. A huge, volatile, terrible declaration of war. Yeah, Varian is not in charge. Varian, as of this point in time, is still uh, going by a different name. Anixia is in charge of the Alliance as of right now. Oh yeah, that would be, yeah there you go. Sabotaging a nuclear reactor. That's another example. Or... Uh, or, 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 I don't know, setting fire to an oil field in, in a way that it will burn for, for months. Which is just, yeah. This, there, like I said, there is absolutely no de denying. This is a declaration of war. Whew. 
Uh, we never actually know most of the uh, the rest of the Alliance's reactions, Nero's as. But the... Yes, of course, Roaring Middleman. Let me just start over. Let me delete this character. Um, most of the rest of the Alliance probably thought in the same direction for reasons I'll, I'll mention in a little bit. But basically, let's just... Bo it boils down to filthy blood elf scum. You're part of the problem, not part of the solution. In the interest of fairness, the, the High Elves are not exactly the best of people. They are snooty. They have been snooty. They have been very elitist. And they have been very helpful. They were critical in the Second War against the, against the Demonic Horde. They were crucial in establishing all human society. If it was not for the High Elf intervention and working with them, there would be no human mages, there would be no Dalaran, there would be no human great human kingdoms, because they never would have passed the, uh, the basic um, Mongolian era, basically, of, of the roving horde kind of a thing. The, the, the High Elves have done a lot of really awesome stuff in their history. And yet there is such a bias against the High Elves that I that the, 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 the few things we see from the rest of the Alliance are, oh, screw them. There's actually a line that we'll see some time from now from a, uh, another High Elf who literally calls the rest of the Blood Elves basically just bloodsuckers. And I don't, I don't just mean that literally, because obviously the magic sucking thing. I mean as in... Uh, uh, what, there's actually a term for that. Like a remora to a shark. You know, you're just a parasite feeding off of the whole kind of a thing. I forget what that's called. Parasi parasites, basically. I guess that actually is the literal term. And it's like... What? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, and people wonder why... They, so I will admit, like I said, the Alliance has evened out a lot. But at this point in history, the Alliance were the bad guys. Okay? I, I'm not even brooking argument on that. As of this point in history, back during Vanilla and BC and a little bit of Wrath, the Alliance were the bad guys. You think I'm kidding? Wait until I start talking about the Defias. <laughs> Anyways, moving on with the story. The Eternal Sun guides us. So, are you sure you found these on a Night Elf? They were clearly written in Dwarven... From what I understand of this letter, whoever wrote this did not cause the malfunction, but was sent to spy the results of it. They call our endeavors reckless and dangerous. But who? Ah, of course. The envoy from Ironforge. We were fools to trust anyone belonging to the Alliance. Listen, Lockmaw, this is a very delicate situation. Even though we've identified the spy, we cannot kill him out in the open. We cannot try to capture him either. The risk of him escaping is too great. We, I want you to go find Pr Prospector Anvil Ward at the North Sanctum and kill him. Do it quietly. We don't want word to spread that we allowed a spy into our city. And bring me his head as proof. Ironforge will learn Jirelle not to mess Ron. with the Cinderai. Yeah. Um. Can I miss him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, bit of a uh, bit of a situation. You're welcome, Case. No. Um, <laughs> I want to stress that once again, as of this point in time, the Blood Elves have already been rejected by the Horde. More than once, I feel like pointing out. Also, Sylvanas, as of this point, is actually still trying to uh, get... The, the the Blood Elves into the Horde. That is still a thing that she's actively doing. Uh, she is just failing. She has still failed at getting uh, the, hor the Horde to, conv to, to consider letting the Blood Elves in. Okay? So they've been rejected by their only other option, and the Alliance literally just declared war on them. Just The only thing they didn't do was, was do it in a nice and formal paper. So... <laughs> I love the way this quest is structured, because the idea here is... Oh my God, we're screwed, but we and and so we must have revenge. We must stop this, but we can't do it openly because we have no one backing us. There's no horde backing backing blood elves at this point in time. So if we kill an alliance individual openly and and blatantly, the alliance can turn around and come conquer us or crush us out of revenge if they felt like it. And yeah, we can't deal with that right now. So I love this. We we must we you know we must get revenge, but we have to be careful about it. So we're gonna talk to the the dwarf here. Hey, to meet you. I need a moment of your time, sir. 
Ah, you must be the last assigned to take me around ever so in the woods. Took your sweet time getting here, didn't you? Very well, off we go. Let's not waste one more minute. Uh, why, yes, of course. Um, I I've got something to show you right inside this building, Mr. Andalward. Watch your back. Very well. Let's see what you have to show me, Lokmo. Do, 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 do. Now, as you can see when we enter here, uh, we try to only use magic in essential matters. For example, making sure that all of our decanters are properly heated. It's very critical that our magic is used for that. Also, we don't like potted plants being on the ground. We consider that an abomination. Heresy, you might say. And so we want those to be magically implanted as well. And I need your head! Give me your head! There we go. Yoink. Um... <laughs> Off I go. Also, I'm being followed around by a lore runner. Uh, another lore runner. <laughs> yeah, war crimes will wait. Now, to make this clear, I don't think the dwarves were in on this. That is not Magni style at all. I don't think Magni would ever do that. Um, I think certain individual dwarves might do that. But I do not think he the the dwarven organization would be a part of this. State your business. So the deed is done. Excellent job. Word has been passed to the ranger general, and believe me, the dwarves will pay dearly for their treason. You've been great service to your people today. Nope. Oh, right, right. Keep your wits about you. I have another task for you. Ranger Degelaine was sent to Farbreeze Forest Village to find out more about a wretched attack at a nearby shipyard. He's requested reinforcements, which we cannot provide yet. Seek him out and grant him whatever aid you can. The Fairbreeze village can be reached by following a little la. Remember the sun well. <laughs> yeah, it is true. As of this point in time, the dwarves are the closest things we have to good guys. I should say the Ironforge dwarves to be a little more specific about that. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if that was MI6. That guy we just killed. Or the people who sent him, I should say. Uh, well, it's also worth noting it is possible the dwarf had nothing to do with anything. Possible. He never actually did or said anything incriminating. The only thing we found out was that the letter that the night elves were carrying was written in Dwarven. So... That could have been a false flag operation. Again, we don't actually know. Uh, as of right now, Stormwind, as of this moment in time, Stormwind is ruled by Onyxia, the Black Dragon. Glory to the Sindora. Thank you, you there. Oh God, you must help me, please. A fellow apprentice and I were attacked by the wretched. In their mad hunger for magic, they took everything they could get their hands on. Mana crystals, wands, spell books, everything. Melador gave chase after them. I, I had to stay behind and look what they didn't take. Continue down the road, see if you can time lend him a hand. Of the essence. So like I said, I don't know the full truth of that. We don't know. It has never been explained. But this whole situation just reeks of political intrigue, which is one of the reasons I like this section. Oh, crap! It's a lynx! Okay, we're good, we're good. Baladash, Malanore. Oh, they're gone now. Scared the britches out of them with a well-placed fireball. Unfortunately for me, they threw our precious cargo into the river. Those blasted wretches sure can run fast at the sight of someone who could stand up to them. Let's not worry about that now. I need my instructor's elemental grimoire. I'm certain I saw one of those cowards throw it into the river, but I cannot seem to be able to locate it. I could use another set of eyes. I'll throw a bit of coin if you spot it. Okay, I'll go get wet, because you're too prissy to jump into the river. Our enemies will fall. There you go. Oh, the book is completely soaked. Instructor Anthiel is not going to like this at all. Here, take this money. I have an idea. Anthiel is going to fly off his rocker when he finds out his book is ruined. I've got a little proposal for you. Don't worry. I'll make it worth your while. Take this book to him and, a and tell him nothing of the incident. If he asks, just tell him you dropped it into a puddle. He has no direct authority over you, so there's nothing he can do. Anthiel delivers his lectures at this pond, so you'll do this for us, right? I'll reward you handsomely. Remember the sun well. Okay, sure. We'll go do that really quick. We'll go do that. Hey, Fatsqueak. 
Do 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 do. Well, it's true. Anexia is the one in charge right now at their room. Lol, though. Ugh. Freaking scar. Yeah, it, on paper, Bolvar Four Dragon is the one in charge right now. But he might as well not be. He is regent for Anduin at this point in time, because Anduin is too young to actually be king. And uh, Varian, the actual king, is just missing. The dark times will pass. What calls for this interruption to my lecture, Hunter? Uh, you say those two incompetent fools bribed you to lie to me. You've done very well in coming to me. I hope you learned a valuable lesson today, Lokmar. Never trust anyone else to lie for you. Now I want you to go back to my two dim-witted students and discipline using this wand. Uh, my magic tells me yada yada yada. Come back when you've done this. I'll give you a small reward for your troubles. We will have justice. Yeah, I know, right, Hylisk? Sigh. By the way, I'd just like to say, uh, I absolutely love the music in WoW in general. I always have. There's like four songs in all of WoW I don't care for. They did the, the various people, Glenn Stafford and other names I don't rec remember off the top of my head, have done always done a marvelous job uh, with WoW's music. Um, you mean Medivh? Medivh is a hugely long story that I'm not going to discuss. Probably until we do Karazin. I think that is probably the best time to talk about that. So, what exactly con constitutes disciplining a student in Blood Elf Justice? Well, unfortunately, you've already seen it, because other people are doing the quest as well. Turning them into pigs. I like how his response, by the way, is, Oh, not this again! Hi, Fire Roach. You can't do this to me. We had a deal. I've had actual several long discussions about who the most powerful mage is in the setting. The two people most commonly discussed when it comes to it are Cadgar and Jaina. Um, but other big names that tend to rise to the top of the heap are Queen Ashara, uh, Archimond, of course, um, Medivh, naturally, uh, Aegwyn is another big name that tends to be mentioned. And I think that's it. Those are usually the ones when it comes to the most powerful mages. Who is actually the most powerful is always going to depend on interpretation, opinion, etc. So, shrug, basically. Ronan, who's that? <clears throat> Our enemies will fall. Farewell. Uh, I want that under. Uh, why do I have Barlock on? So, I hate to say this, but count me in the group of people who does not like Ronan as a character. Hey, Jedi Mew. Kel'Thuzad was damned strong. I don't think he would count as one of the most powerful. Uh, one of the most in knowledgeable, I think, is actually a better word for what Kel'Thuzad was. He knew a lot. About a lot. Um, where the heck... It's been so long since I've set all these settings. Because uh, I don't have add-ons. I'm used to just doing this through add-ons. We'll, we'll be having no add-ons as we go through uh, most of our characters that we're leveling. Uh, and by most, I mean all of them. Where is it? Oh, here it is, here it is. Aha! There we go. We're good. This channel is about lore! Blood and thunder. Lore. And blood and thunder, as you can tell.
Give me just a second. I have just received a picture of Minizan. And that takes precedence over all things. That is so adorable. Um, okay. Fairbreeze Village. Now, okay, reality check for a moment. Um, Madon... I'll talk about Madon in a second. Um, reality check. So obviously this is a video game, so they can't actually represent the whole town here. Uh, most of the actual towns and cities are like four or five buildings, or in the case of the really big cities, they're like 30 or so buildings. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Um, but obviously it has to be shrunk for the sake of reality. Because it's a game. Actually having a game where we actually saw Fairbreeze Village would probably be about the size of this entire zone. Um, so, uh, yeah. It, it's kind of weird sometimes. You do have to kind of interpret a lot of the gameplay a lot of in order into lore terms. And I'll be talking about other instances of that as we go through. But this is supposed to be a decent-sized village, especially a decent-sized uh, travel hub and trade hub for the area. A lot of, a lot of transit and traffic goes through this area. Um, I would rather have both, personally, personally Richie. Uh, I have said it before, and I'll say it again, Warcraft 4 would actually work quite well uh, woven into and through WoW. And then they could keep WoW going, in addition to having Warcraft 4. Okay, so, now to turn in the quest. Uh, Anaria Shola. Okay. <clears throat> we will have justice. Sunsail Anchorage has been overrun by wretched scum. <laughs> Capital W there. As soon as we manage to get reinforcements to the area, we'll show those thugs who's boss. In the meantime, you can help by showing them a bit of discipline. Go in there and show them we are not to be trifled with. Keep your wits about you. Also, the lower run is apparently cooking right now. Whoops, whoops, whoops. <laughs> Might as well be a refugee camp at this a point. A new Belore Delinar. I swear I'm going to fireball someone if I get one more request from Lord Sotheril concerning supplies for his party. Do I look like a party planner? Between you and me, that fool and his psychophants are living in denial that we are under attack here. <sighs> Some of us are actually busy with, oh, I don't know, defending what's left of Kel'Thalas. Hunter, would you please go over to Sotheril's Haven and see if you can shut him up? Time is of the essence. Uh, and, and thank you for your help. While I get things back in order, I'd like you to do me a favor. One of my former apprentices embarked on a very dangerous line of research. She journeyed to the Eastern Sanctum, which is in the middle of the Dead Scar. I, I worry for her well-being. See if you can find her and convince her to return to her senses. Remember the sun well. What do you seek? Don't take the safety of this village for granted. We're under siege by the Scourge to the east and the Wretched to the west. Ranger Sarian keeps our borders safe from the undead. Follow the Scar and see if you can lend her a hand. Remember the sun well. The eternal sun guides us. <sighs> a foul taint in the soil pre precedes the expansion of the Scourge into a new area. The protective rune stones along the border into the Ghostlands have warded the land from this taint in the past. But the westernmost most rune storm was destroyed during a scourge attack, which forced us to burn the ground around it to prevent the taint from spreading. My sister watches over the grove. Go watch, find her, and hopefully she'll be Remember able to Remember the sun well. So, just to keep that into a little bit of perspective, the, the taint in the ground, that dead scar thing that we've seen, they were so desperate to prevent it from spreading to a new area, they burned an entire of their own village areas, which we'll get into why that's even worse in a moment. Um, in, uh, and we'll get into why that's terrible. Just, just again, once again, referencing just how desperate and how terrible uh, their situation here and really is. De la the spring paw that inhabit this region are known for their high-quality pelts. We've even seen the Night Elf scum coming to this land per uh, periodically in order to poach them. Our skirmishes with the Amani have put a bit of a strain on our supply of gear, and our rangers don't have much time to hunt for pelts anymore. If you'd be willing to lend a hand in conducting pelts, I'd be happy to reward you. You'll find the pelts around the woods north of here. The reckoning is at hand. Whoops. I was already mounted. So we're going to go this way first.
So, this guy's an idiot. <sighs> like, he's just an absolute moron. So, you remember how, like, every single thing I've talked about about the Blood Elves for the entirety of the Sunstrider Isle, and every quest we did through the Ruins and through the Western Sanctum, everything I've talked about, all of it, has been about how terrible and horrible the situation is for the Blood Elves, right? So they're having a party here. Literally, they're they're having a party. There's booze, there's food, fireworks. And, and donations apparently. Wow, that startled the hell out of me. Thanks, Zira. Yeah, this is pretty much a Nero kind of a situation going on right here. So, this jackass. Lord Seltharil. Glory to the Sindori. Ah, so good of Magistrix Darnstrider to finally respond to my simple requests. I should take up the matter of her attitude with the Regent Lord of Silvermoon. She's quite rude. Nothing for you to wear your little head over. Now that you're here, maybe I'll finally be able to get those party supplies I've been waiting for. Okay, so I want to stress that he's threatening to take a, what the equivalent of a local lieutenant to task before Lorthamar himself over not getting party supplies. Chorella Ron. I like to throw parties, just a little something to celebrate the magnificence that is Quel'Thalas. But I'm in a bit, a bit of a bind. I need you to gather up more party supplies. I want the, the Vine Master Suntouched at the Silver Moon Inn. Bring me a bottle of Suntouched Special Reserve. And from Zerlane First Flight, I want the delicious Spring Paw appetizers. If you can pick up a delivery of fireworks, I would be grateful. Except he doesn't say that because he's a dick. Be quick about it, is what he actually says. Farewell. I hate this guy. I hate this guy so much. Okay, uh, let's do this direction next. So, just to... I, I want to do this in this direction to really throw this into contrast. So we have Mr. I'm just sort of kind of an idiot who is also a moron and a fool. Meanwhile, over here, we have a temporary encampment of the rangers. Now, quick reality check. The rangers are actually the uh, the military forces of the, uh, the primary military forces of the Blood Elves. Fun fact, rangers are effectively druids in terms of how they function. Um... If you don't understand what I mean by that, a ranger is not just someone who's good with a sword and good with a bow. A ranger is someone who actually communes with nature, natural spirits and, and the, the aspects of druidism and whatnot and, and etc. So uh, the, uh, the rangers are basically a more militant faction of druids. And they're actually pretty awesome, I think, uh, in terms of lore and function. They uh, hold themselves very uh, to a very high standard. They are really good in a, in a fight. They do a lot of uh, awesome stuff. Shrug. Um, the, uh, so this is... This is uh, yeah, Rangers are basically elite core. They don't actually have a standard military. At least they never did before this. The High Elves never actually had... Grat Samurai. The High Elves never had an army in the strictest sense of the word. They had the Magisters, the, the, mag, the Magi, basically, the ones who were capable of combat magic. And then they had the Rangers, both elite groups, both very good and very skilled, but not suited to large-scale conflicts. This is why they needed the humans' help back in the Troll Wars, and this is why the Scourge ran over them because they simply were not capable of taking on that level and that size of a threat in both cases. Nevertheless, I still have a lot of respect for the Rangers in general. Uh, no pun intended. Um, so yeah, over here we have a group of Rangers who are basically just holding the line 
uh, no Mass Effect uh, implications intended, against the wretched assault over here. I'll talk about that in just a moment. Let's get these quests first. Our enemies will fall. The wretched grow bolder every day, Lokma. They've achieved enough coordination to launch an attack on Sunsill Anchorage. That's important, remember that. As if that weren't embarrassing enough, most of our weapons were left behind when they attacked. Please bring me back those armaments so we can show those ruffians who's boss. We will have justice. State your business. Ah, oh, thank goodness for you, Hunter. Those slimy Grimscale murlocs have pirated away my cargo. It's bad enough that the wretched have stolen what little magical good I house, but the murlocs took the rest. What does this land come to? Could you retrieve my cargo? I can't expect you'll be able to get all of it, but I'd be grateful for any at this point. It was the Grimscale in the west, just outside, uh, just around uh, the Golden Strand. I'm sure of it. Shorel Oran. Uh, I also need to do a slight detour, because I want to pick up another quest while I'm in this direction. Yes, I'm riding a motorcycle through the river. What? Or rather, he is. I don't know if you can tell, I'm actually being driven around by an orc in a top hat. See? He's rather dapper. I'd ride another mount, but I can't. <laughs> this is literally the only mount I have access to. Uh, I need to eat soon. On the... Oh, Q? Uh, which interpretation would you prefer, Delver? Advanced technology or omniscience? So. Most people don't even know this quest is here. We will persevere. Ah, greetings, Hunter. Take a look to the shore. What do you see? That's right, our beach. Our tranquil shore has been infested with the malignancy known as the Murloc. This blight will not stand! I have a task for you. If you feel you're up to it, I would have their heads. Let us see if we can put a dent in their numbers so large that if they have any sense at all, they will return to the murky depths from which they sprang. Now, I actually have a decent amount of lore to share about the Murlocs. I don't think this is the best we time to do that. Justice. I will say that basically every single race, and not literally, but most of the races uh, in their starter areas actually have Murlocs as a part of it. Um, there's no big reason for that, but it is, it, it was kind of an unintentional thing, and, uh, it's part of why, uh, murlocs have become kind of a shtick for Warcraft in general. Why every BlizzCon has a murloc pet, why there's the murloc song, why murlocs are such a common feature, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, because most people, when they first started playing WoW, one of the first enemies they really encountered were murlocs, at least in, in large coordinated numbers. And as a result, most people who, again, are playing this game for the first time, died for the first time to murlocs. I actually, uh, my first death in this game uh, ever was to a murloc. I remember it, specifically. I used to be able to do a really good sound. Go ahead and grab that quest. So I just got uh, Captain Kelisandra's Lost Rudders. It's a waterproofed leather tube containing a number of sheets of parchment. By the markings on them, the pages are clearly navigation rudders, with each bearing the signature of Captain Kelisandra. You've heard yada yada yada. So yeah, we're gonna go ahead and take those to her. Uh, did you answer me, Dark Delver? I didn't see your answer. Hogger. <laughs> yeah, a lot of players I knew when they first saw Hogger didn't know what to deal with him. They were just like, what's that? And that's kind of how that went. Uh, no, Night Forger. No connection there. Okay, for the technology, they would be a rank zero. Basically, nothing. Same as all, like, almost everything else. Uh, if they're actually omniscient and omnipresent or whatever, uh, I actually don't think, even if that's true, that they are actually, you know, omni-ishent, omni-potent. Uh, so I think they'd still be pretty high, but I'd still rank them at about a three. Hey, Visual Eminem. 
forest merely set back. We'll be doing that later. Uh, much later. We're doing that after Wrath. But we are doing that, so you know, that's a thing. Where the heck? I haven't gotten any yet. My goodness. Really, Permius? Wow. Eh, a little lower. Well, actually, no, I guess Lady of Pain's about right. Limited, uh... Limited extensive power. If that makes any sense. Ah, what should I eat for lunch, guys? I'm gonna take a bit of a pause here. Not not too soon. Probably after I finish uh, Eversong Woods, I'm thinking. I'll pause for a little bit to grab something to eat. Not for long. Hmm. There, damn it, there's another person taking them all. No wonder there's none. Pancakes! Murloc. What am I in the mood for? Duh. Wait, you mean to eat. Um, what else we got? Is that it? Oh, jeez. Sandwich. You gotta say it right. Sandwich. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, there is a... Uh, there is a... Uh, a Murloc uh, food point, food thing in this game somewhere. I forget what it's called exactly. So, by the way, funny story, totally unrelated to WoW. Uh, I, for the first time ever recently, actually had a type of food that some of you have probably uh, had before, and you're probably going to look at me weird for thinking this is significant. It's called chicken and waffles. And yes, I ate it properly. I put the maple syrup all over the chicken and the waffles and ate both in a singular bite. Not, you know, alternating back and forth. Okay, Nethrazim, just for you. I'll do it off camera. How's that sound? Yeah, I gotta admit, when I first heard about chicken and waffles, I thought it was a joke. Like, I thought, I was like, oh, God, that's ridiculous. Why would anyone ever eat that? Wait, it's, it, it's a real thing? There's really a thing called chicken and waffles? Why is that a thing? I was so confused. But I was finally made to try it for the first time ever, again, quite recently. And it was hard. No, it was it was actually pretty good. In fairness, we went to like the best chicken and waffles place around. It's literally a place where their specialty is chicken and waffles. So it was pretty good. It tasted so weird, though. I mean, I like sweet and salty things, but it was just <laughs> very unusual. Anyways, Anaria <clears throat> Shola. We rangers of the Far Strider Retreat are dedicated to setting right the damage that has been wreaked upon our lands. We will go to any length to do so. And I trust you have returned with the murloc heads I tasked you to gather. Ah, job well done, Hunter. And by the smell of it, I see you returned all that I ask for, and possibly more. I'm sure we can make use for these in a stew or some such. Alas, it does not appear your efforts have done the trick. The murlocs are not in retreat. This calls for more direct action. The Grimscale Murlocs have not been scared off by our efforts, but I think I know what will send them packing, as well as get me some personal retribution. They have a Murloc ch chieftain that calls itself It wanders the Golden Strand, south of the River Inlet. The beast once slew a compatriot of mine, and now wears his ring in open defiance and mockery. Go slay and then bring back my friend's ring, and we shall see these monsters cowed. Salama Ashalanore. By the way, the literal name of the chieftain, I actually killed it earlier, uh, was Murgle. It's right here, it's the upper right. M M M R R R G G G L L L. So, you know. Ah, there we go. Oh. Now, hopefully he's still alive. I can't imagine Murloc tastes good. Granted, I'm not much of a uh, fish person in general, 
But the idea of something that salty and wet and just... Bleh. No, thank you. And he's dead right now. So hopefully the respawn rate will not be too slow. This is the realities of, of doing a lore run of a game where other people can affect your lore run. So we're just going to chill here for a bit. Zoom the camera out. There we go. Okay. I have eaten octopus, yes. Well, oh, yeah, just, just, there you yeah, Die. Yay, we have the ring of... So, uh, this is actually a good time to talk about something else that WoW Vanilla did wrong. Uh, in fairness, every old MMO did this. And this is actually only very recently they finally fixed this. And that is the fact that quest items take up inventory space. Or rather, took. Past tense. Now, quest items don't. They don't, act, they don't. they don't take up, like, space at all. They're just... They're there. You know, you have the quest item. So, like, that, uh, that thing I have... It's not in. Uh, it's not in my inventory at all. It used to be terrible, back when you actually had to keep keep space for it, for quest items, because it would it would literally limit your capacity to go and quest in certain areas because of how many quest items you'd be carrying around. In some cases, you couldn't get certain items because you, you were literally too full on inventory. Um, inventory si bag size is also another ongoing problem. They're still actually working on. Uh, and still trying to deal with. They've got a few solutions to that. I, I think I know which one they should take. I don't know which one they will take, though. Thin pancakes. That sounds a lot like a... Uh, a crepe, Bjorn. Anyways. Our enemies will fall. At last! Though the Grim style did not rout as I had hoped. It was entertaining to watch them panic in confusion when you killed their so-called chieftain. You have my thanks, and the gratitude of the Cinderai of Silverune City. Death to all who oppose us. Especially the Murlocs. Cause seriously, screw those guys. Now, you might wonder why I bothered to go out of my way to do this little quest. This quest's purpose is to emphasize... This quest and the quest I'm about to do both serve the same purpose. Emphasizing, once again, how pathetic the Blood Elves have come. These people used to be some of the top dogs in the entire setting, really. Incredibly magically advanced. Lots of technology, or rather, magic, on their, on their side. You know, all that kind of a thing. The ability to really defend their borders and, and influence things on a global political economic scale. You know, all this wonderful stuff. And now they're being, their beaches and areas are being overrun by murlocs. I just realized that I had that set up wrong. Um, that is just so pathetic in, like, every way. The idea that murlocs, murlocs, are the things that are actually now threatening the, the Blood Elves. In addition to their own, of course, the Wretched. I want to stress, by the way, so I, I told you I'd get back to this. The Wretched themselves are not exactly what you'd call an organized threat. They are, other than one exception, which I'm going to be talking about in a moment, um, a disorganized mass of thugs, basically. Yes, but before now, Psychotic, they could actually deal with this. They could push back the Murlocs without is issue or problem. And now, this is true along Ghost Lens as well, by the way. The, the, the Murlocs have once again uh, stretched across the whole area. And the Blood Elves can't do anything about it. Like, ever. Um, so, let's talk about these specific groups. There's actually a bit of a theory about this. Blame Kale Thoss. Um, I'd say thanks, Obamacare, but except it would be like, you know, thanks, Kale Care or something, but nobody would get it. Anyways, um, uh, where was I? Uh, right! So. There's two theories. Number one, these are a rare exception of Wretched who, despite their total insanity, have managed to gather based on uh, mutual self-interest. The fact that each of these Wretched desperately wants to get the, uh, uh, the hold of these crystals. And they are just sane enough to recognize that if they work together, they could actually take you know, the, the people who are basically their better in every way. 
Um, now I mention that because that's possible, and again, it would it would emphasize just how far bad, how how terribly uh, far gone these guys have have become. Uh, the wretched in specific, I mean, not not the actual Sundora. because the idea of coordinating to to a joint attack is the kind of thing that is so unusual. There has to be an explanation for it because they can't just do that. They are not that much in their right of mind, right? Now, and uh, and it is mentioned these wretched have a leader. They do have coordination. They're not just a roaming band of zombies, basically, who have roamed to this area. Um, not to disagree with Rasker, but they specifically mentioned that's not a possibility here. So, these people might have organized and might have had that rare thought of, aha, I can rook as a group. Or the Night Elves pushed him to it. Now, I know this is that that sounds like, huh? But, um, the... There is actually a little bit of evidence for that. First of all, the fact that we know for a fact that the Night Elves are actively sabotaging, uh... Um, the, the the blood elf uh, actions both here and in the ghostlands. Uh, second second fact which is relevant to this is the fact that the this attack happened very recently. They mentioned that in, in the uh, in the dialogue that I've already gone through and some that I'll be seeing in a moment. So this attack happens right about the time the the night elves show up in this area because they weren't here before now. And the third thing, and I admit this is not exactly the most evidence in the universe, but I feel like pointing it out. These guys drop Darnassian Blue, a.k.a. Night Elf food. So, again, there's no real evidence. There's no like, aha, it was totally them. But it is an interesting thought uh, to consider that uh, the Night Elves might have been part of pushing for this organized wretched attack. It seems it is a very logical thing to do. Uh, because the night elves want to sabotage and to spy on the area, and one of the best ways to do that is if your enemy is completely yes. confused dealing with an otherwise uh, occupying force. Get rid of all this stuff. <laughs> As Hylisk points out, it also could be both. The they they could the the night elves could have been like you could do this and they're like aha we could coordinate for this so it is both um oh lurker got there thank you lurker the eternal sun guides us so we got that the wretched are so oblivious gorging on foul magic they haven't realized we've recovered most of our weapons yet we can't expect them to remain in stupor for long though now is the time for a decisive attack let us make an example of their leader, Alderaan. He was spotted on the top floor of the building. Bring me his head and I'll reward you suitably. The reckoning is at hand. Victory lies ahead. I am grateful for the assistance of someone like you. It almost puts a smile on my face. But then I realize what these monsters have done to my ship and what's happened to Quelth the Loss. Have you managed to get any of my cargo? Oh, you did it! You saved me from ruin and delivered my revenge upon those disgusting creatures. Now if I can just get those pretty rangers here to help with this cargo, I'll finally get out of here. I'll have to come back when Philendris have retaken the shipyard. Here, take some coin. Be ready for and anything. And also... Oh, my sweet, sweet hunter. I had no idea that those disgusting Grimscale Murlocs had also powered away with my navigation rudders. Without them, I would have no chance of navigating the seas again once we retake the anchorage. Thank you so much. Keep your wits about you. So that's a simple merchant captain there who's actually quite grat grateful to us for basically salvaging her career. Assuming we can retake the harbor here. As you can see, uh, a couple of the ships are underwater. Another thing that kind of hints that this was uh, backed by someone. Hmm. All right, let's go ahead and go kill a guy. That's what we're here to do in this game. So someone asked if Warcraft is in the Imperium. Absolutely, it is actually a major element of the Imperium. Uh, being a Nexus world, one few. Ah. By the way, this is an interesting factoid. So I've kind of highlighted how uh, luxurious and in a near paradise state the Blood Elves, excuse me, the High Elves have been, right? Like, I've, I've pointed that out several times. I'll point it out in the future, too. Well, uh, later on, we'll see just how much worse that can be. 
we're actually going to see at least one area that, in my opinion, is even more decadent. Even more disgusting than this. We'll get there, though. We'll get there. One thing I also find amusing about high, uh, high Elven society, in general, they didn't really believe in chairs. I mean, obviously, I say that as I'm looking at a chair. And they do have chairs. But a lot of places, especially in uh, inns and whatnot, you'll just see things like this. Arrays of pillows and mats that you can sit on, and people that just sitting down like that. It's, it's apparently quite common for them. Not sure what to make of that. Yeah, as Bregwin points out, most of the organizations that become enemies in this game do so either by accident or deliberate manipulation of the actual enemies. There are genuinely evil groups in this setting. Two, basically, genuinely evil groups. Um, but uh, other than those two groups, basically every other organization, stress on the word there, is... Uh, just kind of... Oh, no, they attack, Dark Monster. They attack. Um, every other organization is gray. You know, just, just consistent of people. Some are good, some are bad, some are horrible. You know, etc., etc. Um, and so... Uh, <laughs> the uh, So most of the actual wars and conflicts are ha happen, again, either because of some misunderstanding... Or because, you know, one group happens to dislike the other group, or one group has one person who dislikes the other group, and this misunderstanding happens, and they were suspicious of them, and just war happens. Anyways. Anaria Shola. So, yes, we defeated him, we get this, we move on. Nothing really. Keep your wits about you. Alright, next thing we're going to do is go in this direction. In another level, we'll actually be able to name our pet. Has anyone... Okay, so... We're going to do a number... Uh, are we going to play the third game? Now, for those of you who don't know what that means, uh, I'm going to basically, at a certain point in time, not now, I'm going to say, if you want to have this pet, this this dragon hawk that's falling around with me around here, uh, named after you, you say so in chat. And then the third person to say so will be the person picked for it. Now, don't do it yet, because I'm not even keeping track yet. Oh. Um, there we go. So, uh, we won't be able to do that for another, looks like about half a level, so I'm not going to actually do that yet. But for those of you who are interested, just keep that in mind. Why would the Night Elves use common sense? So let's talk about the burning thing. Yeah, B is, is a good thing to say, Dark Rye. Most people say something like that. Um, I mentioned how bad the burning is. I'm going to explain why in just a moment, since we do this quest cycle. Be ready for anything. These are difficult times for us, Lakma. It was a very hard decision to burn the woods bordering the Ghostlands to prevent the Scourge's expansion. The Treants, who have been our friends for years, are now trying to foster the regrowth of the forest along the Scorched Grove. This is a painful thing to ask of you, Hunter, but we failed to convince our former allies to cease their endeavors. I need you to stop them by the only means that remains to us. Death to all who oppose us. So, remember how I mentioned that the rangers are effectively druids? That they actually commune with and work with and coordinate with the spirits of the land and whatnot? That's kind of important because a lot of their society has been built around that exact mindset. The idea of the communal uh, cooperation between them and the other uh, natural uh, spirits and natural creatures that exist in this area. So, yeah, the idea of having to burn an entire forest and take down a lot of these people who were not under their control, unlike the previous ones, but were simply allies within the same region. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's kind of, again, showcasing just how desperate and horrible it was. And by the way, you're probably wondering, what do you mean by the Scourge expansion? I'll actually uh, show you here. So right across this river is the Ghostlands. Hang on, I'll get you a better shot in just a second. These are the Ghostlands over there. Now, it's kind of hard to tell from here. 
But oh, okay, here, perfect, perfect. This is exactly what I was looking for. See this green stuff on this tree? That is the beginnings of undead blight, and it is spreading across this river from the ghostlands over here. Now, blight uh, can spread in one of three ways. It can be basically technologically spread. Uh, there are literally things called blight cauldrons that can spread blight into the air, and that and then it will spread just like any other virus. It can be magically spread. Someone with sufficient will or power can actually move it through the land uh, at will. Or it can spread naturally, because blight's natural inclination is to spread. And if you can kind of see here, the ground is just starting to get a little bit malformed right around the river's edge here, leading into this area. So... The only way that they could think of to prevent the blight from taking hold was burning the land, thereby leaving nothing left alive to be converted into undeath. Now, that is effectively the right decision they made. See you around, Um If they had not done that, and he's not the only one who can do that too, uh, if he, If they had not done that, it is extremely likely the blight would have spread here, into this area, which I remind you includes, uh, you know, a village and a sanctum, you know, one of those lay drills, and of course an actual harbor. So these treants are trying to res restore the land here, which if they do, will enable the blight to spread. Like, as you can see, it's already got quite a bit in land. You see how far away this is from the river? So they have to kill their allies. They have to kill their allies in order to prevent them from making the situation worse. Actually, Tequeta, it would work if nothing was left alive here, which was the goal. Blight does have one weakness. It, as, as Krenzo points out, Blight requires life to spread. If there's no life, it will not spread. So, yeah. It is a very temporary solution to the problem. The irony is, as I pointed out, we're not even 100% sure if it is possible for land to recover from blight. Uh, it is... It, I, I personally do think it's possible. I'll talk about why when we get to the Cataclysm stuff. Let's just say uh, Western Plague Lands and leave it at that. Um, but that, that, is, that occurred over years of concentrated, continuous, extensive effort in order to reclaim that. And that was just bits and pieces of the plague lands had been recovered. So it is possible that someday they will actually be able to restore this area and be able to, to you know, restore these spirits back to life. But for now, yeah. And the worst part is they probably will now have to station people here full time whose only jobs are to make sure the forest never recovers. At least not until they're capable of reclaiming the blighted areas. And we'll go for him. Hmm. That's pretty much exactly what they're doing, Night Forager. The okay, so blight. Yeah, I was say it takes a little bit of time, Dakota. It's not like you can. It's not like you can just walk over and say, "Oh God, it instantly eats me." It's it's not like that. There are ways to uh, be present on it for for little periods of time. Uh, it is mentioned that the magical uh, influence of the blight is a deleterious effect. So if you go over the blight and if you stay on it too long, it will start to get to you. Uh, I need to sneeze. Wow, that was out of nowhere. Anyways, <laughs> so anyways, as I was saying, the uh, oh my god, uh, it is so if you stay too long on blight or you're on blighted land, it gets to you. It it affects you magically, spiritually, and eventually physically. And so you need to not you need to rotate troops in and out basically. And in areas where you can't, it 
tends to be pretty bad. Uh, detrimental to Koida. The more magic, uh, the more it tends to flow. <sighs> Thank you, Rengar. I hope you're enjoying uh, me talking about a lot of story, because there's a lot of story in this game. I mean, how much have I had to talk about in one zone? We're one zone in, guys. What do you mean, Night Forger? Ah, uh, okay. Glory to the Sindorai. So it is done. Curse these times that have driven us to desperate measures and curse our enemy, the Scourge. Learn this, Lachma. Our lands must be protected no matter the cost. We must prevail. The reckoning is at hand. Now, there's one other quest I'd really like to do. Uh... Because it's cool and it's lore. Oh, um, but it's kind of crowded right now, so I'm gonna have to kind of camp the spawn. Yeah, I'm having allergies and it's giving me a headache too, which I really hate. Uh, I, you ever have that allergy headaches when you just got the pressure thing going on? It sucks. <sighs> um, so I'm just gonna kind of hang out around here for a bit. Hope he shows up. Anywho, um. So, uh, also, hi, Dark Archon. <laughs> Was that him? No. Hmm. Oh, I see what you mean, Nightford. Then, yes, yes, it's much more logic. It, it's much better uh, designed, I think. Agreed, psychotic. I wish plants would stop procreating. We could have a perfect world devoid of all life. Or wait. Um. <laughs> we could have a scourged world. Fun fact. For those of you who don't know, uh, the term scourge doesn't actually imply a negative. Uh, scourging is actually just a form of cleansing. A very severe and extreme form of cleansing. But that's all it is. <coughs> the term scourge was actually um, was actually uh, coined by Kelthuzad specifically when uh, the or the the first Lich King had basically put together his initial forces and Kelthuzad saw them and he well let's just say that Kelthuzad uh, is not really evil in my opinion he genuinely believed in what he was doing and why he was doing it the scourging of of humanity the scourging of things once i actually read some of his writings to you you'll kind of see what i mean by that and so uh yeah he named it the scourge not because oh we must kill everything and torture everything and be horribly evil it was more because he actually felt life was wrong i don't mean life in general i mean the way that things were and i gotta be honest uh he's kind of right with the way things had gotten after the Second War, life was pretty terrible uh, amongst Lord uh, Azeroth in general. I mean, my god. I'm going to give this a couple more rotations, and I'm just going to tell you about the quest. Because I'm not finding this guy. Let's, oh, 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 there he is, there he is. Quick, 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 quick. Ah. Okay. Yay. So, we just killed a particular Ent who gave us a necklace. The pendant has the initials LR etched on it. Hmm. Well, as it happens, I know exactly who it goes to. L.R. Also known as Lariana Riverwind. Victory lies ahead. You have something to show me? This pendant. I gave it to old Whitebark after his people helped us rebuild our village. By the way, I want to restress that line that, that she just said. This is how connected with and close <coughs> to these Ents and these natural spirits the Blood Elves were. They weren't... I, I stress... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I stress this because a lot of people think of the uh, I, I th a lot of people think of the blood elves as just yes, we will control everything and dominate everything and be horribly evil, decadent bastards. 
But a large chunk of them, especially the rangers, as I mentioned earlier, were in harmony with their surroundings, were in harmony with the people and the animals and the creatures and the spirits that were around them. And so Old Whitebark and his Ents actually helped them build the village that we're helping to save as we're going through several of these quests. <clears throat> so after we give it to her, she says, I appreciate you bringing this to me. There's something I'd like to ask of you. This pendant brings back memories of a different time, a better time. Unfortunately, memories are the last thing I need right now. I want you to bury this by the runestone in the Scorched Grove. It was there that I first met the Treant Elder and put my old friend's memory Keep your wits about you. to rest. Guys, stop arguing. I've been tolerating it for now. Both of you drop it, okay? Both of you. <sighs> so we're going to go ahead and... Uh, so, if, again, this kind of shows the pragmatic mindset that uh, that has, has kind of befallen the Blood Elves. This is something that reminds her of a better time, which she is now... She just wants to be rid of. She does not want to remember when things were better. So we're going to go ahead and bury this. So the spirit asks, haven't you done enough harm? Must you also disturb my slumber? Ugh. What good does violence serve? What's done is done, and I have failed my people. You've returned, Blockmar. Haven't you done enough? I no longer belong to this world and must admit defeat. The land is forever changed and nothing will ever be the same. Leave the pendant here with me, Lockmar. Maybe one day, long after the elves are gone, a new tree will grow on this spot amongst a burnt forest and dead treants. Ding. Also, on that subject. <sighs> also, I tend to agree that the Night Elves... Okay, so the problem is the Night Elves are just as, if not more than, uh, guilty of the casual arrogance as the High Elves ever were. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The, uh, the Night Elves are so stuck in their own particular idiom and so stuck in their particular ways that they look at the Blood Elves and the, excuse me, the High Elves and their uh, communion and coordination with the spirits of the net land and the nature, they're druids, and they say, oh, those aren't druids. Those are just, that's pathetic. You don't know what real druidism about. Real druidism about doing it our way. We're the ones who are right. You're the ones who are wrong, and... Yeah. There's a lot of classism. A lot of classism that goes on in this, in this setting. Let's go get rid of that. 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 Uh, that's the thing. <laughs> yes, Permius is quite right. There are a lot of shades of gray. There's a lot of gray in this setting. Okay, so we can now control our pet. Yay. So, anyone who would like to have a dragon hawk, that's this guy right here, uh, named after you, I'm going to go ahead and open that. The third person to say me or otherwise be the person who wants it will get, the, will get it named after them. So I'm just going to go ahead and hang out and chill for a second while I wait for people to be like you. <laughs> oh, and I'm definitely going to eat as soon as I finish this zone. <coughs> Two more quest hubs to do. Looks like it is Krenzler. So. Rename. Krenzler the Dragonhawk. Yes. Come, Krenzler. What business have oh, you? oh, so yeah, I should we talk about these a little bit. So I actually mentioned these earlier. These guys are uh, runestones. Now, these are basically ley line energy that has been carved into a specific pattern that outputs very specific uh, magic into a zone to perform a certain thing. In other words, <coughs> excuse me, these are basically a form of technology, just magic technology, not magitech. There's a difference. Magitech does exist in this setting. This is not that. But they tend to approach magic as if it's another form of technology in Warcraft. Um, so that's what these are. They had several of these. Uh, wonderful little runestones. There was another one over there. There's another one, I think. There it is. You can sort of see it way off in the distance that way. Uh, these things I actually mentioned before were the things that were helping keep demonic influence uh, out of here. And, uh, and trying to maintain a general barrier 
for the area in general. Uh, one of the things Arthas did when he led the Scourge invasion was made it so that he could get through these uh, particular stones. And also, these were also... One of the reasons he was capable of doing that was the stones were already damaged by the Demonic Hordes invasion during the Second War. So, two blows these things have taken. So their defenses are pretty much at a, at a minimum right now. Barely functional. Victory lies ahead. Ancient rune stones once powered a protective barrier across the Eversong border. Many others were destroyed during Arthur's attacks. Others were stolen. Of the three that remain, of dozens if not hundreds that were originally here, this one has this one only this one has retained its power. The rune stone to the east might be salvageable though. Take this crystal and instill its energy under the eastern rune storm. The process should take a minute. Beware though, the nearby scourge will be drawn to it and seek to destroy it. Do not let them. Mm. That's one reason I tend to be more in favor of the High Elves than the Night Elves. Both groups of uh, people, and let's be clear, uh, even though there are technically differences in species between the two, um, they are effectively the same race. So both groups of people, both cultures, uh, took away from the War of the... Uh, they, they took away from the War of the Ancients a different lesson. The Night Elves took away extremism. All the druids went into the dream, all of them, and everyone, all the sentinels who were left behind had to enforce this extremely stringent law of absolutely nothing must be allowed, as, you know, very strict, very lawful, you know, that kind of a thing. The uh, high elves took away from that. We need to be way more organized and way more controlled. High elven society tends to patrol itself. Now that sounds weird, but here's an interesting little factoid. The extreme decadence of the old Highborn, uh, the Night Elves under Ashara's reign, much of that decadence was in the way that they were excessively utilizing magic in an excessive amount of ways, okay? So what they do in modern High Elven society, and for the last several hundred years, is they encourage people to go ahead and be excessive in luxuries that aren't magical. And thus we have Lord Idiot Face, who we still have the quest for, who is like, oh yes, please go get me in you know, a fireworks and, and food so I can enjoy my party. That's decadent and stupid and idiotic. But by allowing the people who are inclined to be that decadent to have their decadence, it's just in a way that doesn't harm society as a whole, or rather, does not call demons down on them, so, you know. Um, they have a, they're basically forming an outlet. It's actually very similar to Mech Warrior, believe it or not, and what Straczynski did uh, with the clans. Make an artificial outlet for this negative aspect of their society in order to try and control and better the society. And as we've seen, both methods didn't actually work. Um, but it, it, it is worth noting that it did kind of kind of work in both cases. The clans did have an outlet for the natural, violent nature of humanity, and the High Elves did have a uh, a um, <coughs> a way to keep people who would be making things worse out of everyone else's way. So, and it looks like the Horde, excuse me, the Alliance, are attacking Fairbreeze. So hopefully, I'll be able to turn some quests in in a minute. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to connect these two remaining rune stones <laughs> together. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So that we can actually... Uh, uh, yes, Starch Monster, it is. So we can actually try and uh, have some kind of barrier going. Some kind of just basic, mundane, you know, some kind of defenses. I mean, my god. Something, anything. This won't be able to stop an army or even an invasion force, but at least it'll keep out riffraff and, and roaming scourge. Hopefully. Yep, yep, yep. Ah, Alliance scum! I mean... And yeah, this might stop the blight from spreading. We don't actually know. But, you know, it's some... Like I said, it's something. It's some kind of barrier reestablished. And of course, uh, as of now, by Warlords, uh, Blood Elf Society has recovered so much that they might actually be able to build new of these things, new rune stones, and set up new defenses for their borders. 
Uh, it's not, it, yeah, it's not so much attracted to the rune stone as attached to the stone I was using, Takoya, as Raskor just pointed out. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yes, Takoya, the scourge was designed to fix all of the flaws of the previous attempts, both of them. So, all the flaws of the demons and all the flaws of the orcs were intended to be fixed by the Scourge. Of course, the Scourge have their own flaws, and those flaws are... They're better than the demons. <laughs> but we don't want to get into that story yet. Let's turn this in. We will persevere. Excellent. The defenses have shoulded things off for a bit longer. Thank you. Hold your head high. I shall hold my head high. Mm, excuse me. Okay... Let's go do those two quests. Yeah, sorry about the cough, guys. Like I said, I'm still actually recovering from being ill the last couple of days. Uh, uh, list. this was eight years ago, I believe, relatively. Uh, I guess, Little Billy, if people want to. Like I said, we're not really on a real character yet. This character will be abandoned as soon as we finish the Ghostlands and the final chain of that. Which is going to be funny, turning that into Vol'jin. I'm not sure if the dialogue's going to change or not. I'm kind of curious. We'll just pretend it was Thrall, because MMO time. As I've already discussed, you kind of have to keep that in mind. Yeah, no kidding, Psychotic. That sounds really good right now, Azra. A shame that I don't actually have any tea on me. Ah, uh, yep. Alliance scum have been killing NPCs. <sighs> I hate Alliance. I'm sorry, that's not true. I hate dicks. I hate people who are like, her, her, I'm going to go kill quest NPCs because it's funny to prevent other people from being able to, to play the game. <sighs> Anyways. Anubilore, Delana, remember the sun well. Your help in subduing the wretched has been invaluable. The Far Striders would have been, uh, would surely have use for someone like you in their fight against the Amani. Look for the Far Strider retreat to the northeast of here and speak with Lieutenant Dawnrunner. Chorel Oran. God, that is actually kind of ironic, isn't it, Leander? Uh, okay, let's finish up this other quest while we wait for NPCs to respawn. So, okay, let's talk about the PvP aspect of things. So, <clears throat> yeah, I've I've played on servers like that, Meadfist, in the past. Not anymore. Uh, Kargath, my main server, is actually pretty uh, pretty good about the Alliance Horde uh, coordination and non-dickishness. <coughs> ah. So yeah, the idea here, this is a non-PVP server. Now what that means is I'm not flagged PVP. So I can't be attacked by other players. Okay, that's cool. I will never actually uh, play on a PVP server again because I know this sounds weird, but I'm one of those people who likes to go out and actually play the game and not literally live in constant fear of being ganked and then having to deal with that. And I'm here to quest, you know, and, and enjoy the story and play the game. I don't really feel like going and randomly having to kill and be killed by other players because they were bored you know what i mean so that's uh Dangerous so i'm business. not on a pvp server okay so you might ask why is this a consideration at all the problem is npcs are hostile enemies to the other side so an alliance especially a level 100 alliance uh shut up grizz uh, a level 100 alliance could easily come here and be like aha there's this one critical quest NPC, and it's the one who's right here that you, now you'll notice. Uh, one, two, three, four. Counting myself, five players are waiting to be able to move this quest forward. Five of us. Our lives have now been delayed because of some idiot who decided it would be funny to come and kill a quest NPC. Oh, here comes a sixth. So, yeah. Now, there are certain NPCs who are basically uh, untargetable. Um, in other words, they're not, you know, invincible things. They they can't even be hit. You can't not do damage to them. Uh, a good example of this is the children in Stormwind. You could kill almost every NPC in all of Stormwind, but you cannot kill the kids. Uh, probably a good decision, actually. But the point is that, uh... I... I'm gonna do this. Um... <clears throat> That even if you try to do AoEs around them, or target them or whatever, it, it's impossible to do damage to them. 
Uh, I don't remember what server I'm on right now, Jedi Mew. <coughs> oh. Oh. And no, it's not bannable. It's not anything. So let's go talk to this apprentice. <clears throat> the eternal sun guides us. Oh, it's so nice of my old mentor to check on me. It's too bad she lost faith in my research long ago. Don't waste your time trying to get me to return to her. You can either help me with my research or leave. We will have justice. This was a fully functional arcane sanctum before Arthas and his army of the Scourge decided to plow through on their way to Silvermoon. Now it's as useful to us as any part of the Dead Scar. The soil is tainted, and the undead are drawn to it, and the energy in the ley lines is completely disrupted. What I want to know is whether this taint is reversible or not. I want you to collect soil samples so I can study them. Perhaps in time we could set things back to normal. Be ready for anything. Oh, I know, Hylisk. Yeah, for those of you not know, there are people who, what they do in this game, like literally, what they do, the, 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 the time they spend playing this game, they spend running around killing quest NPCs. Specifically quest NPCs. I'm not talking about, like, killing vendors, which would be just kind of irritating, or uh, <clears throat> killing guards, which is admittedly kind of pointless. No, I'm talking about specifically seeking out quest NPCs. Now... You remember how I mentioned earlier that questing from Cataclysm onward is uh, streamlined and improved and whatnot? Uh, one of the ways I mentioned that was because of the flow. Well, the catch to that is because of the flow quest design... Um, oh, she's back. Because of the flow quest design, often there's a critical NPC where if that NPC is missing, you can't do any of the quests for the entire zone because all of the quests run through that NPC. So you can just kill that one NPC and... yeah. Stage <clears throat> You're here to help us? Why did you say so earlier? We could use a hand. Well, you were dead. The reckoning is at hand. We've experienced a marked increase in scourge attacks. Our defenses are barely holding and there's no sign of reinforcements from Silvermoon City. Please lend us a hand in defending the village by thinning the numbers of the undead. Remember the sun well. You got it. I have to do one other thing before I forget about it here. <laughs> I need to buy something for Lord Jackass. A bundle of fireworks. Time is of the essence. Got to do my part to make sure that the uh, the idiots and the stupids are off partying rather than trying to glut themselves on magic. <clears throat> Well, the problem lurker comes from the fact that they're killable. Now, the the thing is, there are people who argue stringently that that kind of PvPing should be allowed. And the argument is always boils down to basically amount of zone control. In other words, oh, I've had tons of experience with griefers. And griefers can go burn. That, that's my summary in a nutshell. Um, but uh, the general argument is that if, you know, a horde group or an alliance group, let's use an alliance group. If an alliance group is going to go attack the crossroads, they want to have some purpose behind it. They want to actually be able to go and not only just provoke the horde, so they have to be able to kill something that matters, otherwise the horde isn't going to give a damn. And they want to be able to basically cold the area and say, aha, this is now our territory. We have denied the horde access to their town. <clears throat> Thereby adding to the war aspect of the game, right? Now, obviously, I disagree with that completely, but, I mean, for God's sakes. Uh, so, again, that's that's part of the mentality there. For me, I think the actual best solution would be to basically do a half-and-half half thing. Why not have it be so on PvP servers, where that kind of thing is going to happen anyways, why not have it so that there you can go and, uh, you know, kill NPCs wantonly and do whatever, you know, just, just make that out. Yeah, exactly, Hylisk. Uh, and then make it on PvE servers that NPCs have an invincibility flag. It is a flag that exists uh, in all NPCs, uh, in all mobs' um, uh, data. I, I've looked at the, at the mob data that exists for every mob in the game. And so you could literally just set a flag and say, these aren't, these aren't killable, and voila, that problem goes away on PvE servers. Ergo, 
that way the people who still want to do that kind of conflict stuff and zone of control stuff and and you know do the large scale battle stuff can and the people who don't want to have anything to do with that don't have to i think that would be a great compromise in that situation it would take some some man hours but would not be hard all it would take is time Like, for example, so that zone of control thing I just mentioned, one thing I've actually seen happen is a roaming army of Alliance that started off um, at Ratchet and then took Ratchet, you know, it, it wiped out everything there, moved on to Crossroads, took Crossroads, moved on to Razor, uh, Razor Hill, took Razor Hill, and then marched on Orgrimmar and then got curb stomped by Orgrimmar. Um... <clears throat> And that's because by that point, the army had been so stretched out because they kept leaving people behind to claim the territory that that was as far as they got. Now, the whole point there, though, wasn't just, ha-ha, let's go kill Horde. This was, a, this was a planned event. They were actually like, you know, the Horde and the Alliance were both aware of this. And the Alliance was like, we actually want to try and conquer Horde territory. And it was actually kind of fun. But the catch, of course, is the fact that there were probably dozens of people, if not more, who were... Uh, completely unaware of the event, whose experience and play style of the game that day was completely destroyed because some other people were having fun in a way that is deleterious to them. Even if we weren't griefing deliberately, we were still negatively affecting their play style. Because yes, I was a part of that army too. Um, and the funny thing was, uh, I was actually a part of that army on the Horde side. We had a deliberate strategy. Uh, what we were trying to do was let the, we put up some resistance in the first few towns so they had to uh, leave people behind to claim them and then sit with the majority of our force at Orgrimmar so when they finally hit us, you know, weakened and with less forces, we could crush them and that's what we did. And then, you know, it's like, ah, we win. And then we kind of fought for a while and then it sort of petered out as it always does. Um, <clears throat> but again... If you set it up the way I mentioned earlier, PvP servers could do that as much as you want. You could go ahead and do those kind of little war battle things. And then on the PvE servers, you know, level 15s just happen to go through a zone and have no idea what's going on at all. Or is someone who, to use a very bad example, let's say someone just wants to play the game. Like they've never played this game before. They've just started WoW. And one of their first experiences of WoW is, well, this town has completely been crushed by the enemy forces. And they don't even understand what's going on. Like, they probably enter the town, they see a bunch of humans wandering around, like, huh? And there's no NPCs around. I mean, what do you think someone who's never played this game before is going to think when that happens? The dark times will pass. Excellent. I will cast an augmentation enchantment on the sample so I can more clearly analyze the taint on the soil. Shurel are on. Such... Dark energy. How can this be possible? I had no idea the Blight was this ridiculously powerful. Our enemies will fall. Something's wrong. I sense the presence of the Scourge. Be ready. And Garsul, the Remorseless, attacks us. Baladash Malinore. <sighs> My endeavors are hopeless, Lakma. The very nature of the soil has been altered. The taint is irreversible. <sighs> Thank you for your assistance. I'll ask one last task of you. As discouraging as my research results are, they still contain valuable data. I must have a magister review my work before it is taken seriously. Please take my notes to Magistrix Landra in Fairbreeze. Be ready for anything. Okay. Let's go do that real quick. So griefers, right? Oh, I've got so many stories of griefers. I'm trying to think of the worst one I could come up with right off the top of my head. One time I was playing um, on Horde, and there was this Alliance level 70. This is back when BC was the, the, the latest uh, expansion. And this guy found me. I was like, hey, he waved, and I waved back, because it's my nature to be jovial and, and, you know, hey, what's up to the other side? Um, <clears throat> so then he started following me around. And every time I would go to try to kill a mob, he would try to tag it first. And I'm like, okay. Um, and I'll continue the story in a second. The eternal sun guides us. Okay, no, no real story there. So, 
yeah, uh, it was kind of a dick thing. But whatever, I actually managed to make it to the point where I actually could uh, complete the quest. And so I went to go turn in my NPC, and he followed me and killed the NPC I was trying to turn it into. Like, as I was approaching him. So I'm standing there like, okay, I'll just kind of hang out for a second. And the, the NPC respawned, and then he killed it again, and I'm like... So I decided to go do another quest, and he followed me. And was following me around, and I go try to turn in this other quest, and the long and the short of it is, this guy, I just logged in, let, let, uh, logged onto another character. It was just, okay, I'm not dealing with this. I have a much better griefing story for anybody who'd like to hear it. Yes. So these notes are shocking. If they're correct, it means to the damage to the dead scar is irreversible. I'll notify the Grand Magister right away. More reason for our race to escape this world and find our true fate in Outland. I really wanted to complete that quest and show you that. Uh, so I'm glad that she was alive for me to do that. Because this is much of the initial story arc of the, of the Blood Elves. So I mentioned how desperate we are. Uh, as, as Blood Elves at this point in time. The actual general consensus at this point is that the Blood Elves are literally going to abandon Azeroth and move to Outland as a whole race. I'll discuss that in more detail a little bit later. Anyways, so yes, I'm sure several of you heard this story before. It's one I am very fond of sharing, so forgive me for what is going to be repetition, guys. For those of you who've heard this. I'll talk about it, Takoida, don't worry. It's it's a big topic. I just want to save it for when it's more relevant. That's just the first time we've heard about it. Ah, Scourge. Um, <clears throat> so. There I was, doing a holiday quest, okay? Now, for those of you not aware, uh, I should say holiday achievement. A lot of the holiday achievements are terrible, and I hate them. Uh, several of the holiday achievements require you to basically do PvP stuff. One of them was to bring, uh, you know, I don't even remember the holiday. It was to literally enter uh, Ironforge. It wasn't the one to hit the hit the king with the BB gun. Not that one. This this is a different one. You literally had to step in the door at Ironforge, do something real quick, and leave. I don't remember which one that was, uh, but that's that's what the requirement was. It placed upon me. By the way, enjoy the architecture. This is uh, Silver Moon proper, so you'll be able to see a lot of it. Uh, School of Hard Knocks. Ugh. Anyways, um, yeah, let's give you a little bit better of a view. Oh yeah, it's the Lunar Festival right now. So yeah, this place is gorgeous. And very, very high elven. Uh, might have been Brewfest. It might have been Pyres. I don't remember. The point is, it was a real quick in and out thing. It was not shooting him with the BB gun. I remember that distinctly. So as I'm going in there, I, I poke my head in and of course, entering a capital city immediately and instantaneously flags you for PvP, even if you're on a PvE server. So I'm flagged for PvP, do the thing I have to do, and immediately leave. Because, you know, I'm done. I've done the thing. And all I need to do is get out and win. Now, this was before Cataclysm. That's important because Cataclysm gave us flying in the old world. Uh, so... I couldn't fly out of the situation. I had to basically hoof it to someplace nearby. For a little bit of perspective, as a horde, this is Ironforge, right here, okay? So, the nearest uh, pl path to leave Ironforge is all the way down here in the Badlands. Uh, well, at the time, it was like right around here, but you get the point. That's quite a hike. It's like all the way across there. It's three zones away. So, I get all the way up there. Here, hang on, let me go ahead and buy this thing. Choose wisely. Uh, that. Go ahead and get rid of the rest of this while I'm at it. So I get all the way up there, do the thing, start to leave. I could also have hearthed, of course, as you're well aware. But if you don't know, hearthing is this. See that progress bar? This takes 10 seconds to complete. And if you get hit at all, you're interrupted. So you're so I, that's relevant to the story, for those of you who have not actually played this game. Um, I do love the aesthetic of this place, by the way. It is very gorgeous. Uh, I kind of hope they do more with it someday. A lot of this isn't actually here. Because of the fact that, as you can see, this is basically what's left of Silvermoon. You can actually see the dead scar going down the middle of it, and the unclaimed area over there, which we've already quested through. So yeah, we actually can't even see most of this place. 
Anyways, so I'm running away, just ugh, trying to get away. And the first thing I, I see is, naturally, there's an alliance chasing after me. So because there's an alliance chasing after me, I can't actually hearth. Now I'm on my warrior, tank spec. So I have a few tricks up my sleeve to survive. I, the first thing I did was I tried to hearth. He caught up, interrupted me. I hopped down the mountain. If you know, you know the mountain path, you can actually hop like, straight down and get a ton of time ahead. Uh, and unless you have a way to live through that, you, you can't follow. So then I mounted up and started leaving, and I'm, I'm like, I look around for a second, and I see that he is following me, and I'm like, okay, fine. So I just start heading straight east through Dun Marog. I know the path pretty well. I've been there, been there many times. Every now and again, I'll check behind me, and he's still there. Yep, I check behind me. Uh, after a little bit, I, I look behind me, and I notice that some other guy has come in from a different angle. So now I have two alliance guys trying to follow me through Dune Morog, trying to kill me. And they're close enough. They're basically like as far away as this fence is over here from me. So way too close for me to actually hearth and get away. So I have to run if I, if I want to live. Now, <laughs> I managed to get all the way through Dune Morog to the eastern section. And I know, I know exactly how long this took. Uh, it'll be obvious why I say that in a moment. So I get all the way through Dune Morog, get into Lakmodan. At somewhere around the time as I was going through Doom Rogue, I forget the exact moment, I noticed that I only had one person chasing me now. And I'm like, okay, I think I know what's happening there because I have a brain and I've done this before. So, you know, I got this. And sure enough, when I start approaching Loch Madon, uh, here, I'll give you a little bit of a visual indicator. So I started going through Loch Madon. There's a town right here. And the only path through is through this area. As I start to get through, I see the other guy coming from that town straight to me. 20 second log out, Dakota. So that guy's coming straight after me. So he actually went back, flew ahead, and they're trying to pincer me. Now, I've been mounted this whole time. Now, for those of you not aware... Oops, I didn't mean to do that. If you're mounted and you get dazed... Uh, whoops, hello. Like, I just got dazed, actually. You get dismounted. So I'm mounted, rushing away, like trying to do the best I can to angle away. No, no dice. He hits me, hamstrings me, knocks me off the mount. I'm like, okay. So I spend the next, I don't know how long exactly. It probably wasn't actually that long. Probably about 40 seconds. Having two Alliance people beat the snot out of me. As I'm still running away the whole time. Slowly, because they've hamstrung me the entire time. They might, they might not have literally been hamstrung, but you know, it was a slowing movement. So I'm just like... And this whole time I'm running, I have never attacked them back. I have done nothing to defend myself. That's very important. You see, there's an interesting thing in WoW. If you get flagged, and then you don't do anything to refresh it, like, in other words, if you don't type in slash PvP, but if something happens to flag you, like going into an enemy capital, or attacking an enemy unit or whatever, or entering an enemy uh, zone of control, um, after you leave that, five minutes pass, and then your PvP flag goes away. And you're back to normal. So I look down and I see that my PvP flag has about 10 seconds left on it. Because I haven't attacked them back. So I have not refreshed it. So I'm just like, yep, yeah, just making it. And I'm a tank. So I'm like, shield wall. And then you, the, the health restore. And then last stand. And then block. And then another block. And I'm just burning everything. I'm a damn good tank, if I say so myself. So I'm just burning everything into having as much tank abilities as I can and live abilities. And my health is plummeting and plummeting and plummeting and plummeting. I was at a, I was at a, such a minimum of health, I actually thought I died. I was so low on health when the flag dropped. But the moment it dropped, the moment my flag dropped, I stopped running dead. I just stopped moving. And sure enough, my, my, you know, my name turned back to blue, as it is right now on my screen. And the two of them, the two of them who were, uh, who were still trying to uh, kill me, just start swarming all over me like, ah, yeah, yeah. And you could see the confusion. You could see the confusion in the way they're acting. Because they were like, ah, kill him, kill him, kill him. And like none of their abilities were not working because I was no longer flagged. They could no longer attack me. So I'm standing there at like... 1% health. You know, it was under 5% health. And they're and they're just like, ah, kill him, kill him, kill him. What? And and then the, and after like a good five seconds, they finally realize they can't kill me and they stop and look at me. And I look at one, slash wave. Look at the other one, slash wave. And then I hearth. That is one of the most satisfying revenges I have ever had in this game. 
I refused to let them drag me down to their level. Choose wisely. And I won. Will have justice. <laughs> Anu Bellore Delana. Okay. Ours are not the vast kingdoms of the humans and the orcs. All we have left in our lands of Atheros lies mostly before your eyes. Until we reach Outland, <clears throat> we must defend what little land we have at any cost. Our uncivilized neighbors to the southeast, the Amani trolls, certainly have a different opinion regarding the ownership of these lands. Their daily raids are something we can't tolerate anymore. Go teach them a lesson. We will have justice. But yeah, I, I like to. I've told that story before because I like to use that as an example of a quiet revenge. In other words, rather than having revenge by being like, "Oh, you screwed me over," I screw you over. It's kind of the re revenge where you screw me over, and I do nothing bad to you in return. The quiet revenge. Our enemies will fall. Yeah, no kidding, Raskar. The Imani and the Sindarai have a long history of mutual dislike, about six millennia of it, and open hostility. That doesn't prevent me from appreciating a fellow craftsman's work. I've come across a few pieces of Imani weaponry, and I must admit I'm impressed by the quality. It's rumored that Spearcrafter Otembe wields a magical hammer that is so light and well-balanced, it allows him to work with great dexterity and efficiency. If you bring me this weapon, uh, this tool, I'll use it to craft you a weapon. Death to all who oppose us. Yeah, basically, Krenzo. They did. They were so angry and so bitter, and they were so insistent on hurting me for no reason other than because they could, and they failed. <laughs> Glory to the Sindorai. Uh, actually, we're gonna remember the not even pick that quest up. Good. Uh, not until the end of the next zone, Nero's ass. Everything has a price. Really? There the reckoning is at hand. All right. The plunder bus. <laughs> so, um, as she pointed out, the only lands the Blood Elves actually hold right now are this zone. We don't actually hold the Ghostlands. Whoops, the Ghostlands. This is territory we have basically lost. Um, and as I've already pointed out several times. Our holdings in this area are not exactly secure. Fairbreeze is secure, but we lost the anchorage. We were getting sabotaged in the West Sanctum. The East Sanctum is destroyed. This area just got burned, and of course there's the dead scar in the middle of it all. You might be like, aha, but in the Southeast, we're fine. Well, no, we're terrible in the Southeast. See, there's these troll groups called the Amani. Now, I mentioned them in brief earlier. The Amani are one of the uh, three great um, uh, troll tribes. Now, to, to explain what I mean a little bit by that, there's actually quite a few different troll tribes, but only three of them ever really built an empire, like a big, massive, doomy empire. The Gurubashi, the Amani, and the, and the Zandalar. Those three groups uh, used to be basically, they basically controlled the entire world. The only part of the world that they didn't control was the part con controlled by the Kiraji. We're going to talk about them much later. Um... Nice, Zero. Uh, yeah, no kidding, Takoida. I'm telling you. It, there's a reason they're all trying to Exodus unmask to Outland. They are they're basically willing to abandon home. Now, that doesn't work out, obviously, but anyways. Um, wow, Pyro. Uh, right, this way. So... Interesting thing about the trolls in general. The trolls come across as a little bit primitive, but don't let that fool you. They do like a more primitive architecture. Wood, grass, bone. But that's by design, not by limitation. The trolls are actually very advanced, especially magically. They are probably one of the most in touch with the ways of the world and the way things work around here, especially with the Loa, which I'll be talking about extensively throughout the entire of its run. And... Uh, the uh, the trolls also are very, very powerful militarily and magically. Anytime the trolls unite, it tends it works out pretty badly for everyone else. How you doing? So <clears throat> come closer, man. Don't be afraid. 
then Jassy not gonna hurt you. Us Dark Spears be mortal enemies of the Amani just like you. Their boss Zulmarosh is an evil troll. He give me the bad poison and leave me in this cage to die. I not scared of dying, Mon. I see death in the eye and I laughed at her. But I cannot die in peace, Mon. Not till Zulmarosh be dead too. You wanna find him cross the lake at Zebwatha. I hold this poison off till you bring me his ugly head, Mon. Then I die peacefully. Spirits be with you, man. And yes, that is a dark spear troll. A.K.A. A horde troll. Oh, they are Raskor. Especially, well... <clears throat> yeah, trolls... Okay, so resurrection is a thing in lore in Warcraft. Bringing characters back from the dead is a thing that can happen in lore. It's not easy. In lore, obviously in gameplay we have, you know, a resurrection spell. Like, four classes have access to that. Um, but in lore, there is such a thing as resurrection. It's not easy, it requires certain circumstances, and it doesn't always work. However, as Hylisk just pointed out, the trolls as an aggregate regularly have the ability to bring people back from the dead, and regularly do. That really says a lot about the level of advancement that the, uh, the trolls have in general. Uh... I... yes and no, Jedi Mew. I like LFG, and I like LFR. But I like it because that means I can play this game how I want to, rather than how I have to. However, it is worth noting that that did kind of lower the amount of community feeling that this game had, absolutely. That's not the only thing they've done, Raskor, to do that. They do have other methods of making that happen. But again, we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here. But yeah, so, uh, like I said, I've got a lot more to say about the trolls in general, and the Imani in specific. I don't have a lot to talk about as of this exact point in time, or rather, I, I could, but I don't want to go too much into it. Um, I will say one really important thing. Hey, Mafia. Welcome. Um, one really important thing to keep in mind here is that the, uh... <laughs> um, the current leader of the Imani really, really, really hates the High Elves. So you don't understand the language in these battle plans, but you clearly make out a map marking the positions of Far Strider Retreat and Fairbreeze Village. I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so yeah, the, the leader of the Imani here, uh, as, as of this point in time, I want to stress that, oh, tell me about it, Psychotic, is actually uh, the troll hero from Warcraft 2, the guy who sided with the Horde. Um, he's got a little bit of a grudge going as a result of that against the Horde and the Alliance because the Alliance helped the Elves beat his people and then so he sided with the Horde and then the Horde kind of sided with the Blood Elves who screwed over his people so he hates both of them he wants everything to do everything in his power to uh, crush both sides he's yeah he's not happy now, I say in lore now, as in the point at which we're playing as of this exact moment in time, by the time we actually do Zulamon, uh, he will not be the one who's in power there. It'll be actually someone else entirely, but like I said, we'll get to that. And hey, Dracon. Off for life. Um, looking forward to Legion. Uh, so like I said, uh, underestimating the trolls, I personally feel, in lore, is one of the biggest mistakes that the other major powers keep making over and over and over. They look at these relatively primitive-looking people with their extremely superstitious ways, and they automatically go, oh, pff, primitives. And then the trolls roll over them because the trolls are actually very strong and very advanced and all that other fun stuff. And, uh, yeah, do not underestimate the trolls. If the trolls ever actually united, they would probably win. <laughs> they are they have sufficient magic, they have sufficient access, they have sufficient knowledge, and they have sufficient power to simply win if they ever truly united. Well that's my point, Raskor. Some people don't really understand how the Loa work. I don't want to talk too much about the Loa right now, I've got plenty of other times to talk about them, but a brief description. Loa are a specific class of spirits. It has been argued, we don't know if this is true or not, that druidic spirits and natural spirits and possibly even shamanistic spirits are also Loa. In other words, that Loa would be the name of the race 
and then each of those different things are different uh, cultures or gradients off of the wow. same core race, right? I've talked about this before, actually. Ah, Yaman, Zulmarash had this coming. He burned down Vinjasi's village. He killed many a Mani before they put me in this cage. I hide something in the sand. My gift for you now. Ah, the poison, it spreads now, man. Time to rest. Stay away from the voodoo. Well, yeah, the tribes really don't like each other, Darch Monster. Like I said, if they unified. It's kind of like the orcs over in Warhammer. If the orcs could actually uh, unify, you know, they, they, they would do a tremendous amount of damage. They don't. But, yeah. Um... Oh, I know. I love that too, Hylusk. Absolutely. Like I said, most people think of the trolls as just superstitious nonsense, but they're right. And again, the trolls have a huge wealth of knowledge about a huge amount of things. But I was talking about the Loa. Like I said, I think really Loa, this is my, I, I agree with this theory, by the way. I think Loa is best described as the term for the species. Again, you know, the type of creature that all these other spirits are. To define all the spirits I just listed very quickly... We've got shamanistic spirits. Shamanistic spirits is someone who dies, who was a mortal, you know, as a person, dies and keeps going on, you know, as a as a spirit deliberately to try and help for the future. Ancestral spirits are what those are usually referred to as. Um, there's a uh, Cairn Bloodhoof himself has become an ancestral spirit, uh, a shamanistic spirit. There are several other examples of people who have done this, and and a lot of this this has been true for for a long, long time. That's a very old thing. Uh, druidic spirits, again, I very strongly think uh, l druidic spirits are actually Loa, uh, especially given how trolls started being able to play as druids in Kata, and there's some lore to that too, but anyways. Um, so the uh, druidic spirits are, are very powerful and usually tied to a given animal or to a given idea or concept, uh, often represented by an animal. And druidic spirits and natural spirits are very closely tied into each other. Natural spirits are just one step away from that, usually something revolving around, say, Ents are natural spirits, as I've mentioned before. Uh, tree Ents, uh, the, there's certain areas, trees, uh, chunks of land, the rivers, you know, that kind of thing have their own spirits. Now, if you're paying attention, what I just described also describes how Loa work, which is, again, why I think that natural spirits and druidic spirits are also are, are are Loa. I think that definitely. Uh, it's debatable if ancestral spirits are Loa, but I think the other two absolutely are. So Loa, in brief, uh, yes, absolutely. I think we'll definitely see at least part of him Dracon, based on what they've been doing so far and the lead up they've been doing. Um, yes, Night Elf agents are another example of natural spirits. So uh, Loa as they are presented, even if we're ignoring the theory I just mentioned, Loa are Loa of a thing. For example, this tree right here, this is not true, but this tree could have a loa that is the loa of that tree. That f that river or this lake over here could actually have a loa of this lake. That tree could have a loa, etc. The general way it works is loa have a huge variety of scope and power. So for example, that tree loa would be very, very, very weak. So if you made a, a contract with it, or if you made a pact with it, or if you bound it to yourself, it wouldn't actually give you a lot of strength or, or significance. However, if you took the Loa that controlled that entire lake over there, it would be much stronger. And the really, really strong Loa are the ones who are Loas of concepts. These are the ones that the trolls usually venerate as deities. I want to make this clear, they are not actually deities. They, are, uh, they, they revere them as such. But in my opinion, there's actually only one deity in the entire setting, and even that's actually debatable. I'll get to that later. Um, I'm referring to Elune, of course. But even the Titans and the Old Gods don't actually qualify as deities by my own definition. Very powerful creatures and individuals, but not deities. But I just want to make this distinction here, because when the trolls talk about their gods, they're always referring to Loa. Um, so there are Loa of things like the dead, or a specific type of dead, or a Loa of uh, subterfuge, or a Loa of poison. You know, that kind of a thing. There are Loas of broad categories, and those Loas are tremendously powerful. Those Loas are extremely, uh, extremely powerful, and so making contracts with them, or pacts with them, or binding those Loas makes the individual who does that 
very powerful. And that's why the uh, trolls have been able to be such a threat so many times. Because they either... Yeah, there's also a blood loa. We, at least we think there is. We're not 100% sure if Hakar is actually a loa or not. That's been debated many times. Um, but yeah, so, and yeah, if you kill that loa, it's a huge deal. Uh, and can have some pretty significant offense. Uh, the Loa will be a regular, constant element of the story, so I'll be bringing them up as we go. But I wanted to give you a, a basis of what the Loa are, so that you at least have that in the back of your mind for when we continue henceforth. So, if you're ever wondering why this seemingly primitive tribe of people can do so much, very physically strong, very regenerative, they have that ability, very knowledgeable about a lot of things, and of course, they have the Loa and the ability to work with and move through the Loa. When I actually, just a side note really quick, when I was making my pen and paper version of Warcraft, which I still have the rules for somewhere, and I'd like to actually do a game of that sometime in the future, it was working out really well. Anyways, uh, I was making racial abilities, right? Well, the racial abilities for trolls was the ability to, to contact a local Loa for wherever you are and make a contract with them or try to bind them to your service. And there were some details of exactly how that worked. Usually the general idea was, to, you know, you could say, I'm going to sacrifice this, or I'm going to give you this, or I'm going to give up this. If you give me a temporary buff or an ability to kill these or, you know, blind my enemies, you know, something like that. One of, uh, Guido, some of you may recognize him or that name. He's a regular player of mine. Guido was actually playing a troll in one of our test dungeons that we were doing when I was testing the rule set. And he was in the middle of this thing, he's like, are there any Loa in the area? And I was like, oh, awesome, because I was hoping he would do that. And so he made a contract with a local Loa. Basically, the contract was all he had to do was kill everyone else in the area, and the Loa would grant him like something like a plus five to his uh, attack rolls and a plus four to his damage rolls for the, for, uh, for, until, uh, until his deed was done. Now, if you're paying attention, I said everything else in the area. That also includes his allies, the other players. So Guido then had a choice. He could fulfill that contract and turn on his allies and potentially kill them because he's stronger. Or he could kill everything else and then try to break the contract, which has its own consequences and usually results in a wrathful Loa who can make things much, much worse for you. It was just a nice dynamic, and it kind of shows how the Loa work in general. <clears throat> Troll regeneration is absolutely a thing. Uh, how much it is varies by the individual. There are also concoctions that the trolls can make that can improve or reduce the effectiveness of troll regeneration. Hi, Pencil. And so, uh, the, um, for example, uh, a troll who, has, ta who has, has taken a potion, they're good alchemists too, by the way, the trolls. Uh, a troll who has taken a potion to increase the regeneration basically has wolverine levels of regeneration for a, per for a brief period of time. Um, however, uh, if you chop off their head, they do die. There are certain things that they can't regenerate from. But basic or mundane, or, you know, d mundane damage they can re regenerate from. Uh, you know, chopping off a hand, for example. Normal troll regeneration is, is, is much, much slower, but still existent. Again, chopping off a hand. A few days later, there will be a new hand that are ready to go. <clears throat> what business have you? All right, so I want that sword. Shorel Oran. For no reason, because I'm not going to use it. Because I'm a hunter. <laughs> State your business. No, Darsh monster. Ah, uh, let's see. So we're going to be yeah, ready really for anything. Okay, so this is basically they want we me to warn justice. Fairbreeze Village of the fact that they're going to be attacked, which we will be doing in a minute. Yes, Pencil, that's literally what I'm saying. First, we want to do this other side quest. Now, this is a fun little side quest. Oh, a lot psychotic. And trolls have done that. Trolls have outlowered the Loa several times. Oh, you're right, Mind Blast. My opinion. My, or my, my fault. The dark times will pass. These are probably my favorite quests in this area. Uh, these are also the last ones we're doing for this zone. We're almost moved on to Ghostlands. This will be our last bundle. Uh, Hunter, hear my request. For reasons I cannot go into now, I decided to shut down my nearby school. A few days ago, I sent one of my pupils, Apprentice Theralthalus, there with, a very, with this very task. I have not heard back from her since. 
Will you go to Duskwither Spire and check on her? Make sure she's well. You'll find it heading north on the path out of Farstrider Retreat. And then go right when the road branches. Okay. Keep your wits about you. We... Uh, depends, Takoida. However, uh, there are several times... Uh, Dalaran, little Billy. There are several times when a tr troll has just said no deal and the lowest said, Okay. And every now and again a troll says no deal and the lowest says, Screw you. And then actively curses the troll for for uh, for the impudence of it, basically. So let's just recap really quick. There, they have one functioning ley line drill, you know, one functioning sanctum. They have lost a harbor, although we reclaimed it for them. They lost the southern woods. They have one functioning village, two functioning rune stones, an entire chunk of land that has been claimed by the Amani, and who the Amani are planning an attack soon. Uh, the Dead Scar, of course. A small retreat. Okay, so that's good. And one magical academy, which we are about to do. These are the total assets of the Blood Elves at this point in time. Now, again, exaggerative, because, you know, uh, MMO interpretation. I just want to kind of show this off. Looks like I'm actually not in the right spot to do so. Hang on just a second. That's the Magical Academy right there. It should actually be much larger, of course, just like Fairbreeze Village should be. But I just wanted to showcase that from this angle because I think that looks really cool. So. Let's go talk to Apprentice... Lerothalus here. State your business. The Magister was concerned for my well-being? Oh, how sweet. I wish he had had that interest before when we were at the Spire. Ah, it doesn't matter now. Please listen carefully. I have a favor to ask of you. Remember the sun well. As you may know, Magister Duskweather sent me here to shut down the power sources that feed the Spire. There are three of them, each located in a different place inside. Unfortunately, I appear to be too late, and Duskweather Spire has been overrun with strange and magical creatures. While I haven't the expertise to accomplish this task, surely a hunter like yourself could do it? Be ready for anything. Uh, the Duskweather's groundkeeper has gone missing. Someone must have forgotten to tell him to leave when the Magister and everyone else did. I know he's still somewhere around here on the grounds, but I dare not go looking for him with all the creatures roaming about. Uh, will you find him for me and make sure he's all right? Shirelle are on. Also, hi, Cool Ninja. Welcome to the Wild Lord Run. Actually, this whole area is his academy. Now, I stress the way I say that. So we now, as a result of the quest uh, set up here, see you around, Kretzler. We have actually seen two lords of the Blood Elves. The first we saw was Lord... Blah, blah, the guy, you know, Lord Idiot Face, who was off partying. You remember him? And, as many people have pointed out, he looked rather pale, like he is beginning to succumb to wretchedness. So, there's that guy. The other lord is Lord Duskwither, the one who is actually in charge of this entire facility. This is his academy. And, as you can see, it's a little larger than just the buildings in the air. It's got this whole uh, grounds and whatnot. And, again, of course, the floating buildings. Hey, Lonely. Yes. <clears throat> really quick here. Oh, yeah. You're not one of the Magister's apprentices, that's for certain. Sent here to help clean up this mess, no doubt. Keep your wits about it. That's horrible, I tell you. Strange things happening in the Spire. Magister and his apprentices run off, and the next thing you know, the whole grounds is overrun with magical beasties. And who told Will Thelion? No one, that's who. Hunter, you've got to help me clear these things out. I cannot maintain the grounds while these anomalies are running amok. Stay the course. Okay. So we're going to help him clean up the grounds a little bit here. And there's no Murlocs on this beach, too. Me too, Cool Ninja. Otherwise, I'd be out of a job. <laughs> also, it is nice to see people care about story. Mm. Yeah, definitely breaking for lunch after I finish uh, Eversong, I'm thinking, guys. So just a heads up on that. It's funny you say that, Permius. My head cannon is about 10. Which is funny for anybody who's played this game, of course. Ah, damn, I was hoping for one more. 
Do do do. Uh, you're looking at them, Reach. We have not received many so far, which is fine. Uh, well, right now I am the haven't picked a spec spec stompy. <laughs> I guess I should. I've got, I'm probably going to get like another, I'd say, six or so levels going through Ghostland, so I probably should. Um, i got to think about which spec I wanted if this. My usual, um, my usual spec is beast. My, my actual hunter is a what beast spec. <clears throat> I suppose that'll have to do now, won't it? Thanks for the help, Hunter. I can only hope this mess gets completely cleaned up before the Magister returns to dusk with a spire. Take this pocket change. It's not much, but it's all I have for the moment. Feel free to dispatch a few more beasties on your way out, if you'd be so kind. We will have justice. Also, what do you mean they're not labeled, Reach? Your statement is confusing. They're quite labeled. Zero, zero, and five. <laughs> Now, you might be wondering, how do we get to that academy? Well, all you have to do is think like a blood elf. Zoom. And here we are. Zero dollars. Zero dollars and five dollars. Why is that confusing, Rach? <laughs> okay. What do we got up here? All right, let's take these things out, shall we? Er, uh, hang on, hang on. Loading, please wait. I don't have feign death yet, do I? No, I don't. There we go. Okay, we're reset. Sorry, had a little bit of z-axis th things going on there. You know, Reach, you were complaining about Nightbot telling you what that was last night. <laughs> yeah, the, the demon's essence is there. Of course. If we can use them, why not? So while we're here, why don't we get the, the Lord's Book? Oh, hey, there's some wretched up here. Actually, to quite a theoretically in lore, it should! <clears throat> Hang on, let's uh, check there. For the. Atheru wants the left one. Okay, hang on. There we go. We now have some competition, sort of. Uh, you have discovered what appears to be an investigative journal left behind by Magister Duskwither. A brief scan of its contents reveals some shocking attempts at filtering corrupted magical flows, which might explain what happened here. The Magister is sure to want this back. There's also supposed to be a bunch of enemies up here, but apparently some other player's been right ahead of me, so whatever. I don't mind. Oh yeah, we can read a lot of these too, by the way. There's a lot of the books in this game you can read. <clears throat> it is my fervent hope through research I may find a supplemental source of magical energy that will be safe from my people. With the sun well gone, we must find a way to continue our, our way of life without succumbing to the lure of arcane magic. I believe the future of the Sindor Eye can once again serve as a shining example to all. Next page. No luck yet. What little magic I have ready access to must be channeled through the spire. I do have a number of intriguing ideas, though. I will set my brightest apprentices to follow through these paths of inquiry. See what we come up with. It's been a while since I've written anything in these pages. Still nothing promising. I received word yesterday that one of the pupils at Sunstrider Isle, uh, Felendrin, failed to heed the advice of his mentors and succumbed to the affliction. I shall redouble our efforts. If you remember, Falendrin was the gentleman we actually killed as the end guy in the tutorial zone. Not the starter zone, the tutorial zone. I'll describe the difference in a minute. Ah, oh, nothing. I will not give up hope, though. The Sindurai cannot afford to be in a position of magical dependency at this moment when we are besieged to the south. I've devised an entirely new approach, and if successful, it will allow me to filter out the impurities in corrupted and fell magic power sources that I have stashed away. I must proceed with caution. Amazing! 
We've met with some success, although the amount of magic we were able to extract was minuscule. I'm going to pull most of the apprentices away from their studies to focus on this promising new results. With any luck at all, we should be able to refine the process and kill two birds with one stone. An abundant source of energy for ourselves, and a way to counter any fell magics we come across in the future. No. While experimenting with the new... Ah, God, I'm being attacked. While experimenting with the new process, my main apprentice, Telethion, suddenly and without warning shriveled before my very eyes, succumbing to the state that afflicts my brethren. I tried to stop it, but he was too far gone. I had no choice but to put him out of his misery. Such is the price of discovery, but I feel that weight of that cost too dearly already. It is too much to bear. Two more apprentices have succumbed. We were being so careful. I don't understand what's gone wrong. I will have to abandon these investigations. Start over from scratch. I was too late. A third apprentice had, unknowingly to me, been asking, uh, been sharing the fouled research with some of the others. I'm going to try to contain the situation, but first I must get the unaffected apprentices away. I will do so by letting them know that I'm going on sabbatical at Far Strader Retreat in the hopes of finding a new approach to the problem. I must find a way to atone for this horrible error in judgment. Uh, um, uh, fell magic has been around basically since forever, Stompy. It's not new and it's not old, uh, if that makes any sense. Uh, it's just a commonality of the universe. So fell magic is, a, is just a type of magic. Uh, fel arcane magic is effectively a... <sighs> fell magic and arcane magic both technically have the same source. Uh, the same basic concept. Thank you, Reach, by the way. Um, as soon as I finish this discussion, I'll check the, your comment. Um, that source is basically just raw magic. Now, most people think of arcane magic as raw magic, but that's actually not quite true. Arcane magic is filtered raw magic. Fell magic is a little closer to unrestrained raw magic, okay? The best way to keep the distinction between the two, between the two is fell magic is usually something used uh, and spread by the Legion, demons, old gods, etc., Arcane magic is something that was, is basically an invention of the Titans, okay? Now, there are other forms of magic. There's light magic, there's druidic magic, there's shamanistic magic, you know, there's shadow magic. There are several different variables in these, but all forms of magic boil down to the two basic concepts. Uh, raw, you know, pumping doom magic, and filtered, uh, refined magic, okay? So... Uh, I'll talk a lot more about fell magic in the future. There's not a lot to discuss about it here, other than it is extremely addicting. Like, you think magic... These people are addicted to magic in a literal way, but magic is also addicting in general. If you are a normal person who starts casting spells, it will become addicting to you. If you're a normal person who casts fell magic... Well, let's just say that if we were to put it into stats terms, let's say you could cast like 20 arcane spells before you really have an addiction problem. You could cast one before you have problems with becoming addicted to fell magic. Uh, fell magic is also much, much, much stronger, but for a good reason. Remember, arcane magic is much more filtered, much more refined, and much more controlled. It is natural that fell magic would be stronger then, based on that, because it is literally more raw power. It also costs more. Literally casting fell magic will usually cost you in terms of health, years on your life, you know, the kind of thing that just de de uh, degenerates your, your existence. And of course, it can also literally burn away your soul in order to cast it. However, it is worth noting that someone who is using fell magic is probably going to be stronger than anyone else around them. And people who can master using fell magic tend to be the strongest people around in the entire setting because of that. They are the rare exceptions, though. We will persevere. Okay. We've turned, we shut it down. I am grateful to your assistance, but saddened to hear some of my apprentices have fallen to their addiction. With the power of the spire cut off, I think I'll stay here a while and see if things have calmed down enough for me to sneak in and retrieve their remains. I have one last favor to ask for you. Would you please relay what has happened here to Magister Duskweather? 
Let him know I am well, but make certain I, he is aware that some of the apprentices have become wretched. Thank you for your help. We will have justice. All right, now I'm going to see what Reach uh, did here. <laughs> you got it. We'll put that towards the Crayola uh, counter here. Oop. Do I not? Oh, I lost my numlock somewhere along the line. There we go. Yeah, as Raskor points out to Koida, most don't. Most warlocks and practicers of fell magic die very quickly or live very short lives. It takes quite a bit of thought and effort and discipline. Well, there's two ways to Koida. Uh, one is to have some kind of external empowerment. This is the Skittles counter. I like that. Skittles counter. Uh, there's some kind of external empowerment that basically shields you from the worst effects. Uh... The other method is to not overuse it, to be very, very, ironically, disciplined and controlled in how you use it. To be very precise and very careful, and we're going to have very precise usage of this fell magic, and basically use it at like a tenth of its potential. This is why warlocks in gameplay, the actual players... Okay, so players can play warlocks, right? However, if you are playing a warlock, you're playing a warlock who is pl who is basically using 10% of their power. They're they're completely constantly holding back all the time. Everything they do is them completely restraining what they can do. An idiot who has no reason to hold back can can do a ridiculous amount of damage and is ridiculously powerful but will probably die. <laughs> Uh, it, with, within a couple of years of doing so. Make sense? So we're the smart ones, the ones who are being very, very careful about it. Now, as, as Raskor points out, because of how incredibly addictive fell magic is, every time you do anything with it, you are constantly tempted to, to uncor uncork it. This is why so many warlocks across the series have started out as decent people, and then gone, you know, and then become horribly evil people because they finally just, ah, oh, screw it! I want to cast, I want to cast! And then, because fell magic is corruptive, it corrupted them. It is also worth noting that uh, there's a couple of other problems there, usually involving demon blood and a few other things, and the very concept of fell, uh, that is to say demon-infused. But I don't want to get into that year because that's not really relevant right now. I've got plenty of time to talk about that in the future. So let's go turn in this journal. Lord Dust. The eternal sun guides us. Oh, I was too late. It's all my fault. My investigation into purifying alternative magical sources got out of hand before I could put a stop to it. If only I'd gone myself. If only they'd listened to me. If only they'd heeded my warnings. I have blood on my hands, Hunter. I thank you for putting to rest my to the tortured souls of my former apprentices. It is of sm some small consolation they will not linger in what state where a blood elf is better off dead. We will have justice. Oh, this is my journal. My investigations. This is what caused all of this in the first place. Here it is, Lakma, proof of my crime. This journal contains all of my ill-conceived studies. Heedless of the warnings, I continued my research until it was too late, and when I grasped my error, I did what I could. But by then, some of my pupils had already gone too far. I evacuated. But in my haste, I forgot to shut down the power sources. I will burn this tome, so that no one else may fall prey to its contents. I only wanted to help the Sindorai. The reckoning is at hand. This is kind of neat. This is basically the beginnings of them starting to do in-game cutscenes in BC. He literally throws the book onto the ground. And casts a fireball on the thing. Good riddance. Now none shall be able to repeat my mistakes. Yes, Rusty Center, it will. Sorry. And yeah, Jedi Mew, that's actually a great parallel. Um, you can use fell magic just like you can use the dark side. Very, very carefully. And it is a constant, non-stop temptation to use it too much. And if you do, it starts that feedback loop. And then it gets worse. And yeah, Reach is correct in the way he describes it. If you use it, you want to use it more. If you use it more, you want to use it more. 
it, it is accurate to say that most practitioners of fell magic quite literally burn themselves out. They will literally consume what is left of their lives and their souls, which are a distinct thing in this setting, uh, in order to continue casting, in order to keep using fell power. Um, there's a fairly... What, Reach? You know what? I'm going to drive through the river just to make my point. Hell yeah! I got the bike for it. Anyways, um, I was hoping for more of a splash. The, uh, the one-winged angel concept is actually all, uh, all over the place in Warcraft because it's so easy to burn up your life in order to try and destroy your enemies. In fact, a lot of bosses, in raid, raid bosses in particular, their last phase is usually a one-winged angel kind of a thing. Fell magic... Okay. Um, also, thank you, Stompy. Sorry, I, I completely missed that comment for a moment. Um, I, I, I don't blame you. Most people aren't really all that interested in lore. But, um, so, fell magic, where it comes from, is actually debatable. Believe it or not. Um, so... Obviously, it comes from demons and demonism, but there's a little bit of interpretation on where the actual source of demonic magic is. The actual uh, place where that actually comes from originally. Um, the general idea is that there's several aspects to this uh, particular setting. Um, there's space, of course. You know, just space like any other world has around it but then there's the great dark beyond and there is the void and uh then there's the nether the twisting nether the generally accepted idea is that all magic flows from the twisting nether and as it leaves the twisting nether that's where it gets uh mutated into either arcane or uh demonic energy so that, is, that isn't 100% verified, I want to stress, because some sources disagree with some other sources. A couple of the books say blah, and that, that, that disagrees with a couple of the other things. We don't know for certain, is my overall point. Uh, so I tend to think of it as one of those however you want to think of it situations. Uh, personally, I tend to think of it as there's... Um, before Sargeras did any of his things, there were certain aspects to uh, the galaxy, the universe, etc., which were just plain evil. These were the true demons, right? Remember, even Sargeras himself is not actually a demon. He is actually a fell. And so, these true demons were the things that deliberately, uh, basically engineered a way for uh, raw magic to be converted into fell magic uh, in order to further their own ends. Thus making a... Uh, yeah, basically reach. Uh, and thus making a form of magic that a demon can use freely and basically infinitely because it's true demons suffer n only one negative effect from using fell magic it doesn't burn their life out it doesn't consume their soul or anything like that it can they can still do that but it doesn't do it naturally like it does to everything else so they designed this exact form of magic for them to use and sargeras once he repurposed them and once he uh formed the burning legion then started using that same thing for his own purpose that's my take on it uh, if I was to point to a specific group that would do that, by the way, that would invent fell magic, it would be the Nethrazim. Uh, the Nethrazim are, are are the kind of people who would do that. They are very intelligent. They are probably the best crafters in the entire setting. And they can make stuff that is way powerful and way useful and, and basically can alter and pervert the way things work in order to serve a new function. Remember, the Nethrazine basically invented the Scourge. Try to keep that in mind. They are the ones who crafted Frostmourne specifically, too. So, a degree of uh, severe editing ability. I don't know how else to put that. I've talked about this before. The concept of a villain that isn't that personally powerful, but has tremendous ability to edit, to craft or change or work or mold or forge or whatever. And, and that is uh, very much the Nethrazine in general. <sighs> okay, um... Where am I going? I'm going here. You. Do not loiter. Welcome, volunteer. We're running low on supplies here, but Silvermoon has promised us material assistance. That's where you come in. Oh, right. So this is uh, another quest that Solana, every uh, thing has. We're actually not doing it because there's no reason to. It's the here's how the flight paths work quest. 
it's a good quest to have for people who've never played this game before to get used to how flight paths work. Uh, obviously, I know how flight paths work. Anaria Shola. All right, uh, let's grab that. Farewell. All right, we have now finished this zone. Basically, uh, we have one last thing to do. We have to do our part. We have to do our part as Blood Elven citizens because we need to make sure. Uh, and again, I want to do this right now because this is a great contrast. So remember, we just talked to the Lord Duskwither, right? And he was lamenting his usage of fell magic. He regretted the loss of his apprentices. He was consumed by guilt, you know, etc., etc. He is is one of the lords of the Sindorai, and so is this idiot, Seltheril. State your business. Didn't I just get sent you out to gather more party supplies? Was that you? Oh, I can't be expected to remember everyone's face now, can I? I meet so many interesting people. So what do you want? Oh, you're quite the energetic young woman, aren't you? This looks all very adequate. You certainly deserve compensation for gathering up all of this, and something a little extra, I think. Oh, I almost forgot. Here's an invitation to the party. And Hunter, next time you drop in, make sure you're dressed up in something a little more... festive. The reckoning is at hand. State your business. Shirella Glory to the Sindori. Oh, hello there. Um, what's your name? No matter, what brings you to my home away from home and the beautiful countryside? Shirella Ron. Yeah. Pretty... I mention this because this is something that, uh... This is something that WoW does pretty well. It likes to show both sides of the, of the situation. So we've seen a magister, a lord, who is, you know, decent and learns from his mistakes and trying to be better and, you know, etc. And on the other side of the thing, we see a lord who's an idiot, who is doing nothing but standing around and drinking and boozing it up and God knows what else. Yeah. So we see the two sides of Blood Elf Society as it is now. I really should say High Elf Society, but you get the point. Oh, we should use the invitation. Nope, nope. Okay, screw it. Let's just get rid of it. Throw it on the ground. There we go. So we're going to do one... Actually, no. We're going to go ahead and cut off now um, because I'm hungry as a crap. I'm actually starting to develop a headache from hunger. Um, so I'm going to go and cut this off, and then we're going to start the Ghost Lens. I'm actually uh, pretty looking forward to the uh, the Ghost Lens. There's a lot to talk about there. So I will be back in just a few, guys. <laughs>